Ever wonder what the most ancient gods were like? The secrets hidden five millennia ago. Our exploration will take us to the heart of Mesopotamia, where the Anunnaki, godlike beings, were worshipped as architects of existence. But the scope of our investigation does not stop there. Venturing beyond pantheons of gods and into the shadowy corners of belief systems, we will confront the concept of demons, entities often regarded as malevolent forces across cultures. With in-depth analysis, we'll uncover the multifaceted nature of these supernatural beings, from their role as tempters in religious texts to their embodiment of societal fears and taboos. Drawing connections across civilizations, we'll trace the evolution of demonology and the intriguing ways these entities have been perceived and depicted throughout history. From the Anunnaki to the demons is more than a documentary. It's a compelling expedition into the human psyche and the intrinsic desire to fathom the mysterious forces that shape our existence. Join us as we bridge the gap between past and present, shedding light on the rich tapestry of ancient religions and the intricate threads that continue to weave through the fabric of our beliefs, cultures and collective consciousness. Prior to the 19th century, it was thought that Genesis of the Old Testament contained the oldest material of literature in the entire known world. In particular, the narratives about the Great Flood and the Tower of Babel. Sometime during the 19th century, archaeologists, in an effort to find the cities mentioned in the Bible, found something completely different and far more fascinating. What they found all over Mesopotamia are cuneiform tablets. Some of these tablets predated the biblical timeline of creation itself. And the contents of these tablets were shocking. In 1961, Samuel Noah Kramer, a seriologist, translated a text known as Anki in the World Order, which seems to be a textual ancestor to the Tower of Babel story. Here's what it says. Sumer, great mountain, land of heaven and earth, trailing glory, bestowing powers on people from sunrise to sunset. Your powers are superior powers, untouchable, and your heart is complex and inscrutable. Like heaven itself, your good creative force, in which gods too can be born, is beyond reach, giving birth to kings who put on the good diadem and giving birth to lords who wear the crown on their heads. Your lord, the honored lord, sits with Anu, the king of heaven. Your king, the great mountain, father Enlil, the father of all the lands, has blocked you impenetrably like a cedar tree. The Anunnaki, the great gods, have taken up dwellings in your midst and consumed their food, Giguna, in your shrines, with their single trees, household sumer, may your sheepfolds be built and your cattle multiply. May your giguna touch the skies. May your good temples reach up to heaven. May the Anunnaki determine the destinies in your midst. The mysterious Anunnaki mentioned in that text are described as determining destiny. Who are these mysterious Anunnaki? Are these the Nephilim mentioned in Genesis? Let's find out. Hello, explorers of the ancient world. And initiates into the mysteries. Welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, remember to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you won't miss out on our journeys into the fascinating tales of the past. Today, we're embarking on a captivating expedition into the heart of ancient mythology and biblical lore 
delving deep into the tales of the enigmatic Anunnaki and the mysterious Nephilim. The Anunnaki, powerful deities from ancient Sumerian mythology, are said to have shaped our world, influenced kings, and controlled the fate of humanity. Their stories have fascinated us, leading to varied interpretations and even some modern, controversial conspiracy theories. And then there are the Nephilim, the giants of the Old Testament, the sons of God, fallen angels, mighty warriors, heroes of old, or perhaps all of the above. Their brief but intriguing mention in the Bible have given rise to countless interpretations and debates. Are there connections between these two groups of ancient beings? Were they celestial, terrestrial, or maybe even extraterrestrial? Today, we separate fact from fiction and history from myth, guided by archaeology, linguistics, and the valuable work of countless scholars. So buckle up and join us on this exciting journey into the realm of the Anunnaki and the Nephilim. It's time to uncover the secrets of the ancients. Let's dive in. The Anunnaki are a group of deities that appear in the mythological traditions of ancient Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. They are among the earliest pantheons in Mesopotamian mythology. In Sumerian textual corpus, the term Anunnaki often refers to deities in the broadest sense. However, more specifically, it often designates a group of gods associated with the underworld where they are said to decree the fates of humanity. One of the significant mythological narratives involving the Anunnaki is found in the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the world's oldest known works of literature. In the Epic, Gilgamesh meets the spirit of his friend Enkidu in the Underworld, where the Anunnaki act as judges in the Underworld who set laws for the cosmos. Gilgamesh lamented. Seven days and seven nights he wept for Enkidu until the worm fastened on him. Only then he gave him up to the earth. For the Anunnaki, the judges had seized him. Tablet 8, Epic of Gilgamesh. Then in Tablet 9 of the Epic of Gilgamesh, it says, The sleeping and the dead how alike are they? They are like a painted death. What is there between the master and the servant when both have fulfilled their doom? When the Anunnaki, the judges, come together and Mamitun, the mother of destinies, together they decree the fates of men. Life and death they allot, but the day of death they do not disclose. Finally, in Tablet 11, we get the story of the Great Flood sent by Enlil, which says, The Anunnaki lifted up the torches, setting the land ablaze with their flare. Stunned shock over Adad's deeds overtook the heavens and turned to blackness all that had been light. The land shattered like a pot. All day long, the south wind blew blowing fast, submerging the mountain in water, overwhelming the people like an attack. No one could see his fellow. They could not recognize each other in the torrent. The gods were frightened by the flood and retreated, ascending to heaven of Anu. The gods were cowering like dogs, crouching by the outer wall. Ishtar shrieked like a woman in childbirth. The sweet-voiced mistress of the gods wailed. The olden days have a loss turned to clay, because I said evil things in the assembly of the gods. How could I say evil things in the assembly of the gods, ordering a catastrophe to destroy my people? No sooner have I given birth to my dear people than they'll fill the sea like so many fish. 
The gods of the Anunnaki were weeping with her. The gods humbly sat weeping, sobbing with grief, their lips burning, parched with thirst. Six days and seven nights came the wind and flood, the storm flattening the land. When a seventh day arrived, Utnapushtim sent forth a dove and released it. The dove went off. I, Utnapishtim, sent forth a dove and released it. The dove went off, but came back to me. No perch was visible, so it circled back to me. I sent forth a swallow and released it. The dove went off, but came back to me. No perch was visible, so it circled back to me. I sent forth a raven and released it. The raven went off and saw the water slithered back. Now compare that text to the genesis of Noah and the flood. After 40 days, Noah opened up a window. He had made in the ark and sent out a raven and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find nowhere to perch because there was water all over the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. In both cases, Noah and Utnapushtim are told by a god to build an ark, load it with animals, and they both wait an additional seven days after the flood to send off doves and ravens to check for land. Now I bring this up because I think it's possible that the Nephilim in Genesis 6 may very well be influenced by the Anunnaki, the sons of God who endured the wrath of the king of the gods. But it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. And I will speak more about the Nephilim later. But let's talk about the Anunnaki first. The Anunnaki have also been connected to the creation of humanity, where they are said to have created humans to serve as laborers for the gods. This particular narrative is found in later Akkadian and Babylonian mythology, especially the Arterhasis, an Akkadian Babylonian epic that recounts the creation of humanity. The story goes that Anunnaki, together with the Ijiji, another group of gods, were burdened with the laborious tasks of digging canals and farming land to feed themselves and the other gods. The Ajiji, who were doing most of the work, rebelled. As a solution, the god Enki proposed the creation of humans to perform the labor instead. Thus, humans were created from clay and the blood of a slain god. The Enuma Elish, another Akkadian Babylonian creation epic, tells a similar tale of human creation. In this narrative, the god Marduk, after defeating the primeval goddess Tiamat, creates the world and humans. The Anunnaki, in this context, are considered high-ranking deities in the divine hierarchy. In these stories, the Anunnaki play roles as cosmic legislators creators and sometimes intermediaries between humans and the divine. They are integral to the functioning of the cosmos and human society. Unto Kingu hath Tiamat entrusted, in costly raiment she has made him sit, saying, I have uttered thy spell in the assembly of the gods, I have raised thee to power, the dominion over all the gods I have entrusted unto thee. Be exalted, my chosen spouse. May they magnify thy name over all of them. The Anunnaki, Tiamat, hath given the Kingu the tablets of destiny, 
on his breast she laid them, saying, Thy command shall not be without avail, and the word of thy mouth shall be established. Enuma Elish, Tablet 3 The mythology of the Anunnaki is complex and spans several ancient cultures, with the earliest accounts coming from the Sumerians. Their stories, like many ancient mythologies, attempt to explain the origin of the world, the nature of the gods, and humanity, and the laws that govern existence. In Sumerian mythology, the Anunnaki were initially viewed as celestial deities associated with various aspects of life and nature. However, the term Anunnaki gradually came to be associated more specifically with Chthonic underworld deities. In Mesopotamian mythology, the term Anunnaki was used to refer to deities in general, but it was mostly associated with the underworld, the realm of the dead. This does not necessarily imply a negative or punitive association. In many ancient cultures, the world was perceived as a multi-tiered structure, often divided into heavens, earth, and underworld. Gods and goddesses were assigned to different realms based on their roles and functions. The Anunnaki are depicted in various myths as judges in the underworld, ruling over the fate of the dead. For instance, the goddess Ereshkigal, the queen of the underworld, and Nergal, the god of death and plague, were both considered part of the Anunnaki. The reason why many of the Anunnaki are associated with the underworld is likely related to the Sumerians' belief about life, death, and the afterlife. The underworld, known as Kur or Irkala, was considered a dreary, dark place where the spirits of the dead existed in a shadowy version of the earthly life, similar to Hades in Greek mythology sustained by libations and offerings from the living. The Anunnaki, in their role as Chthonic deities, were seen as intermediaries between the world of the living and the world of the dead, with the power to judge and rule over souls of deceased humans. The term Anunnaki could include a wide range of deities, reflecting the complex and multifaceted nature of Mesopotamian religious belief. So what about the Nephilim? Why do so many think they are related? The Nephilim are depicted in biblical traditions as the offspring of the sons of God or fallen angels and are described as giants. In general, the Anunnaki and the fallen angels who give birth to the Nephilim are separate entities from distinct cultural and religious contexts, Mesopotamian mythology and Hebrew religion, respectively. However, there are some parallels. Both undergo the wrath of God and try to teach humans knowledge. Both the Anunnaki and the fallen angels are seen as powerful beings with the ability to influence humanity. The Anunnaki as those of royal blood or princely offspring were considered gods who decreed the fates of humanity. Similarly, fallen angels in certain interpretations are thought to have interacted with humans, sometimes negatively, as misleading spirits, but also in some narratives, teaching humanity various arts and knowledge. The Book of Enoch, an ancient Jewish religious work, ascribes the origins of sin and corruption on earth to a group of angels known as the Watchers who fell from grace by mating with human women and teaching humanity forbidden knowledge. But rather than the Anunnaki, this story shares more elements with the myth of the Apkalu, seven wise men or demigods in Mesopotamian mythology who were created by the god Enki to establish culture and give civilizations to mankind. While there are thematic similarities and overlaps, it's essential to recognize that these myths and traditions develop independently with their own cultural and historical context. The connection between the Anunnaki and the fallen angels is not direct in their original mythologies. I would refrain from calling it a one-to-one -one comparison, but an indirect, passed-down mythology that changes in context of time and region. Both the Anunnaki 
from Mesopotamian mythology in these fallen angels or watchers from the book of Enoch represent supernatural beings who have significant interactions with humanity. In both mythologies, there is a theme of divine or semi-divine beings interacting with humanity, often resulting in significant changes in society. The Anunnaki are said to have had an important role in the creation and early history of humanity, often portrayed as teachers or rulers. In a similar manner, the fallen angels in the book of Enoch are said to have descended to earth and had children with human women, creating Nephilim, and they also taught humanity various forms of knowledge, some which led to negative consequences. In both mythologies, these interactions can lead to transgressions against the divine order and subsequent punishments. For example, some interpretations of the myth of the Apkalu, the seven wise demigods, suggest about the last of the Apkalu was considered evil. Barosus the Chaldean mentions these Apkalu long before the discovery of the cuneiform tablets, and he says they are led by a god named Oannes, who was half fish and half man, and taught humanity the creation of the cosmos and how to make fire and weapons. This is reflected in the fallen angels myth of the Watchers teaching humans how to make fire and weapons. The Watchers in the Book of Enoch are portrayed as transgressing divine boundaries by mating with human women and teaching forbidden knowledge, actions which lead to their punishment and the Great Flood. Both sets of beings have a significant impact on human civilization. The Anunnaki were seen as those who decreed the fates and were involved in the establishment of maintenance of civilization. The Watchers, through their transgressions, fundamentally altered the course of human history, bringing about a rise in civilization and its eventual punishment and destruction through the Flood. The stories of the Anunnaki from Mesopotamian mythology and the Titans from Greek mythology are distinct and originated from different cultural and historical contexts. However, like the fallen angels, the Greek mythology has some parallels as well, primarily in terms of power dynamics and generational conflicts among deities. Both the Anunnaki and the Titans are often associated with the primordial times. In Mesopotamian mythology, Anunnaki are among the earliest gods linked with creation of the world and the establishment of civilization, just as the Titans played the same role as they are replaced by the Olympian gods when Zeus overthrows Kronos, just as the old gods are replaced by the new gods in Mesopotamian mythology. In the mythologies of the Hurrians and Hittites, which flourished in the mid to late second millennium BC, the oldest generation of gods was believed to have been banished by the younger gods to the underworld, where they were ruled by the goddess Lelwani. Hittite scribes identified these deities with the Anunnaki. In ancient Hurrian, the Anunnaki are referred to as Kerulesh which means former ancient gods, or Katuresh Shuanesh, which means gods of the earth. Hittite and Hurrian treaties were often sworn by the old gods in order to ensure that the oaths would be kept. In one myth, the gods are threatened by the stone giant Uli Kumi, so Ea, the later name for Enki, commands the former gods to find the weapon that was used to separate the heavens from the earth. They find it and use it to cut off Ulukumi's feet. Although the names of the Anunnaki in Hurian and Hittite texts frequently vary, they are always eight in number. Similarly, in Greek mythology, the Titans are the children of Uranos, heaven, and Gaia, earth, just as the Anunnaki are the children of Anu and Ki, also heaven and earth. In both mythologies, there's a theme of conflict or tension between generations of gods.
The Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, tells of how the god Marduk of the younger generation defeats Tiamat, an ancient goddess often associated with the Anunnaki, and becomes the king of the gods. Similarly, in Greek mythology, there's the Titanomachia, a 10-year war where the Olympians, the younger generation of gods, overthrows the Titans, the older generation. Both of these myths relate to the establishment of cosmic order and the allocation of divine roles. After Marduk's victory in the Enuma Elish, he creates the world and assigns roles to the gods. After the Titans' defeat in the Titanomachia, Zeus and his siblings divide the cosmos among themselves and establish their rule over the universe. The mythology of the Anunnaki has indeed influenced later civilizations, most notably Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, as well as the Hittites and the Greeks, all of whom inherited much of Sumer's cultural and religious legacy. These civilizations not only adopted the Anunnaki into their pantheons, but also developed and transformed their myths over time. A prominent example would be Marduk originally a minor god in the Sumerian pantheon who was elevated by the Babylonians to the status of chief deity. Marduk is often associated with Anu, the Sumerian sky god, and Enlil, who was initially considered the head of the Sumerian pantheon. The succession of the gods, like Zeus, Kronos, and Uranos, seems apparent throughout these cultures. Moreover, the motif of a group of important deities deciding the fates can be seen in many other ancient Near Eastern and Mediterranean mythologies, such as Egyptian, Greek, and Roman pantheons. While it's not a direct one-to-one -one correspondence, these similarities suggest cultural exchanges and shared archetypal ideas in ancient civilizations. The Nephilim are mentioned briefly in the Hebrew Bible specifically in the book of Genesis 6 and Numbers 13. Their origins and nature, however, are somewhat cryptic and have been the subject of much debate and speculation. In Genesis, the Nephilim are described as the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of humans. The exact identity of these sons of God is not clear. Interpretations range from fallen angels to descendants of Seth, Adam and Eve's third son, while the daughters of humans are generally thought to refer to mortal women. The Nephilim are said to be the heroes of old, warriors of renown, indicating their extraordinary strength or abilities. They are often depicted as giants, especially in later Jewish or Christian tradition. In the book of Numbers, the term Nephilim, used again when the Israelites send spies into Canaan, and they report back. So they brought the Israelites an unfavorable report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great size. There we saw the Nephilim. The Anakites come from Nephilim. And ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. This passage is often interpreted to suggest that the Nephilim were giant beings, but it's also possible that the term here is used more symbolically to describe formidable enemies. The mysterious nature of the Nephilim have led to numerous interpretations and theories. The term Nephilim comes from the Hebrew root Nephil, which means to fall. Therefore, Nephilim is often translated as the fallen ones. This has led interpretations of the Nephilim as fallen angels or their offspring. However, the word could also be related to the Aramaic word Nephil or Nephilim, which means giants, reflecting the tradition of the Nephilim as giant beings in many later Jewish and Christian texts. The term's ambiguity in the biblical text, its rare use, and the various interpretive traditions have led to many different translations and interpretations. It's important to note 
that while we can make educated guesses based on linguistic and historical context, the precise meaning of Nephilim in the Bible is not definitively known. And even with these parallels, it must also be stressed that the Anunnaki and the Nephilim are a part of two distinctive ancient cultural traditions, Mesopotamian and Hebrew. There isn't a direct connection between the two in their original context. If that was the case, then why wouldn't the Hebrew authors just call them Anunnaki? Why call them Nephilim? They are separate entities within their respective cultures and religious traditions. The Anunnaki were deities who in different Mesopotamian cultures held various roles from being the high gods of the pantheon to the Chthonic underworld deities. On the other hand, the Nephilim, according to the Hebrew Bible, are the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of humans, often depicted as giants or mighty warriors. The interpretation of the Anunnaki as deities of the ancient Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians is well established in historical and archaeological research. However, in recent years, the Anunnaki have taken on a new life in the realm of pseudo-archaeology, conspiracy theories, and science fiction. For example, the ancient astronaut theory proposed by Zechariah Sitchin in his Earth Chronicles argues that the Anunnaki were actually a race of extraterrestrial beings from the planet Nibiru who visited Earth in search of gold over 400,000 years ago. According to Sitchin, these beings genetically engineered Homo sapiens as a worker race to mine gold. Zechariah Sitchin also posits that the Anunnaki were a race of extraterrestrial beings who visited Earth and genetically engineered humans. For over a half a century, biblical scholar and Near East historian Zachariah Sitchin devoted his life to proving the link between human beings and the Nephilim, giants, mentioned in the book of Genesis. Sitchin's research identifies them as ancient aliens known as the Anunnaki, who came to Earth from the planet Nibiru. Excuse me, my teacher, uh, why do you say giants when the word in Hebrew is Nephilim? Uh, coming from the root Nafol, which means to come down, to descend. And uh, I was expecting uh, to be complimented uh, by the teacher, where she said something like, sit, in, sit down, you don't question the Bible. Many of the seal impressions that we have that are so significant to seeing how things were depicted in those days, be it humans or gods, come from these envelopes. Well, we have arrived at Haran, the city where Abraham dwelt with his father and brother and nephew. It's important to emphasize that these interpretations are not accepted by mainstream historians, archaeologists, or experts in Mesopotamian mythology. They are often criticized for a lack of rigorous scholarship misinterpretations of ancient texts, and a reliance on unsupported speculations. Here is Dr. Joshua Bowen, an Assyriologist who has done several videos and wrote books on this subject. I have links to these full videos and his book, How to Read Sumerian, which is one of my go-to's in my library. You know, you have to keep this in mind when you, number one, when you, when you look at Sumerian and what people are saying about Sumerian, but, uh, you know, in his book, he does this all the time, all the time. It, you know what? It's it's sort of the equivalent to, you know, in a, it's far worse, but it's roughly equivalent to if you were to say butterfly, right? Somebody a thousand years from now were see the word butterfly and they would say, ah, this is a type of a stick that was kind of slippery and went on bread that was able to soar through the air, butterfly. Nope. No, it's not. Um, as it turns out. As it turns out. Uh, so he describes the gods as ancient astronauts. Then he discuss discusses at length the Mu. So what is the Mu? Uh, he argues that it's a fiery rocket. And then finally, uh, he uses when humans flew to uh, the heavens as an example. So, or several, several examples of this. 
to make his point. So the gods as ancient astronauts. So could the gods fly? Well, he discusses the god Zoo. Now, for those of you that have been with us for a while, you're probably not familiar with the god Zoo. You... I was also not familiar with the god Zoo, and I've been working on this for a while, so. But you know Ninorta, and yeah. you know that he engages with someone called Anzu later. He's depicted as a bird, so he's definitely talking about Anzu. He uses what he says is a mu, an MU, to fly around. So even though he's depicted as a bird, it's almost like a metaphor. Ninorta kills him with Tillum which are arrows and these are these arrows quote unquote were actually missiles uh, that were fired into zoo's moo continuing on he uses this statue from mari <clears throat> that's he says is the goddess inanna there is absolutely nothing about this statue that suggests it's the goddess inanna it is a goddess he addresses the word for god dinger he says that it's broken up into two parts, din, which means righteous, pure, or bright, gear, which means a sharp object. Or also <laughs> a two-stage rocket with fins. I mean, so here, here's what I would say. Sitchin consistently misunderstood, mistranslated, or at worst, intentionally misrepresented the Sumerian and Akkadian linguistic data. It seems likely that he did not know Sumerian or Akkadian. If he did, he made such basic and egregious errors with the language that one can only conclude that he was intentionally misleading his audience. In either case, Sitchin brilliantly used the Mesopotamian literary corpus and the lack of widespread familiarity with the texts and the languages to sell his books. Whether he did that intentionally or not, you know, it's, I can't, I can't get in his head. While these theories of fallen aliens might be shocking and compelling to some, they should be taken with a large grain of skepticism. Anything's possible, but as it stands, there is no empirical evidence or scholarly consensus that supports these claims. They are generally viewed as fringe theories outside of accepted academic discourse. These ancient alien theories, as it must be stressed, they involve misinterpretations and mistranslations of the text. So we are going to look at chapter five, which is called the Nephilim, people of the fiery rockets. Josh, who or what are the Nephilim? In yeah, Russian Hebrew? Uh, so the Nephilim are, <clears throat> they appear in two different places. Um, Genesis chapter six is the, early, uh, the earliest as far as when it appears in the biblical text as it stands today. And then uh, in Numbers 13. And the Numbers one is probably the one to talk about first. So uh, in the book of Numbers, when the, the spies go into the land and uh, they they spy it out before they go in and uh, 10 of them come back and they report that there are giants in the land, Philim. And uh, so the Septuagint, that's where it appears. Uh, then it appears in uh, Genesis chapter six before the flood story, right? As sort of the the backdrop to the the reason for the flood story. And so the Nephilim there are parenthetically they're in a parenthetical phrase in the Hebrew. Sons of God come into the daughters of men. They take wives. They have offspring of these these, these giborim, these uh, these great men, these mighty men, and they call them Anshe Hashem which is uh, the men of, literally the men of the name. So uh, it's pretty common, common enough, at least in the Hebrew text uh, and in the ancient Near East, uh, wider ancient Near East, that this idea of uh, the name would be like of prestige, of um, being known throughout perpetuity. I'm emphasizing this because it comes up in the book. He wants name to mean something very specific. But anyhow. Yes. Uh, so. The chapter opens, as it does, with a quote from um, a Mesopotamian literary composition called Inanna and Shukale Tuda, in which the goddess Inanna is kind of soaring over the earth and looking at all of her domain, and then she lands in an orchard, goes to sleep, and is promptly raped by someone. Um, he gets his comeuppance later on. But the point of this is that the language Sitchin says shows very clearly that the goddess Inanna is flying. And because she doesn't have wings, she must be flying in a spaceship. Now, 
Can we just pause and let that sink in? Let's give it a moment of silence that is due. Such a statement. The goddess, the divine being in the story, goddess, sorry, just want to knock that, is flying in the text. And since she doesn't have wings, she must be flying in a rocket ship. Yep. Facts. Less, less. My Anunnaki brain does not compute. Zechariah Sitchin refers to various cuneiform texts to support his idea of the planet Nibiru. One key text he often cites is the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation epic. Sitchin suggests that references to a celestial body called Marduk, named after the Babylonian deity, is actually referring to Nibiru. In the Enuma Elish, Marduk is portrayed as a wandering planet that collides and splits Tiamat, a primordial goddess associated with the sea, in two. Sitchin interprets Tiamat as a pre-existing planet located between Mars and Jupiter. He suggests that one half of Tiamat became the asteroid belt and the other was struck by another of Marduk's moons and was pushed into a new orbit, becoming Earth. So let us move on uh, to the May. Now I, we've done a video on the May before. Um, this is a very difficult, complicated word. And Sitchin says that the May is the spacesuit that we've already discussed that Inanna probably wasn't wearing when she went to the underworld. Uh, so Sitchin says um, Inanna, he quotes Inanna, he doesn't give a text, which is a pain in the ass. It really is. The lack of citation in this book makes you want to weep and, and then, then die. Sitchin's interpretation of the Enuma Elish and his association of Marduk with Nibiru is heavily criticized by scholars. Mainstream's interpretation reads the Enuma Elish as mythology and not literal astronomical account, more connected with nature of the world rather than the nature of space. Furthermore, Sitchin's identification of Nibiru with Marduk is not supported in any cuneiform text that we know of. The term Nibiru in the extent text is used to, to denote a point of crossing and sometimes is associated with certain celestial bodies depending on their position in the sky, but it's never described as the home of the Anunnaki, nor as an additional planet in our solar system with an unusual orbit, as Sitchin claims. So, the problem with this, <laughs> <laughs> apart from taking a myth as literal fact and believing that the gods were actually aliens that genuinely came to Earth and genetically engineered all humanity. The problem with this is that the goddess Inanna is very often conceptualized as the planet Venus. All the time. It's very, very common in Mesopotamia for gods to be like, not just associated with celestial bodies, but they are those celestial bodies. It's why judgments would take place outside before Utu or Shamash, the sun god, because he was the god of judgment, because as the sun, the literal sun, he saw everything that happened. So he wouldn't know if you were telling the truth, and he would know if you were lying. So Inanna is not flying over the Earth in a rocket ship. <laughs> she is the Venus star. Where the Venus like, star She's at? the planet Venus. Oh, right up there. Yeah, that's Inanna. <laughs> Sitchin's theories and translations of Sumerian texts have drawn considerable criticism from professional scholars in the field. Some of the key points of contention from Dr. Bowen and others, who are proficient in the Sumerian language, have pointed out numerous mistakes in his translations. They argue that Sitchin appears to, to lack a solid understanding of Sumerian grammar, syntax, and vocabulary, which leads him to create translations that deviate significantly from the accepted readings of these texts. So he says, uh, the text quoted Enlil as saying to her, this is page 136 speech. The text quoted Enlil as saying to her, you have lifted the May, you have tied the May to your hands, you have gathered the May, you have attached the May to your breast. O queen of all the May, O radiant light, who with her hand grasps the seven May. So. Why we, why we translate singular for all of those is bizarre. Uh, particularly in light of the last one, the seven May. Uh, it, th these, these are, these are, 
Okay, sorry. It's like moose. Moose. You don't say mooses. You say the seven moose. You say moose. I thought you say moose. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Mason! <laughs> Sorry, little Brian Regan. Coming in there, I want to give props. <laughs> so, he's translate. well, he's not translating maybe, he's making an argument that the May are um, a collection of objects that one puts on oneself in order to travel into space. And that makes sense in what he's saying because... Um, that was a weird sentence coming out of your mouth. <laughs> no, no, there's some internal logic here. Um, it, it makes sense here because he's saying that Inanna is putting on all of this gear in order to go and visit Arn who lives in the sky because he's a sky god and that's generally speaking where they reside. So in order to go and see Arn, she has to get her space suit, suit on and then get in her spacecraft and go up into the sky. The problem with this, again, one, one of many, the problem with this is that the May actually have names. There are more than seven of them. It depends what text you're reading, but in a lot of cases, there are more than seven of them. Many, many more. Many, many more. Um, and in one of the texts where Inanna gets on a boat, not a spaceship, you will notice, she gets on a boat. To so she's going to see Enki. She goes up, she sees Enki, she gets him blindingly drunk. He falls asleep and then she steals the maze. So in some cases, they're really abstract concepts like righteousness and awe. And in other cases, they are things that you could probably pick up and hold, uh, like the noble scepter, staff and crook, the noble dress, um, but then that's paired with shepherdship and kingship. Sitchin is often accused of taking ancient texts out of context and imposing his own interpretations on them. For instance, he refers to the Anunnaki as actual extraterrestrial beings. Sitchin claims that the Sumerians knew of an extra planet beyond Neptune called Nibiru, which has a long elliptical orbit around the sun. He never provides the source for this or what text he's referring to. According to Sitchin, the Sumerians believe that the Anunnaki came from this planet. However, scholars point out that the term Nibiru is just used for a celestial point of crossing or a large celestial body. And there's no text that identifies Nibiru as an ancient home for the Anunnaki. You see how that works, people? When we say something, we try to back it up with a citation. You know, any of the Sitchinites that are listening, that want to defend their position, this is what's useful. You don't, as dear Sitchin has done, just provide a translation and don't tell them what text it's from. Traditionally, you give a text. If you have it, you give a tablet number so we can go and look at the actual tablet you're citing, a line number, um, whether it's on the obverse or the reverse of the tablet because they did write on both sides. This is how it's normally done in responsible scholarship so that people can go track down your evidence for themselves and assess your argument properly. He often contradicts the consensus and his theories are never published in peer-reviewed academic journals. A process that ensures scholarly accuracy and reliability. Instead, he chooses the self-published route. Lastly, Sitchin's theories lack empirical evidence. He makes significant claims about advanced technologies, genetic engineering, and architectural capabilities of ancient civilizations based on his interpretations of text, but doesn't provide archeological or physical evidence to substantiate these claims. Ancient astronaut theory often relies on questionable interpretations of ancient texts. In the case of Sitchin's work, the Sumerian texts describe Anunnaki as extraterrestrials from a hypothetical planet. Such as translations of these texts do not have anything in common with anything in Sumerian mythology and are heavily influenced by modern sci-fi films and books. The ancient astronaut theory proposes that the Anunnaki genetically engineered humans to mine gold and that they built sophisticated technology and structures like the pyramids and that these are not tombs but also advanced technology. There's a lack of empirical evidence to support any of these claims. If such advanced technologies were used in ancient times, we would expect to find physical remnants or unambiguous depictions of this technology in ancient artifacts and primary sources. No such evidence has been found. The theory reflects a modern bias that ancient civilizations lacked the capability to build monumental architecture or develop complex societies on their own. This underestimates the capability of our ancestors. Archaeologists have demonstrated that ancient societies had the knowledge, skills, and organization 
to construct monumental architecture and develop complex civilizations without the need for extraterrestrial invention. These ancient astronaut theorists tend to operate outside the standard methodologies and principles of historical and archaeological research, often prioritizing sensational interpretations over more plausible ones and tend to dismiss contrary evidence. This approach does not follow the principles of scientific inquiry, which require hypotheses to be based on empirical evidence and to be testable and falsifiable. While the ancient astronauts' theory might be intriguing, it does not hold up under scrutiny. The Anunnaki, as understood by mainstream historians and archaeologists, were deities in the ancient Mesopotamian pantheon, not extraterrestrial beings. Our understanding of the Anunnaki, like many aspects of ancient civilization, is continually refined through ongoing scholarly research and archaeological discovery. From 12,000 to 10,000 BCE, Anatolia, also known as Asia Minor, transitioning from the late Paleolithic to the Mesolithic period. During this time, the region was characterized by a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, with small groups of people living in temporary settlements. The climate was gradually warming after the last ice age, leading to the expansion of forests and the increased availability of resources such as plants and animals. As the environment became more hospitable, human population in Anatolia began to grow. People started to develop new technologies and tools to adapt to their surroundings. The inhabitants of this region relied on hunting, fishing, gathering wild plants for sustenance. They also began to develop more advanced stone tools, such as microliths, which were small, sharp-edged tools used for various purposes, including hunting and food processing. During this period, there is evidence of increased social interaction and trade between different groups of people in Anatolia. This exchange of ideas and resources likely played a significant role in the development of new technologies and the eventual rise of agriculture in the region. It is clear that between the time of 12,000 to 10,000 BCE, significant change and development in Anatolia, setting the stage for the emergence of more complex societies. Gobekli Tepe, an archaeological site located in southeastern Turkey near the city of San Lurfa, dates back to the pre-pottery Neolithic period around 10,000 BCE, making it one of the oldest known human-made religious structures on the planet. Gebekli Tepe consists of several circular and oval-shaped stone enclosures with the largest measuring about 30 meters in diameter. The site is notable for its T-shaped limestone pillars, some are which up to 5.5 meters tall and weigh up to 20 tons. Many of these pillars are decorated with intricate carvings of animals, such as foxes, snakes, scorpions, birds, and other abstract symbols. The purpose of Gebekli Tepe remains a subject of debate among archaeologists and philologists. Some believe it was a religious center or sanctuary, where others think it may have just been a social gathering place. The site predates the invention of pottery, metal tools, and advanced agriculture, which has led some researchers to propose that it may have played a role in the transition from hunter-gatherer lifestyle to a more settled agricultural society. 
One of the most intriguing aspects of Gebekli Tepe is the apparent lack of permanent habitation. There is little evidence of houses or domestic structures, suggesting that the site was not a permanent settlement, but rather a place visited periodically for religious ceremonial purposes, similar to what we see at Stonehenge. The site was intentionally buried around 8000 BCE, possibly as a means of decommissioning the structure or as a form of ritual closure. The reasons for this remain unclear, but it has helped to preserve the site in a relatively good condition. Gebekli Tepe has significantly impacted our understanding of early human societies and the development of religion, art, and architecture. Its discovery has challenged traditional theories about the origins of civilization and has raised new questions about the role of religion and ritual in the lives of prehistoric people. Jericho, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world, with evidence of settlements that go back to 9000 BCE. Its first inhabitants were likely a mix of hunter-gatherers, just like Gebekli Tepe, who settled in an area due to its fertile soil and abundant water sources. These early inhabitants would have lived as simple mud-brick houses and relied on agricultural hunting and gathering. Over time, the settlement grew and developed, eventually becoming the fortified city that we know today. However, a more advanced city or palace known as Nassos in Crete, which has evidence of people living there going back to 7000 BCE. This may be the first real city in the world. Now, Nassos would not have existed as the ancient Minoan palace that we know of today. However, it does have evidence of some sort of building structure located where the palace was built, which means that Nassos as a city can be traced back to 7000 BCE. The Minoan civilization, which was centered on the island of Crete, did not emerge until 2700 BCE. However, in 7000 BCE, the area was inhabited by Neolithic communities who practiced agriculture, and these are the people that Homer talks about that are called the Pelasgians. The Copper Age, also known as the Chalcolithic period, was a transitional phase between the Neolithic Stone Age and the Bronze Age. It is generally dated between 4,500 and 3,300 BCE. During this time, human societies began to use copper tools and weapons in addition to stone. The Copper Age was marked by significant advancements in technology, agriculture, and social organization. As people learned how to smelt and work with copper, they were able to create more efficient tools and weapons, which in turn allowed for the more productive farming and hunting. This led to an increase in food population, supporting larger populations than the growth of settlements which came with the growth of art and ideas, which led to religion. Trade networks expanded during the Copper Age as the communities sought to acquire copper and other valuable resources. The exchange of goods and ideas facilitated the spread of new technologies and cultural practices across different regions. Medicines were traded. Metallurgy also had a profound impact on social structures as a specialized craftsman emerged to produce copper tools and weapons. These skilled artisans often held a higher status within their communities, reflecting the growing importance of metalworking in Copper Age societies. Ritual practices continued to play a central role in the lives of Copper Age people. Megalithic structures such as Stonehenge in England and the Gantija temples in Malta were constructed during this period, demonstrating the sophisticated engineering skills and religious beliefs of these ancient societies. The emergence of complex burial practices, including the use of grave goods 
and elaborate tombs also points to a growing concern with the afterlife and the veneration of ancestors. The Copper Age saw the rise of several important civilizations, including the Sumerians in Mesopotamia, as well as the Minoans of Crete, and the pre-dynastic Egyptians in the Nile Valley. These early societies developed complex political systems, monumental architecture, and sophisticated art and writing systems, laying the groundwork for later Bronze Age civilizations to follow. As trade networks expanded, the facilitation of goods and ideas cross paths from different regions, and religion and ritual practices continue to play central roles in the lives of people, culturally and politically. The influence of the Proto-Indo-European pantheon on Vedic and Greco-Roman mythology, as well as the early Sumerians and pre-dynastic Egyptians, can be traced back to this transformative period in human history. The Proto-Indo-European pantheon of gods is believed to have originated in the Pontic Caspian Black Sea Steppe region, a region that spans from modern day Ukraine, Russia, and Kazakhstan all the way over to Europe. As the Proto Indo Europeans migrated and interacted with other cultures, their religious beliefs spread and evolved. The Vedic religion, which emerged in ancient India around 1500 BCE, shares many similarities with these Proto-Indo-Europeans. For example, the Vedic god Indra, the king of the gods, the god of thunder, is strikingly similar to the Proto-Indo-European god Perkwanos. Similarly, the Vedic god of fire, Agni, can be traced back to the Proto-Indo-European god Anguanos. The influence of the Proto-Indo-European pantheon can also be seen in Greco-Roman mythology, the Greek god Zeus and the Roman god Jupiter both share characteristics with the sky god Dias Petar. Additionally, the Greek god of the sea Poseidon and the Roman god Neptune have similarities with the Proto-Indo-European god of water, Hypnomneptos. The Sumerians, who inhabited modern-day Iraq, developed one of the earliest known systems of writing, the cuneiform script. This allowed them to record their religious beliefs, which centered around a pantheon of gods including Anu, the god of the sky, and Enlil, the god of wind and storms. These gods would later influence the religious beliefs of the Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians. The Pelasgians, however, were pre-Hellenic people who inhabited parts of Greece and the Aegean region before the arrival of Greeks. Little is known about their religion, as there are few surviving records or artifacts. However, it is believed that they practiced a form of animism or nature worship with a focus on fertility and agricultural deities. Some scholars suggest that the Pelasgians may have influenced the development of early Greek religion, in particular the worship of the earth goddess Gaia and other Chthonic deities. In pre-dynastic Egypt, before the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt around 3000 BCE, various local deities were worshipped. Some of these deities, such as the falcon god Horus and the cow goddess Hathor, will later be incorporated in the Egyptian pantheon during the dynastic period. The early Egyptians also believed in the concept of Mat, cosmic order that maintained balance and harmony in the universe. The Minoans, centered around the island of Crete, was another influential Bronze Age culture. These Minoans are best known for this palace that I mentioned earlier at Knossos, which featured elaborate frescoes depicting religious scenes. Minoan religion appears to have been centered around a great goddess who is associated with fertility, nature, and possibly the underworld. The Minoans also had a male god depicted as a bull or a bull-headed man who 
connected with Bacchus may have been the consort to the great goddess. Dionysus shows up in the earliest forms of writing, as well as hieroglyphs, predating writing itself. The Minoan religion was centered around the worship of these various deities, with a strong emphasis on the female goddess, the serpent goddess. The primary deity was this mother goddess, who was associated with animals and nature. Other important deities, the master of animals and sky father, were part of this pantheon, and the Minoans practiced rituals involving animal sacrifices, processions, orgies, and offerings. Their religious symbols included the double-headed axe, the bull, and the serpent. The Roman pantheon was influenced by these various cultures, Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. Manu and Yemo are figures from Indo-European mythology, just like Romulus and Remus are the legendary founders of Rome and Roman mythology. Manu and Yemo are believed to be the first man and first king, respectively, in the Indo-European mythological tradition. In some versions of the myth, Yemo is sacrificed by Manu to create the world, just as Romulus kills Remus in order to build Rome. In the Indian myths, Manu the first man and his twin brother Yama is sacrificed and is the first to die who becomes the king of the underworld while Manu becomes the father of mankind and survives a flood like Noah and Gilgamesh. The god Mars, the Roman god of war and oaths is connected to the Proto-Indo-European god Mawarts the deity of war and storms. This figure is also related to the Greek Ares and the Hindu Marutas. Neptune, the Roman god of the sea, is linked to the Proto-Indo-European Neptos, the deity of water and underworld. This figure is also related to the Vedic god Napat and the Irish god Nakat. Minerva, the Roman goddess of wisdom and war, is associated with the proto indo European goddess, Hesos, the deity of dawn, and this figure is also related to Athena and Eos, and the Hindu goddess Ushas. Venus, also related to this goddess as well, is the goddess of love and beauty and fertility, also the dawn goddess who is known in Latin as Lucifer, light bringer. Hewos is the figure in the Proto-Indo-European pantheon related to this. There is also Perquanos, the Lord of Oaks, which reminds one of Zeus of Dodona, one of the ancient wonders of the world, surrounded by oak trees. And like Perquanos, he is a sky god connected with thunder and lightning. Obvious connections to Indra as well as Zeus. Keranos, the name of Zeus's thunderbolt. The Hercina, spring nymph, associated with the river of the same name identified with Demeter. The name could be a bowering as it rather follows a Celtic sound law, which explains why Indra and Dias Pitar in Hindu mythology are two distinct gods, unlike how Zeus takes on the role of both and is synced with Jupiter, both related to Dias or Day Father. Jupiter, the king of the gods in the Roman pantheon, is associated with Dias Pitar, the Sky Father. This deity is also the precursor to Zeus, as I've mentioned, and the Hindu god Dias Pitta. This god, although a Sky Father, seems to be connected with an underworld king of Hades known as Dis Pater. Dis Pater, otherwise known as Rex Infernus or Pluto, is a Roman god of the underworld. Dis was originally associated with fertile agricultural land and mineral wealth, and since those minerals came from underground, he was later equated with the Chthonic deities Dionysos, Pluto, Hades, as well as Saturn, who becomes the king of the underworld and rules the golden age where everybody has wealth. 
Tacitus refers to the god Odin as Mercury, Thor as Hercules, and Tyr as Mars. He calls the Isis of the Swebi, who is known as Freya. I think it should be pointed out that Herodotus also relates that the Hyperboreans are descended from Hermes, connecting Odin once again to Mercury. But Julius Caesar himself, who spent many years of his life in Gaul, relates that they are descended from Dis. This makes sense because the ancient form of Bacchus, who is the frenzy god, and Odin is the god of the frenzy who possesses. Bacchus is also the god of the frenzy who possesses. Both Odin and Bacchus are connected to the All-Father, Dis, the king of the underworld. This connection between Hades and Bacchus goes back to the Greeks as well. Here we see two depictions of Bacchus and Hades, both looking identical. Black beards, ivy wreath crown, and holding a Thrysis staff. Saturn's role as the devourer and underworld king can be traced to Egypt. Sobek, also known as Seb or Geb, is either depicted with the head of a snake or a crocodile as he devours the souls of the wicked. In Greco-Roman Egypt, Seb or Geb was equated with the Greek god Kronos because he held a quite similar position in the Greek pantheon as the father of the gods, Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, as Seb did in Egyptian mythology. This equation is particularly well attested in Teptunus in the southern Phaeum. Seb and Kronos were here part of a local version of the cult of Sobek, lord of the four corners, the crocodile god. The equation was shown on the one hand in local iconography of the gods in which Seb is depicted as a man with attributes of Kronos, and Kronos with the attributes of Seb. On the other hand, the priests of the local main temple identify themselves in Egyptian texts as priests of Sakhnatubis Seb, or Sakhnatubis Geb, but in Greek texts as priests of Sakhnatubis Kronos. Accordingly, Egyptian names formed with the name of the god Seb or Geb were just popular among local villagers, as Greek names derived from Kronos, especially Kronian. In the case of the Egyptians, it was this destroyer, Seb, who takes on all the traits of the earth shaker, Poseidon, Hades, king of the underworld, and the sky father, Zeus, and he holds a trident like Poseidon, but also like Shiva. Seb, like Shiva, can be connected with the Proto-Indo-European Sawa through this god Sabatios, who also has a Proto-Indo-European root name, Siwa. Shiva, one of the principal deities in Hinduism, is indeed associated with time through his aspect of Kala, Kala, which means time in Sanskrit, is one of the many aspects of Shiva. In this form, Shiva is considered the lord of time, destruction, and change, just as Saturn has the same traits. He is often depicted as the destroyer of the universe, who brings about the end of time to make way for new creation. This cyclical nature of time in the universe is a key concept in Hindu cosmology. Kalis and Kali have similar Proto-Indo-European etymologies. The word for Kalis, as you can see here on this chart, to call, to cry, is also related to the word calendar or the calends of a month in the Roman calendar. But here we see Kel to turn in motion, pivot, pole star, connecting with time and the cycle nature of the heavens and the sky that turns in a clockwise nature. Kel and Kelly are related through this Proto-Indo-European word. So the goddess Kali, who's the consort of Shiva, just as Kalis is the father of Saturn in Roman mythology, 
and Calus is depicted on the cuirass of Augustus of Prima Porta at the very top above the four horses of Helios's quadriga. He is a mature bearded man who holds a cloak over his head so that it billows in the form of an arch, a conventional sign of deity that recalls the vault of the firmament. He is balanced and paired with the personification of Earth at the bottom of the cuirass. These two figures have also been identified as Saturn and Magda Mater to represent the new Saturnian golden age of Augustan ideology. On the altar of the Lairs, now held by the Vatican, Calus in his chariot appears among with Mithras above the figure of Augustus. The name Calus occurs dedicatory inscriptions in the connection to the cult of Mithras. The Mithraic Calus is sometimes depicted allegorically as an eagle bending over the sphere of heaven marked with symbols of the planet or the zodiac. In the Mithraic context, he is associated with Catus and can appear as Calus Aeternus, eternal sky. A form of a Hora Mazda is invoked in Latin as Calus Aeternus Jupiter. The walls of some of the Mithraea feature allegorical depictions of the cosmos with Oceanus and Calus. The Mithraeum of Dyberg represents the tripartite world of Calus, Oceanus, and Tellus below Phaeton Heliodramus. Mitra Varuna is a deity or dyad of deities that played a significant role in the Proto-Indo-European religion as well as the Vedic religion. Composed of two distinct elements, Mitra and Varuna, this divine pair represented different aspects of sovereignty, with Mitra embodying reason, order, and benevolence, and Varuna symbolizing violence, darkness, and inspiration of the frenzy. The concept of Mitra as Brahman and Varuna as the king of Gandharva is a particular suggestive formula. The Gandharva normally live in a mysterious world of their own, beyond the darkness into which Indra smote the singular Gandharva for the greater good of the Brahman. In Varuna's legend, the Gandharva intervene at a tragic moment to restore his failed virility with a magic herb, just as the first Luperki put an end to the sterility of the woman Romulus had abducted. This Mitra Varuna dyad can be seen as an ancient form of the Apollonian Dionysian dualism that we see in Greek mythology. Sky and underworld, dark and light, righteousness and liberty. In an earlier model, Georges Dumézil proposed that Waranos, also the god in the reconstructed dialogue, is the nocturnal sky and benevolent counterpart of Diwos, with possible cognates the Greek Aranos and Vedic Varuna from the Proto-Indo-European Waru, which means to encompass over. Waranos may have personified the firmament or dwelled in the night sky, in both Greek and Vedic poetry, Aranos and Varuna are portrayed as wide-looking, bounding or seizing their victims and having or being heavenly seat. This dyad can be seen in the Thracian religion, with Clement of Alexandria compared to Jesus being in the bosom of Yahweh, which he compared to Sabasius being the godhead of Bacchus and Zeus or Saturn. Sabasios a god of the Thracians and Phrygians is also known from Greek and Latin sources as Sebasios or Sebadios, his name related to the Macedonian word Sadoi or Satyrs. According to some scholars, he was a Thracian mountain god whose cult was carried by Phrygian emigrants from Thrace to Anatolia. Greek sources from the 5th century BCE onward mention Sebasios as a Thracian god and Athens his cult's initiation ceremonies took place by night, and the depths were purified by being rubbed by serpents. A sacramental drink was also involved. The identification of Sabatios with Dionysus, which occurs regularly in Hellenistic sources, is unquestionable. He might have had the features of the heavenly god, hence he was later identified 
the Semitic god Baal, both of them receiving Greek epithet Hypsistos, or highest, or supreme. Sabazios' name, connected with the Proto-Indo-European Siwo, connected to Shiva, as well as Saturn, meaning his own. The idea of freedom, which constantly shows up in the epithets of Dionysus. Franz Cumont has suggested a relationship with the Illyrian Sabai, or Sabayum, identifying beer extracted from cereals, such as we see in the Eleusinian Mysteries, the Bacchus and Demeter. Sabatios connected with the Proto-Indo-European word for sap as a sap god with his juices and fluids being drunk in the mysteries. This translation corresponds well to the pattern of Dionysus who has the divinity of humidity and such was connected to the vegetation and intoxication. Anatolia identified Sabatios with Sabaoth under the Roman rulers, Sabatios was worshipped in Thrace, where he was often known as Sabazios, or in Latin, Sabadios, and where he received such epithets as benevolent, curious, lord, Megistos, greatest, and hypsistos, most high, and so forth. Theos hypsistos, god most high. And he was constantly identified both with Zeus, the sun, and the moon sort of a dual underworld sky father earth sun god head sun and moon in one the motifs of hands making the votive gesture are among the distinctive features of his cult the right hand of god according to several christian writers clement arnobius maternus the most impressive rite of initiation into the mysteries of sabatios consisted of the adept's contact with the serpent that was first put over his breast and then pulled down to his genitals. No less enigmatic than Zelmaxis, Sabatios was worshipped as early as the 4th century BCE, both as the Chthonic and Heavenly God, as I mentioned, and traces back to this common root of Zababa. Scholars have often tried to solve this riddle, supposing that borrowing from the Jewish religion, but the Jewish influence was not relevant in Anatolia before the 3rd century BCE. One should rather consider the Chthonic features determine the character of the Thracian Sabatios, whereas the Phrygian Sabatios was probably connected with the Sky Father Zeus. This very Sky Father was often worshipped side by side with the Earth Mother. Kubaba, later known as Kaibali. The Sumerians in the 4th century BCE show evidence of knowledge of this very duo. Zababa, Sumerian god of war and the tulatary deity of the city of Kish before it became Babylon in ancient Mesopotamia. He is often depicted as a warrior holding a weapon just like Sabatios was such as a mace or a bow, and often associated with the protection of the city and its people. Zababa was often linked with the goddess Inanna, either related as brother and sister or husband and wife. The goddess Kubaba, mentioned in the legendary Sumerian king list, though due to her gender, her inclusion is considered unusual. While modern authors refer to her as the queen, the Sumerian title applied to her is Lugal, king, which had no feminine counterpart. A recension from Ur instead states that there was no king while Kubaba reigned. A span of a hundred years, she is the only ruler from the third dynasty of Kish listed. The list describes her as the innkeeper and credits her with strengthening the foundation of Kish and attributes a hundred years culminating in the temporary transfer of power from Kish to Akshak before it was regained by Putzer Suen. The latter ruler is said to be Kubaba's son, which makes her the grandfather of Ur Zababa. Once again, Zababa, named after the god, a legendary king who reigned for 400 years and was the legendary opponent 
of Sargon of Akkad, the founder of the first Akkadian dynasty, the Sumerians. The Sargon legend is a Sumerian text purporting to be Sargon's biography. In this text, Ur Zababa, who is the grandson of legendary Kubaba queen, is mentioned who often who awakes after a dream. For unknown reasons, Ur Zababa appoints Sargon as his cupbearer. Soon after this, Ur Zababa invites Sargon to his chambers to discuss a dream of Sargon's involving the favor of the goddess Inanna. Also in the Sargon legend, Ur Zababa is described as being the brother of holy Inanna, just as the god Zababa is the brother of Kubaba, the goddess, and this goddess would end up replacing Kubaba as the main goddess of Babylon, just as Ninurta would replace Zababa as the tulatary deity of Babylon. Ninurta has the same traits as the god Saturn, just as Inanna has the same features as Venus. Could it be that Sargon's triumph over the Ur Zababa shows a polemic against these ancient earlier traditions that we see in Proto Indo European? According to Gonzalo Rubio in the Journal of Cuneiform Studies, Zababa and Kubaba are not Semitic names and are borrowed, in fact, from Proto Indo Europeans, which is not common with Sumerian traditions. But we now know that Inanna and Ninurta would replace, in fact, Kubaba and Zababa as the tulatary deities of the city of Kish, which later became the city of Babylon. Inanna and Ninurta have parallels to Venus and Saturn in Roman mythology. And it could be how the king and queen, God of Israel, Yahweh and Asherah, became the head of the pantheon. The golden vines and satyrs in the temple of Yahweh, along with the observance of the Sabbath, reflects the Babylonian connections to Israelite tradition. In ancient Babylonia, the Akkadian word Sheb Shabum corresponds to the 15th day of the month as the day of quieting God's heart. These are the Akkadian words Sebatom, meaning seventh day. The Babylonians observed the full moon as a day of rest and call it the Shabbat. Sabatios, the Phrygian descendant of this ancient deity, can be seen with the moon on his forehead. Possible early connections between Sabatios and his followers are indigenous mother goddess Phrygia Kybele may be reflected in Homer's brief reference to the youthful feats of Priam, who aided the Phrygians in their battles against the Amazons an aspect of the compromised religious settlement, similar to other mythic adjustments throughout the Aegean culture, can be read in the later Phrygian King Gordius adoption with Kybele of Midas. One of the native religion's cre creatures was the lunar bull. Sabatio's relation with the goddess may be surmised in the way that his horse places a hoof on the head of the bull in a Roman marble relief at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Whether or not this can be shown as direct influences or just indirect passing down of ideas through the cultural milieu is unknown, but I do think it shows that some aspects of religion are universal that can be traced back to the beginning of civilization. Even the word holy itself, Proto-Indo-European word, which is Hayeg, can be related to both the Greek Hagios and the Vedic Yagios. So, the word holy being common from one side of the continent to the other side of the continent shows that the religious rites are universally connected.
Greetings, fellow Gnosis seekers, and welcome back to this captivating corner of curiosity on this delightful digital domain we call YouTube. Today, my dear wanderers of wisdom, lovers of Sophia, we embark on an expedition through time, uncovering remarkable truths about the cradle of civilization. The vibrant and diverse continent that we call Africa. Let me ask you a question. Where do we all come from? Before you even answer that question, let me just say something first. In my recent videos on oldest religions and oldest gods, we discussed on as the oldest god in written history, the Pelasgian creation story, the oldest reconstructed Genesis myth that exists. The Proto-Indo-European pantheon, which is the oldest reconstructed religious pantheon of gods that can be reconstructed using ancient languages before writing. But none of those answers the question, where do we all come from? Those are all good starting points, but those aren't where we come from. I mean, there's history before all those events. I'm talking about our origins as a magnificent species called Homo sapiens. Brace yourself, my inquisitive companions, for we shall dive headfirst into the mesmerizing depths of archaeology and uncover why Africa holds the coveted title of the motherland. Picture this. A vast African savanna, teeming with life, the sun casting its golden rays upon the land. It is here, in this awe-inspiring continent, that our ancestors embarked on an extraordinary journey, evolving over millions of years into the remarkable beings that we are today. Before Anu, before the Proto-Indo-European pantheon, before the Pelasgians inhabited the Mediterranean, Homo sapiens exited the realm of Africa and they came from modern day Ethiopia and they went into three different directions. One direction towards the Black Sea Mediterranean world, another direction towards the Middle East and another direction all the way to the east where people inhabited these islands and Indian subcontinent. You see, Africa is not only our ancestral homeland, but it is the birthplace of humanity itself. But what proof do we have, you might wonder? Archaeological discoveries have revealed the bones of our ancient kin, Homo sapiens, scattered across the African landscape, providing us with undeniable confirmation of Africa's role as our ancestral homeland. The deeper you go into these rock layers, the more prominent Homo sapiens are than other parts of the world. Let us take a moment to appreciate the incredible diversity found in Africa's archaeological wonders, from the fossil-rich lands of the Great Rift Valley to the breathtaking rock art of the Sahara. Each discovery paints a vivid picture of our shared heritage. These remnants of the past tells tales of human triumph, innovation, and adaption, reminding us of the rich tapestry of cultures and civilizations that have thrived on this remarkable continent. Join me as we set our sights on the land of the pharaohs, the pyramids, and the enigmatic hieroglyphs of ancient Egypt, the pre-dynastic Egypt to be precise, the gateway that connects the fascinating civilization and written record history to the very heart of Africa. Egypt, with its mighty Nile River, was a thriving center of culture and innovation. But what many don't realize is that the roots of ancient Egyptian civilization stretch deep into the African soil. Through the intricate trade networks and cultural exchange, the influence of Africa can be seen in the art, customs, and even the deities worshipped by the pharaohs. Firstly, we have the extraordinary findings from the Great Rift Valley a region that stretches across East Africa. 
here in places like Ethiopia and Kenya. Scientists have unearthed ancient fossils of our hominin ancestors dating back millions of years. These remarkable discoveries include the famous Lucy, an Australopithecus afarensis skeleton that offers a glimpse into our early evolution. But it doesn't stop there. Further excavations in the region have unearthed fossils belonging to our direct ancestors, Homo sapiens, dating back to 300,000 years ago. Yes, you heard that right. 300,000 years ago. Africa boasts the oldest known remains of our species, providing concrete evidence that our journey as Homo sapiens began on this very continent. The story of humans begins here, amidst the breathtaking landscapes and ancient savannas of this diverse and vibrant continent. Africa not only holds the oldest fossils of our species, but also carries the genetic imprints of our shared heritage. By understanding and appreciating Africa's pivotal role in our human story, we embrace the knowledge that we are all connected by our origins in this incredible continent. Lucy is a true superstar of paleoanthropology. Let me share with you why the discovery of this 3.2 million year old fossil skeleton was such a monumental breakthrough and what it meant for our understanding of human evolution. In 1974, a team of researchers led by the renowned paleoanthropologist Dr. Jonald Johansson made a groundbreaking find in the Afar region of Hadar, Ethiopia. They unearthed an almost complete fossil skeleton belonging to an early human ancestor of our species, whom they affectionately named Lucy, after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Now, why was Lucy's discovery so important? Well, it's a game changer for several reasons. Firstly, Lucy belonged to the species Australopithecus afarensis, which provided crucial insights into the early stages of human evolution. She walked upright, like modern humans, but also possessed ape-like features, making her a transitional form between primate ancestors and ourselves. Lucy's skeleton was remarkably well-preserved, comprising numerous bones, including the pelvis, limbs, and skull fragments. This level of completeness allowed scientists to reconstruct her anatomy and gain a deeper understanding of her locomotion, body proportions, and overall physiology. By studying Lucy's bones, researchers were able to deduce bipedalism, or walking on two feet, which is a crucial milestone in our evolutionary journey. Lucy's discovery also provided compelling evidence for the African origins of humanity. Her age, 3.2 million years old, firmly placing her within the timeline of early human evolution. Africa, with its diverse ecosystems and geological features, offered the ideal conditions for our ancestors to adapt and thrive. Lucy's existence challenges the previous notions that the evolution of Homo sapiens followed a linear progression. Instead, her discovery highlights the complex and branching nature of our family tree, with multiple species coexisting and evolving alongside each other for millions of years. In essence, Lucy's discovery was a transformative moment in paleoanthropology. It provides tangible evidence of our ancient past, showcasing our ancestors' ability and paving the way for further discoveries and insights into the evolutionary journey that eventually led to us, Homo sapiens.
the oldest known religion in Ethiopia is a traditional belief system called either Ethiopian traditional religion or an Ethiopian indigenous faith. The religious practice predates the arrival of Christianity and Islam by thousands of years. It encompasses a wide range of spiritual beliefs and practices that have been passed down through generations and are deeply rooted in Ethiopian culture and heritage. The same place where Lucy was found, Ethiopia, the religion is characterized by its strong connection to nature, ancestral worship, and the belief in supernatural forces and spirits. It incorporates elements of animism, where various aspects of the natural world, such as rivers, mountains, and trees, are considered to possess spiritual essence and are revered accordingly. The practice of Ethiopian religion involves rituals, ceremonies, and offerings to appease and seek blessings from the ancestral spirits and deities. These rituals often take place in sacred sites, such as forests, groves, mountains, or ancient stone structures known as mazgabas. It is important to note that the Ethiopian religion is not a homogenous belief system, but rather a collection of diverse regional traditions and practices. Different ethnic groups within Ethiopia have their own unique variations of its indigenous faith, often incorporating local customs, beliefs, and cultural elements. With the spread of Christianity and Islam in Ethiopia, Ethiopian religion has experienced a decline in adherence, particularly in urban areas. However, it still holds significance and remains practiced by a considerable number of people particularly in rural communities, where traditional beliefs and customs continue to thrive. The Aksumite religion, also known as Aksumite polytheism, refers to the religious practices and beliefs of the Aksumite Empire, the ancient kingdom located in present-day Ethiopia. The Aksumite civilization flourished from 2nd century BCE to the 7th century of the Common Era and played a significant role in the region's history and culture. This kingdom was known to have adopted the religious customs of its ancestors that predates empire. So the religion predates the kingdom by many centuries and probably evolved from the Bronze Age to antiquity. It is generally understood that the Aksumite religion was a polytheistic belief system with a pantheon of deities worshipped by the people. The primary deity, known Mahrem, also known as Astar, was considered the supreme god and the protector of the Aksumite kingdom. Mahrem was associated with the sky, rain, and fertility, and the stars in the sky at night. The Aksumite kings, who held significant religious and political authority, were believed to be direct descendants of Mahrem, solidifying their divine status and legitimacy. In addition to Mahrem, the Aksumite pantheon included other gods and goddesses, such as Astar, Bahir, Medir, and Waraka. Each deity had specific domains and the worship of themselves for various purposes, including fertility, protection, agriculture, prosperity. The Aksumites practiced ancestor worship as well, believing the deceased ancestors played a role in the spiritual well-being and guidance of the living. They would honor and venerate their ancestors through rituals and offerings seeking their blessings and assistance. Aksumite religion was closely intertwined with the political and cultural aspects of the empire. Temples and religious structures, such as the famous Stele of Aksum, were erected to honor the gods and commemorate the rulers. Ritual ceremonies and sacrifices were held to celebrate important events agricultural cycles and religious observances such as the summer solstice or winter solstices or spring and fall equinoxes. The original Aksumite religion as a distinct and separate faith ceases to exist 
as Christianity took root in the region. And by the 7th and 8th centuries, Islam would end up taking control of all facets of culture, which continues today. The religion of pre-dynastic Sudan, known as ancient Nubia, is often referred to as the Nubian religion. Specific details about this Nubian religion are not extensively documented. Archaeological evidence and historical accounts provide some insights into the practices and beliefs. The Nubian religion shared several similarities with the ancient Egyptian religion, and there are significant cultural and religious exchange between the two regions throughout their history. Nubian deities, such as Dedun, the lion-headed god, associated with wealth and prosperity, and the lioness goddess of Nubia, had counterparts in the ancient Egyptian pantheon. Egyptian deities like Amun were also worshipped in Nubia. This exchange of gods and goddesses suggests a merging or borrowing of religious ideas and practices. Iconography and symbols, such as the Nubian religious art symbols, often displayed similar motifs to those found in ancient Egyptian art. Animal imagery, such as lions, bulls, and snakes, were significant in both of these religious cultures. The use of sacred symbols like the Ankh which stands for eternal life, was shared between Nubians and Egyptians. Nubian burial practices, particularly in the Kerma culture, featured pyramids and tumuli, similar to the Egyptian pyramids and tombs. The belief in an afterlife and the provision of grave goods for the deceased were common in both cultures, indicating a shared concept of the importance of the afterlife. The close proximity and long history of interaction between Nubia and Egypt resulted in cultural exchange and political influence. As Egypt expanded its role into Nubia, Egyptian religious practices and beliefs spread into the region, integrating with existing Nubian religious traditions. And vice versa, Nubian religious traditions impacted the growing Egyptian religion. The Nubian rulers especially during the period of the Kingdom of Kush, adopted religious titles from the Egyptians and vice versa, further blending the religious practices of the two civilizations. The extent and depth of these influences can vary depending on the historical period and the specific Nubian and Egyptian cultures involved. Overall, religious practices and beliefs of pre-dynastic Sudan specifically ancient Nubia, contributes to the religious landscape of the entire region. The Nubian-Egyptian religious connection highlights the interconnectedness of these ancient civilizations and the mutual influence they had on each other's religious and cultural development. Dedun is the ancient Nubian deity who played a significant role in the religious beliefs of the region. He is often depicted as a lion-headed god, associated with the wealth and prosperity and abundance. The worship of Dedun dates back to the early Nubian civilizations. The lion-headed representation of Dedun is reminiscent of the majestic and powerful qualities associated with lions. Symbolizing strength and protection, Dedun was revered as the bringer of light and material possessions and agricultural fertility. He's also connected closely with the Nile River and the annual flooding, like Osiris was. The flooding of the Nile brought nutrient-rich sediments, enabling fertile soils and bountiful harvest. Dedun was believed to have the control over these waters and was regarded as the bestower of the river's life-giving properties. Nubian rulers and elites often sought the favor and blessings of Dedun for their kingdom's prosperity and success. 
He was considered a patron deity of the rulers protecting their wealth and ensuring prosperity of the realms. Dedun's importance is reflected in the various inscriptions and monuments dedicated to him by the Nubian kings, particularly during the kingdom of Cush's zenith. The influence of Dedun extended beyond Nubia as his worship is also spread into Egypt. Dedun was associated with Nubia and revered alongside Egyptian deities, but he was also equated with the Egyptian god Osiris, further highlighting the interconnectedness of these two regions. Although Dedun's prominence waned with the decline of the kingdom of Kush and the advent of Christianity and Islam, his legacy can still be glimpsed in the archaeological remains and inscriptions left behind. The lion-headed god remains an intriguing figure, representing the Nubian people's deep connection to the natural world, their aspirations for wealth and abundance, and their reverence for the life-giving properties of the Nile. Through the worship of Dedun, the Nubian people sought to cultivate prosperity and ensure the well-being of their communities emphasizing the significance of material wealth and agricultural fertility in their religious worldview. Today, the dune stands as a testament to the rich and diverse religious traditions that once thrived in ancient Nubia, offering a glimpse into the spiritual beliefs of this fascinating civilization. Sekhmet is indeed a prominent goddess in ancient Egyptian mythology, known as the lioness-headed goddess of war, healing, and protection. The connection between the Nubian lion-headed goddess and the Sekhmet goddess lies in the cultural and religious interactions between Nubia and Egypt. Nubia and Egypt had a long history of contact and exchange, which including the sharing of beliefs. Sekhmet embodied these qualities and was often depicted wearing a lioness headdress. She was believed to possess the ferocity and healing aspects associated with lions. The ancient religion of Kemet, also known as the ancient Egyptian religion, was practiced in the region of Egypt and Africa. It was a complex and rich belief system that evolved over thousands of years. The religion was polytheistic, meaning it worshipped multiple gods and goddesses. And the ancient Egyptians believed in the existence of a divine hierarchy, with the pharaoh being considered a god on earth. They believed that the gods controlled every aspect of life, from natural forces to human destiny. Some of the most important gods and goddesses in the Kemet religion included Ra, the sun god, Osiris, the god of the afterlife, and Isis, the goddess of magic and fertility. And there's also Horus, the divine child. The ancient Egyptians believed in a concept of an afterlife, where the soul would continue to exist after death. They believed that the deceased would undergo a judgment process, where the heart would be weighed against the feather of Mat the goddess of truth and justice. If the heart was lighter than the feather, they would be granted eternal life in the afterlife. The Kemet religion also involved elaborate rituals and ceremonies, including the construction of temples and tombs. The temples and tombs were dedicated to specific gods and were considered the dwelling places of the gods on earth. The tombs would also ensure safe passage of the deceased into the afterlife. Kemet played a significant role in the daily lives of ancient Egyptians, including their art, architecture, and political structure. It was a central part of their identity and provided them with a sense of purpose and order in the world. In fact, the word Kemet is the original name for Egypt itself and Egypt is a name given by the Greeks. Kemet religion was deeply ingrained in the culture and society of ancient Egypt. The beliefs and practices of Kemet shaped the way for the Egyptians and how they viewed the world. 
The ancient Egyptians built magnificent temples and tombs to honor their gods and ensure a prosperous afterlife. Overall, the influence of Kemet religion on Egyptian society was immense. An area known to archaeologists as Wadi Halfa in modern-day Sudan, which used to be called Upper Egypt, has some of the oldest known structures in the world discovered in Egypt by the archaeologist Waldemar Chamilski along the southern border of Wadi Halfa, Sudan. The structures found here are dated to 100,000 BCE. The remains of the structures are oval depressions about 30 centimeters deep, two by one meters across. Many are lined with flat sandstone slabs, which serve as tent rings, supporting dome-like shelter of skins or brush. This type of dwelling provided a place to live, if necessary, could be taken down easily and moved. They were mobile structures, easily disassembled, moved, and reassembled providing hunter-gatherers with semi-permanent habitation. The oldest religious belief system in this region is called the Dinka religion. The Dinka religion is an indigenous belief system practiced by the Dinka people of South Sudan, which became a part of what was later known as Upper Egypt. These are the southern realms of the Egyptian dynasty. It is a traditional African religion that has been passed down through generations and is deeply rooted in the cultural and spiritual traditions of the Dinka community. The Dinka religion belongs to the African traditional religions. Dinka, like the other African traditional religions, is characterized by a strong connection to nature ancestral veneration, and the belief in spirits and supernatural forces. It revolves around the worship of a supreme deity, Neolik, which translates to God, who is believed to be the creator and sustainer of the universe. Ancestors also hold a significant place in the Dinka pantheon, with rituals and offerings conducted to honor and seek the guidance of the ancestors. The Egyptian religion also deifies the pharaohs and venerates ancestors in their tombs in the same way the Dinka people tend to do the burial sites. The concept of Mat in Egypt is comparable to the Dinka belief in cosmic order. The religion of pre-dynastic Egypt refers to religious beliefs and practices of the ancient Egyptians before the establishment of centralized dynastic rule, which began around 3100 BCE. Pre-dynastic Egypt spanned a long period of time. The religious practices evolved and developed over centuries. The religion of pre-dynastic Egypt is characterized by animism, a belief in the presence of spirits or deities and natural elements of objects. The ancient Egyptians perceived the world as populated by a multitude of supernatural entities that controlled various aspects of life. During this period, animal worship played a significant role in religious practices. Animals, such as crocodiles, hippos, snakes, and bulls, were considered sacred and often associated with specific deities. The Egyptians believed that these animals possessed divine qualities and acted as intermediaries between the human and divine realms. The worship of ancestors and spirits of the deceased was also prevalent during the pre-dynastic period. Ancestral spirits were believed to have influence and could intercede on behalf of the living. So in turn, rituals and offerings were made to honor and appease these spirits, seeking their protection and guidance. Cosmological beliefs were an integral part of the pre-dynastic Egyptian religion. Sky deities such as Horus and Nut represented the heavens, 
while earth and fertility deities like Geb and Hathor were associated with the land's abundance. The worship of natural phenomena such as the sun and the Nile River and other natural elements played a crucial role in pre-dynastic Egyptian religion. The sun, personified as the god Ra or Atum, was highly revered as the source of life and vitality. The Nile River, known as Hapi, was seen as the lifeblood of Egypt, providing fertility and sustenance to the land. As pre-dynastic Egypt transitions into the dynastic period, these religious beliefs and practices continue to evolve and become more complex. These deities became more anthropomorphic with human-like characteristics and intricate mythological narratives surrounding their roles and interactions. In Egyptian religion and philosophy, Maat is a fundamental concept that encompasses the ideas of order, balance, harmony, justice, and truth. It was both a cosmic and ethical concept that guided the beliefs and behaviors of the ancient Egyptians. Maat was personified as a goddess, often depicted as a woman with an ostrich feather on her head, symbolizing truth and balance. She was considered a daughter of the sun, Ra, and played a central role in the divine order of the universe. The concept of Maat was integral to the Egyptian cosmology and the functioning of society. It was believed that Maat provided the foundation for the existence of the world, ensuring its stability and continuation. The gods themselves were seen as upholders of Maat, and their actions were expected to be in alignment with this cosmic principle. On the earthly realm, Maat served as a moral and ethical guide for human behavior. It emphasized the importance of maintaining balance, justice, and truth in all aspects of life. The ancient Egyptians believed that living in accordance with Maat was essential for personal happiness, societal harmony, and the overall well-being of the kingdom. Maat was often associated with the rule of the pharaoh, who was considered the intermediary between the divine and human realms. The pharaoh was expected to uphold Maat, ensuring the just governance of the kingdom and well-being of its people. The ancient Egyptian courts were responsible for upholding justice and maintaining Maat in society. The weighing of the heart ceremony depicted in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, dating back to the Copper Age in 2000 BCE, symbolizes the judgment of the deceased actions in the afterlife, determining whether they live in accordance with Ma. Later on, and even in modern times, the concept of Maktub in Islam can be understood as destiny in the cosmic order, which was possibly influenced by the concept of Ma. Islam, however, is not even close to being the first monotheistic religion to touch Africa. Egyptian Atonism, also known as the Armana Revolution, or the worship of the Aten, refers to a monotheistic religious movement that emerged during the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten during the 14th century BCE. It marked a significant departure from the traditional polytheistic beliefs and religious practices of ancient Egypt. Akhenaten, who ruled from approximately 1353 to 1336 BCE, initiated the Atenist movement. The Aten was a solar deity representing the sun's disk with rays extending down to touch and nurture life on earth. Akhenaten elevated the Aten to the supreme deity declaring it the sole god worthy of worship and changed his own name to Akhenaten, meaning effective for the Aten. The reasons for the emergence of Atenism are complex and not entirely clear. Some scholars believe that Akhenaten's religious reform was influenced by personal beliefs, political motivations, 
or a desire to consolidate power, Akhenaten's reign saw significant political and religious changes, including a shift in the capital city from Thebes to a newly constructed city called Akhenaten, modern-day Amarna. Atenism emphasized the worship of Aten as a singular, all-encompassing deity. It advocated for the idea of a universal and benevolent god who created and sustained all life. Akhenaten sought to eradicate the worship of all the ancient deities and close the temples dedicated to them, centralizing religious worship around the Aten. His ideas failed. After his death, nobody wanted to continue the tradition. The art and iconography during the Atenist period depicted the Aten as a radiant sun disk with rays extending downward, terminating in hands that offered symbols of life and the Ankh. The art reflected a new artistic style characterized by naturalistic and intimate representations of the royal family, deviating from the more idealized and formalized artistic conventions of previous periods. Atenism's influence was short-lived. As I mentioned after his death, his son Tutankhamun reversed the religious reforms, restoring traditional polytheistic worship of multiple deities. The religious practices and artistic styles of the Atenist period were largely erased, and references to Akhenaten and Atenism were deliberately suppressed during the succeeding dynasties. Phoenician voyagers of the early Iron Age after the Bronze Age collapse would come to leave an impact on the religion in North Africa. The oldest religion of ancient Carthage was centered around the worship of a pantheon of deities with a primary focus on Baal Haman, also known as Baal or Melkart, and his consort Tanit. This religious tradition is often referred to as the Punic religion named after the Punic people who inhabited Carthage and its surrounding territories. The Punic religion of Carthage had its roots in the Phoenician religious practices as Carthage was founded by Phoenician colonists from the city of Tyre in the 9th century BCE. Over time, the Carthaginians developed their distinct religious beliefs and rituals influenced by their own cultural context and interactions with other Mediterranean civilizations. Baal Hamon was considered the chief deity of Carthaginian pantheon and represented the power of the sun, fertility, and agricultural abundance. He was often depicted as a bearded figure with a crown or horn headdress sitting on a throne and holding symbols of power. Baal Hamon was associated with life, growth, and prosperity, and his worship played a central role in the religious and social life of the Carthaginian people. Tanit, the consort of Baal, was a goddess associated with fertility, motherhood, and the protection of women. She was often depicted as seated figure holding the symbol of life and surrounded by the symbols of fertility and abundance. Other deities worshipped by the Carthaginians included Melkart, a variant of Heracles and Eshmun, a healing god, and Dagon, a god associated with grain and agriculture. Each deity had its own specific attributes and domains, and the Carthaginians would invoke and offer sacrifices to these deities for various purposes, including protection, fertility, and prosperity. The Carthaginian religious practices included rituals, ceremonies, and sacrifices conducted at temples and sanctuaries. Animal sacrifices, including bulls and sheep and goats, were common, and these offerings were believed to establish a connection between the human and divine realms. Sadly, much of the Carthaginian religious practices, including their religious texts and records, were lost or destroyed over time. The fall of Carthage in 146 BCE to the Romans further contributed to the decline and suppression of Carthaginian religious traditions. As a result, our knowledge of the oldest religion of ancient Carthage is incomplete 
and subject to ongoing scholarly debates. If we move deeper into West Africa, away from Carthage, we do have some sources by the ancients on who these people were who inhabited this region. Herodotus, the ancient Greek historian, often referred to as the father of history, mentioned a group of people called the Atlantis in his writings. According to Herodotus, the Atlantis were a Libyan tribe living in the western part of North Africa. Herodotus describes the Atlantis as a people who live near the Atlas Mountains, which are located in present-day Morocco and Algeria. He mentions that they were skilled warriors known for their use of chariots and were considered to be a powerful and warlike tribe. Herodotus wrote during the 5th century BCE, several centuries after the time he claims to be reporting on and his works often blend historical facts with mythological and legendary elements. Now, if we travel more southward from here, we come to the Yoruba people of ancient Nigeria. The Yoruba people are a West African ethnic group who mainly inhabit parts of Nigeria, Benin, and Togo. The religion of these people appears to be much like Greco-Roman paganism, but much older, and with a fascinating pantheon of deities who are responsible for different roles. For example, Eshu. Eshu, also known as Elegba, or Eshu, is a prominent deity in the Assesi or Orisha religion of the Yoruba people who primarily reside in West Africa. He is considered a complex and multifaceted divinity, often described as a trickster, a messenger and mediator between humans and other Orishas, as well as between humans and Olodumari, the supreme being. Eshu is believed to be the primordial deity who emerged, like Thanes does, in Hesiod's Theogony, the realm of the divine. He is often depicted as a young man wearing traditional Yoruba attire and carrying a staff or a cane. One of his distinct features is his association with crossroads, symbolizing the intersections of different paths and possibilities. Eshu is known for teaching people that there is always more than one truth, and there is always two sides to every argument. As a trickster, Eshu is known for his mischievous nature and unpredictable behavior. He challenges conventions, tests people's moral character, and disrupts order to bring about growth and transformation. Eshu's trickery is not inherently malicious, but serves as a means of teaching important lessons and encouraging individuals to make ethical choices. It is believed that Eshu carries prayers, sacrifices, and offerings from humans to the divine realm, just as Hermes and Thoth did in Greek and Egyptian religion. He acts as a bridge between the physical and spiritual realms, an angel, if you will, a messenger, like Mithras, facilitating communication and interaction between the two sides. In the Yoruba religious ceremonies and rituals, Eshu is often invoked at the beginning as a gatekeeper and protector. His presence is necessary to open the channels of communication and ensure that offerings and prayers reach the intended recipients. Rituals dedicated to Eshu typically involve offerings of palm oil, cola nuts, and alcoholic beverages like wine, which are believed to appease him, like Bacchus. He's often translated by the Islamic critics as the devil or the evil being, but in truth, he is neither of these. He is best referred to as the trickster as he deals a hand of misfortune to those that do not offer tribute 
or are deemed to be spiritual novices. He's also regarded as the divine messenger, prime negotiator between negative and positive forces, and the body and an enforcer of the law of being. He is said to assist in enhancing the power derived from herbal medicines and other forms of esoteric technology like alchemy. The Yoruba people believe that Eshu, along with other Orishas and divinities, have been present since the beginning of time and continue to exist in the spiritual realm. Their existence is not limited by human conceptions of time as they are timeless and transcend the temporal world. Orishas are considered to be intermediaries between the supreme being known as Olu Damari or Oluron. They are seen as accessible and approachable deities who can be invoked. According to Alex Kuochu, Olu Damari Oluron is the supreme almighty god of the Yoruba people and not an Orisha. He has been wrongfully portrayed by early missionaries to West Africa and the African diaspora as a distant but powerful god whose endeavors and dwellings are obscure. However, contrary to the missionaries and the diaspora's view, Aladumari is a powerful god that is always present in everything, even though he is above the Orishas and all people on earth. Abatala is the Sky Father the creator deity associated with wisdom, purity, and justice. He is often depicted as an old man and revered as the father of all the Orishas. Sango is the deity of thunder, lightning, and justice. He represents power, courage, and masculinity. Yamoja is the goddess of the sea, motherhood, and fertility. And she is seen as the nurturing and protective figure associated with compassion and healing. Ogun is the deity of iron, war, and technology. He symbolizes strength, craftsmanship, and determination. Oya, the goddess of wind, storms, and change. She represents transformation, female power, and the spirit of the marketplace. Osun, or Arshun, is the deity of the rivers, love, fertility, and beauty. She is associated with femininity, sensuality, and abundance. These are just a few examples, as there are numerous Orishas recognized in the Yoruba religious practices. The worship of these Orishas involves various ceremonies, rituals, and offerings. These can include drums, prayers, dancing, divination, and revelry and the presentation of specific foods and drinks and potions as offerings. Devotees seek the favor, guidance, and protection and blessings of the Orishas in these rites, and oftentimes have psychedelic experiences similar to the Eleusinian mysteries of Athens. It is important to note that the worship of these Orishas extends beyond Nigeria. It has been influencing all the areas that have adopted various parts of the African diaspora, particularly even in the Americas, after slavery brought these ideas over to the West. In these regions, the Yoruba religious practices merge with other cultural and spiritual traditions, giving rise to syncretic religions such as Santeria in Cuba and Voodoo in Haiti. These traditions, even including Eshu as the divine trickster, date back to before 1000 BCE, before the collapse of the Bronze Age, and they had a continuous tradition. Over time, the religious practices and the beliefs of the Yoruba people evolved and developed, incorporating influences from various sources, including other indigenous African traditions. While the transatlantic slave trade and forced migration of Africans to the Americas, Yoruba religious traditions and the worships of Orishas spread to various parts of the African diaspora, particularly Cuba, Brazil, and Haiti, and also Trinidad and Tobago and other Caribbean and Latin American countries.
One of the main practices that evolved from this trade is voodoo. The origins of voodoo, also known as voodoo in Africa, can be traced back for thousands of years. It emerged as a syncretic religion that developed through the blending of various indigenous African beliefs, with influences of Christianity and other external factors. Voodoo has its roots in Western Africa, particularly in the regions that are now present-day Benin, Togo, and Nigeria. The voodoo doll commonly refers to an effigy that is typically used for the insertion of pins. Such practices are found in various forms of magical traditions of the ancient Africans. While the specific age of voodoo as we know it today cannot be pinpointed, its historical and cultural roots extend deep into the ancient African traditions of magic that preceded it. Voodoo represents the resilient and vibrant spiritual tradition that embodies the ancestral wisdom and cultural heritage of African peoples. The spread of Islam across Africa was a gradual and complex process that occurred over several centuries. Islam was introduced to the African continent through various means of including trade networks, migration, and missionary activities, as well as warfare and forced conversion. The spread of Islam has had a profound impact on the socio-cultural, political, and religious landscape of all of Africa. The initial contact between Islam and Africa can be traced back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad in the 7th century. Muslim traders from the Arabian Peninsula established trade routes that connected the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean with the East African coast. One of the earliest regions to embrace Islam was North Africa. Muslim armies from Arabia, known as the Arab Conquest, expanded into Egypt and Maghreb, bringing Islam with them. The Umayyad Caliphate established control over North Africa, leading the conversion of local Berber tribes and the formation of Islamic states such as the Fatimid Caliphate. Muslim merchants such as the Berbers and later the Saharan Arabs established commercial networks that spanned from North Africa to the regions of present-day Mali. Islam gradually gained influence among the ruling elites and urban centers, resulting in the emergence of powerful Islamic states such as the Mali Empire and the Songhai Empire. Timbuktu became a cultural mecca of the world. The Swahili city-states became centers of Islamic culture and commerce, blending African and Arab influences. Islam spread further inland through intermarriage, trade, and the establishment of the Islamic educational centers. Islam became a vehicle for cultural exchange, bringing new architectural styles, educational institutions, trade networks. This led to the development of diverse Islamic movements, such as the Sufi Brotherhoods, which incorporated local customs and beliefs into their own spiritual practices. Before Islam spread all over the African continent, Christianity had its rise and reign of supreme. The Nag Hammadi Christians, also known as the Nag Hammadi Library or the Gnostic Gospels, refer to a collection of ancient texts discovered in 1945 near the ancient town of Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt. These texts are significant for shedding a light on a branch of early Christianity known as Gnosticism. In December of 1945, a group of local farmers discovered a large jar containing a collection of ancient manuscripts buried in the desert near Nag Hammadi. These texts were written in Coptic, an Egyptian language that used the Greek alphabet. The manuscripts were found to contain a diverse range of religious and philosophical texts, including Gnostic Christian writings, previously unknown or lost to history. Gnostic teachings emphasize the acquisition of gnosis or spiritual knowledge 
as the means to achieve salvation and liberation from the material world. The Gnostics of Egypt believed that the material world was imperfect and the domain of a lesser deity known as the Demiurge. They saw themselves as spiritual beings trapped within physical bodies, seeking to reunite the divine realm. The Nag Hammadi Library consisted of 52 texts, including various Gnostic Gospels, apocryphal works, and philosophical treatises, such as the Gospel of Thomas, a collection of sayings attributed to Jesus that may be the oldest known source of the words of Jesus on the planet, and it's found in Egypt. Overall, the Nag Hammadi Christians, through their writings, give a glimpse into the diverse religious landscape of early Christianity before Islam and contribute to our understanding of the rich tapestry of religious thought in the ancient world. The Ethiopians who claim to have the Ark of the Covenant are members of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. According to the religious tradition, the Ark of the Covenant, a sacred chest to hold the tablets of the Ten Commandments given to Moses by God, was brought to Ethiopia and has been preserved in the country for centuries. The belief is that the Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia. The legend tells of its journey from Jerusalem to Ethiopia during the time of King Solomon. According to the Ethiopian tradition, the Queen of Sheba, also known as Makeda, visited King Solomon in Jerusalem and returned to Ethiopia bearing a son, Menelik. It is believed that Menelik brought the Ark of the Covenant with him, hiding it in Ethiopia where it has since been remained. The Ark of the Covenant, known as the Tabot in Ethiopian Christianity, is considered the holiest of relics by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. The Ethiopian Church maintains a strong connection to the Ark of the Covenant and its presence is central to their religious practices and beliefs. Africa is a diverse continent with a wide range of religious beliefs and practices. The religious landscape of Africa is complex, with a blend of indigenous African religions, Islam, Christianity, and other religions. Indigenous African religions encompass a diverse range of traditional beliefs and practices. These religions often emphasize the worship of ancestors. It is estimated to be around 10 to 20 percent of the African population. Islam, however, holds approximately 40 to 50 percent of all of Africans. Christianity, estimated to be 30 to 40 percent of Africa. In addition, there are several minority religion slivers in Africa. These include Judaism, Hinduism, Sikhism, the Baha'i faith, and other various syncretic religions that blend elements of indigenous beliefs with other religious traditions. The percentage of these people hold about 5% of the whole category. And there you have it, the incredible journey of humanity, tracing our roots back to the cradle of civilization, Africa. From the momentous discoveries of Lucy, the ancient fossil skeleton that unveiled our earliest human ancestors, to the grand civilizations of Egypt that left an indelible mark on the entire world, Africa has been the forefront of our collective story. Not only did Africa give birth to Homo sapiens, but it also nurtured the diverse tapestry of religions that have shaped our spiritual landscapes. From the enchanting Yoruba traditions with the primordial divinities to the mystical practices of the Nubian lion-headed goddess, influencing the powerful deities of Isis and Sekhmet, Africa's religious heritage is a testament to its rich cultural fabric. Thank you for joining us on this captivating exploration. From the awe-inspiring pyramids to the enigmatic sphinx, the Egyptians left a legacy 
that still reverberates through time. Their wisdom and knowledge permeated the world, influencing art, architecture, and even the development of early science. So as we reflect on the ancient wonders and the enduring legacy of Africa, let us remember that our own story, our own very existence, is intertwined with its remarkable continent. Africa is the birthplace of humanity and the wellspring of inspiration. Sumerian stories have had significant influence on various aspects of ancient Near Eastern literature, including the Hebrew Bible, also called the Torah, and the Tanakh. It's important to note that the Bible is a collection of texts written by different authors over a long period of time, and its composition was influenced by various cultural and literary traditions, including those of the Sumerians. Sumerians were an ancient civilization that flourished in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, around 4000 to 2000 BCE. They left behind a rich literary tradition, including mythological and epic texts. Some of the Sumerian stories and motifs that influenced the Bible, the Sumerian creation myth, known as the Enuma Elish, bears similarities to the creation account found in the book of Genesis. Both narratives involve the establishment of order from chaos and the separation of the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1-2 states that the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Notice how the waters are plural. In the Enuma Elish, it is two waters known as Apsu and Tiamat. The Hebrew for deep is Tehom. The word for Tiamat is cognate for deep. So not only is there a connection between the way the story is written off the rip, but we also have cognates in the language. The two waters being Apsu and Tiamat, the primeval waters, just as the surface of the deep hovering over the waters. The Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh contains a flood narrative that predates the biblical account of Noah's flood by thousands of years. The similarities between the two stories, such as the construction of an ark, the preservation of animals, and sending out a dove to find land, suggests that the biblical flood story may have drawn inspiration from the Sumerian tradition. Sumerians developed one of the earliest known legal codes, known as the Code of Ur-Namu. This influenced subsequent legal codes of the ancient Near East, including the biblical laws found in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Similarities in themes and regulations, such as the concept of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the exact same phrase is found in Sumerian law codes. Now, this is a very specific thing to say, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which shows up in the Code of Hammurabi, shows up in Leviticus when Yahweh tells Moses, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. These regulations regarding property and slavery suggest a shared legal heritage. The biblical book of Proverbs bears similarities to Sumerian wisdom literature, such as the instructions of Shurupak, just like the instructions of Amun Ope, which I'll get to later. Both of these texts offer moral and practical advice on various aspects of life. Hebrew authors and editors transformed and adapted these Sumerian stories 
to fit the religious and cultural context. The influence of the Sumerian literature is evident in the themes, motifs, and narrative structures found in the Hebrew Bible. This influence is a part of a broader cultural exchange and continuity in the ancient Near East. Ugaritic stories, specifically those discovered in ancient city of Ugarit, modern-day Syria, have also had an impact on the development of biblical literature. Ugarit was a flourishing city-state during the Late Bronze Age, from 1400 to 1200 BCE, and its texts, written in cuneiform script, provide valuable insights into the religious and cultural milieu of the ancient Near East. The Ugaritic texts contain myths, epic poems, and ritual texts that have parallels and influences on certain aspects of the Hebrew Bible. The Baal Cycle, most famous Ugaritic text, a collection of mythological texts about the Canaanite god Baal. The Baal Cycle shares similarities with biblical narratives, particularly in the portrayal of a divine conflict between a storm god and the forces of chaos. These parallels can be seen in passages of the Psalms that describe Yahweh's victory over chaos and the sea and descriptions of Yahweh's control over the elements. Baal defeats the Leviathan, just as Yahweh defeats the Leviathan in Psalms. Ugaritic texts depict a divine assembly or a council of gods with El as the head deity. This assembly plays a role in divine decision-making and governance. Similar concepts are found in the Hebrew Bible, where Yahweh provides over a heavenly council, as seen in passages like Psalm 82 and Job 1.6. Psalm 82 saying, El presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods, the Elohim. But also Job 1.6 states, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before El, and Satan came also among them. Both of these texts are not even hiding the fact that there are lesser gods below the high god, who is El. Ritual and liturgical texts contain descriptions of religious rituals and liturgies performed in honor of various Ugaritic deities. These texts offer insights into the religious practices and beliefs of the ancient Near East. Some scholars suggest the elements of the Ugaritic rituals may have influenced certain aspects of Israelite worship, such as the structure and content of Psalms and other poetic texts. The Ugaritic language, closely related to Hebrew, provides linguistic and lexical parallels that shed light on certain biblical terms and expressions. The study of Ugaritic has helped scholars better understand and interpret Hebrew words and phrases found in the Bible. Egyptian stories and cultural influence are evident in various aspects of the Hebrew Bible. Egypt, a powerful and influential civilization in the Near East, had significant impact on the development of Israelite culture and religious beliefs. The story of the Exodus, which describes the liberation of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, is one of the central narratives in the Bible. The biblical account shares the same thematic elements and motifs with the Egyptian literature, such as the idea of the divine deliverer and confrontation between a powerful ruler and figure chosen by God. While the Exodus story primarily reflects Israelite perspectives, it is likely that the historical experience of the Hyksos leaving Egypt may have influenced this narrative. Some Judeo-Christian scholars try to link these as the same event. However, this is not likely considering the dates are separated by several centuries. Within the Hyksos period, we don't see a Moses or a Joshua or Aaron. And the Exodus story is likely a legend because even the Pharaoh is not named. If this was a real story, the Pharaoh should just be named and scholars would be able to point to these events because we have so much data on every single Pharaoh. We'd be able to know which of these Pharaohs lines up with this story. The assumption that this was Pharaoh Ramses is not likely due to the fact that Ramses conquers Canaan and in the text of the biblical story, he fails to catch up to the Israelites. 
which is the opposite of what happens with Ramses. In fact, after Ramses, the land of Canaan was under Egyptian occupation for another 200 years, which would not make any sense if Moses and the Israelites were setting up the covenant during this time under Egyptian occupation. The biblical book of Proverbs contains wisdom sayings and teachings that are similar to those found in ancient Egyptian wisdom literature, such as the instructions of Amen Ope. In fact, some of the manuscripts from the Septuagint actually still have Amen Ope in the text. Both traditions emphasize ethical conduct, practical advice for daily life, and the pursuit of wisdom. Egyptian religious symbolism and imagery can be found in certain biblical texts. For example, in the book of Ezekiel, the prophets use symbols reminiscent of Egyptian religious motifs to convey his message. The portrayal of Pharaoh as a powerful ruler and the imagery associated with the Egyptian gods and goddesses also demonstrate the cultural influence of Egypt. Here on the stone of Hezekiah, you can see an Egyptian Ankh present. The use of hymnic and liturgical elements in the Hebrew Bible shows similarities to Egyptian religious practices. The Psalms contain hymns of praise and worship that share structural and thematic resemblances to ancient Egyptian hymns and prayers. Some of the legal concepts in the Hebrew Bible bear similarities to Egyptian legal traditions just as the Sumerian and Babylonian texts do. The Canaanites arguably have the most influence on the Hebrew Bible. The Canaanite pantheon of gods was a diverse and complex system of deities worshipped by the ancient Canaanites, land that would be present-day Israel right now, who inhabited the region corresponding to present-day Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and parts of Jordan and Syria. Here are some key gods and goddesses from the Canaanite pantheon. Number one, El. The same name as the God of the Hebrew Bible. El is the chief deity in the Canaanite pantheon and was associated with authority, kingship, and wisdom. He's often depicted as an aged and bearded figure. El presided over a divine council and held a central position in the Canaanite religious beliefs. His son was Bel. Baal was one of the most prominent gods in Canaanite pantheon. He was associated with the storms, fertility, and agricultural abundance. Baal was depicted as a powerful warrior, wielding a lightning bolt, symbolizing his control over the forces of nature. El had a wife named Asherah, the consort of El, considered the mother goddess in Canaanite religion, the queen of heaven. She represented fertility, motherhood, and nurturing. Asherah was often depicted as the divine mother figure, sometimes portrayed alongside a sacred tree or a pole representing her presence. Anat was a fierce and warlike goddess associated with battle, violence, protection, and wisdom. Like Athena, Anat was depicted as a warrior goddess, often shown with a bow, a spear, or a shield. Astarte, also known as Ashtaroth, was the goddess associated with love, beauty, and sexuality. She was considered the patron of fertility, both in terms of human production and agricultural abundance. Astarte was depicted as a sensual goddess adorned with jewelry and symbols of fertility. Dagon, associated with agriculture, grain, fertility. He was often depicted as a fish-like deity, symbolizing abundance with fertility linked to water and agricultural prosperity. Last, but certainly not least, Yahweh, often referred to as Yahu, the deity associated with a specific region or tribe, rather than being a central figure in the broader Canaanite pantheon. The understanding of Yahweh's role in the Canaanite religion is complex and subject to ongoing scholarly debate. He was a tribal deity. He's also one of the sons of El. There are some who suggest that Yahweh and Baal are interchangeable depending on the location. 
both being the son of El and both being extremely important as princes of the pantheon. This may play into the later tradition of the Hebrew Bible, where the priest of Yahweh are battling with the priest of Baal, such as the story of Elijah and Jezebel. Another perspective suggests that Yahweh emerged through a process of syncretism, where in the worship of Yahweh, merged with elements of Canaanite religious beliefs and practices. This view posits that Yahweh began as a local deity, later absorbed attributes and roles from other Canaanite gods such as El and Baal. Canaanite stories have significant impact on the Hebrew Bible, given the close historical and cultural connections between the Israelites and Canaanites. The Canaanites were the indigenous inhabitants of the land of Canaan, which encompasses modern-day Israel. Canaanite mythology and religious beliefs, cultic practices such as the sacrifices, offerings, and temple worship. Biblical texts frequently mention Israelite interactions with Canaanite religious practices, often presenting them negatively that Israelites should avoid them. The Canaanite practices and the Israelites' response to them are discussed in the context of idolatry and the centralization of worship in Jerusalem. The absorption of the Canaanite El into the Yahweh religion is a complex process that took place over an extended period of time. El, the chief deity in the pantheon, associated with the authority, kingship, and divine counsel, becomes one and the same with his own son, Yahweh. And throughout the Hebrew Bible, Yahweh and El, or El Elyon, which means God Most High, are interchangeable and mean the same thing at some points. The biblical texts even refer to Yahweh as El Elyon, emphasizing his identification with the Supreme Deity. This suggests that the early Israelites may have seen Yahweh as a manifestation or an aspect of El. As the Israelites settled in Canaan, they likely interacted and assimilated elements of Canaanite culture and religious practices. The worship of El may have influenced the evolving understanding of Yahweh, with El's attributes and characteristics merging with those ascribed to Yahweh. The process of syncretism, where indeed he's from different religious traditions, are combined or identified with each other, likely played a role. Over time, the Israelites established their religious identity there may have been a merging of El and Yahweh, resulting in the understanding of Yahweh as the primary deity, supreme authority. El's association with the divine council, consisting of subordinate deities, can be seen in both Canaanite and early Israelite traditions. As the Israelite religion developed, the concept of divine council was retained but with Yahweh as the head of the council. The Phoenician stories and cultural influences left their mark on certain aspects of the Hebrew Bible. The Phoenicians, which are the purple people called by the Greeks, are an ancient seafaring people who inhabited the coastal region of modern-day Lebanon had significant interactions with the Israelites, leading to the cultural exchanges and influences. With direct evidence of Phoenician stories in the Bible, the Neoplatonist writer Porphyry stating that a priest named Sanko Neathan of Beirut wrote the truest history because he obtained the records from Hierambolus, priest of Yewo, that Sanko Neathan dedicated his history to Abibel, king of Beirut, and it was approved by the king and other investigators, the date of this writing being around 1200 BCE. In this text, El, who is also called Kronos, sacrifices his only begotten son, Yehud, as an offering to his father in heaven, and then circumcises himself and decreed from that day forward that all of his offspring must also circumcise themselves in honor of Aranos. And El was deified as the star Saturn, Saturday being the same day as the Sabbath. This story is clearly borrowed by the Hebrew scribes for the book of Genesis, when Abraham 
who was offering his only begotten son, Isaac, as an offering to El. But in this case, an angel stops him. However, like in the Phoenician myth, it is Abraham who is the first patriarch to circumcise himself and make this a custom among the Israelites for all males. The Israelites had a tendency to synthesize elements from neighboring cultures, and the Phoenicians played a role in this process. The worship of Canaanite deities, including Baal and Asherah, found its way into Israelite religious practices. As described in the Hebrew Bible, these influences can be seen in the biblical narratives of Israelite idolatry and their struggle to remain faithful to only Yahweh. Phoenician expertise in craftsmanship and maritime trade likely influenced the construction of the first temple in Jerusalem, known as the Solomon Temple. Phoenician artisans and materials were involved in the construction, and some architectural and artistic elements may have been influenced by Phoenician styles. The Hebrew Bible contains references to Phoenician cities, such as Tyre and Sidon, and their cultural practices. For example, the story of King Hiram of Tyre collaborating with King Solomon in the building of the temple highlights the close relationship between the Israelites and Phoenicians. The first temple period in ancient Israel refers to the time when the first temple, also known as Solomon's temple, stood in Jerusalem. This period spans between approximately 10th century BCE until its destruction by the Babylonians in 586 BCE. Understanding the religious landscape during this period is complex, and scholarly views vary regarding the extent of polytheistic practices present during this time. The practice of monotheism seems to be only after the Israelites returned back from Babylon in the 5th century. Scholars suggest that polytheistic elements persisted during this period. They argue that while Yahweh may have been regarded as the primary deity, other gods and goddesses were still acknowledged and worshipped alongside Yahweh. The archaeological evidence, including inscriptions and artifacts found in Jerusalem, indicate the presence of symbols associated with other deities during this time. The Elephantine Jews were a Jewish community that resided in the ancient city of Elephantine, located on an island in the Nile River in Egypt. They lived during the 5th century BCE and left behind a corpus of documents known as the Elephantine Papyri, which provides insights into the religious beliefs and practices of the time. Based on the Elephantine Papyri, it appears that the religion of the Elephantine Jews was a blend of Yahweh worship and syncretic elements influenced by the local religious environment. While they acknowledged Yahweh as the primary deity, they also incorporated certain practices from both Egyptian and Canaanite religious traditions. These Elephantine Jews built and maintained a temple dedicated to Yahweh on the island. They considered Yahweh as the supreme deity and sought his guidance and protection. However, alongside the worship of Yahweh was also other gods and goddesses like Asherah. One of the prominent deities mentioned in the Elephantine papyri is Yaho, often identified as a synchronistic form of Yahweh fused with Egyptian gods like Amon. Additionally, Egyptian gods, particularly Kunum, Satis, and Anuket were worshiped in this location. These deities were believed to have protective powers and were invoked for various purposes, such as fertility, health, and general well-being. This elephantine papyrus indicates a level of polytheism and syncretism, as well as cultural assimilation, where elements of different religious traditions coexisted. Overall, the elephantine Jews maintain a distinctive religious identity centered around Yahweh, but also incorporated beliefs and practices from their local environment. Their religion demonstrates the complex nature of religious syncretism 
and the adaption of religious traditions in a multicultural text. The exact time frame for the final compilation of the Torah, or the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, into its current monotheistic form, is a subject of scholarly debate. Most scholars agree that these texts were written during post-Babylonian exile. As the Israelites returned to their land, religious leaders and scribes likely engaged in the process of collecting, editing, and shaping various religious texts. There is no mention of the Torah by any Greek, Egyptian, Persian, or Syrian sources before the 5th century BCE. Moses and Noah and Abraham are not mentioned in any text before the 5th century BCE. Only the kings like David and Omri show up in some stelis. But the stories of the flood, the exodus, and the 12 tribes of Israel show up in popular culture only after Alexander the Great conquers Persia in the 4th century BCE. There are some scholars who now suggest that the five books of Moses were compiled in Alexandria during the Ptolemaic period. Ancient historians like Herodotus, Xenophon, and Thucydides don't even mention Israel in their writings. This suggests that Israel was not a powerful kingdom, just a small city-state. It's possible that these texts existed as independent scrolls during these periods, but they were not known to most of the world outside the Levant until the 4th century BCE. This is the end of our mythological journey through the ancient realms of Sumer, Ugarit, Egypt, Canaan, and beyond. As we've explored this rich tapestry of these captivating civilizations, it became clear that their stories, beliefs, and cultural influences have left an indelible mark on the biblical world. From the epic tales of the Gilgamesh and Sumer to the poetic sagas of Baal and Ugarit, from the mystical hymns of the Egyptian gods to the intricate pantheon of the Canaanite deities, we find a treasure trove of inspiration that seeped into the very fabric of the Hebrew Bible. But the skilled weavers, the biblical authors and editors didn't simply copy and paste from the neighboring mythologies. Oh no, they expertly blended, transformed, and repurposed these ancient narratives weaving them into a new tapestry of faith, history, and moral guidance. Let me give you one more example before I go. The story of Esther and Mordecai. Esther and Mordecai look a lot like Ishtar and Marduk. The story of Esther and Mordecai has obvious parallels to the story of Ishtar descending into the underworld to save Tammuz from his death. In the story of Ishtar and Tammuz, Tammuz is taken down to the underworld, the lover of Ishtar. And then Ishtar goes and descends down, and as she goes down from every layer of hell, she has to take off a layer of clothing until she gets to the bottom layer, where she has to face off with the queen of the underworld, where she stays down there for three days until her galley eunuchs are sent down from heaven to bring her back to life, where she is able to take Tammuz and raise him out of hell, and thus springtime ensues. In the story of Esther in the Bible, there's a lot of similarities and parallels. Instead of Tammuz, it's Mordecai. Now, why would they use Marduk's name instead of Tammuz's name? Well, it turns out that Marduk and Tammuz are actually synchronized in many texts. The god Bel is actually a synchronization of Marduk and Demutzi, or Tammuz. So it actually does make sense for Mordecai to be the name of the Hebrew person who is saved by Esther. In this text, Mordecai is taken into a dungeon by Haman, and then Esther has to go into the court of the king of Persia, Xerxes, and she has to plead for the safety of Mordecai which she is successful when her eunuch priest, just like the Gali eunuchs, her eunuchs actually come to her aid, and she also has to take off layers of clothing as well. 
It is a clear mimesis of the story of the Sumerians. I am of the opinion that these writers did, did, did this with no ill intent, and they were just trying to pass down sacred stories that everyone knew. The Sumerian flood myth finds its counterpart in the story of Noah and the Ark. The Canaanite storm god Baal's conflict with the sea god Yam echoes the biblical portrayal of Yahweh's triumph over chaos, and the grandeur of Egyptian cosmology lends its majesty to the descriptions of heaven and earth in Genesis. Yes, this interplay between mythologies goes beyond mere literary borrowings. It reveals the interconnectedness of ancient civilizations. The vibrant exchange of ideas and the eternal quest for humanity to understand the mysteries of the world and our place in it. Esther, just like Ishtar, is a story that explains the death of the winter and the resurrection of the spring. Both Ishtar and Esther have their festivals at the same time of the year. Let us marvel at the profound influence of these ancient mythologies on the biblical world. Let us recognize that shared motifs, cultural cross-pollination, and the universal truths that emerge from these diverse narratives. In Sumerian mythology, the underworld, known as Kur, was ruled by the goddess Ereshkigal. The Babylonians also had a similar concept of the underworld, which they called Irkala. According to Sumerian mythology, the underworld was a dark and gloomy place where the souls of the dead went after they passed away. The journey to the underworld was perilous and the souls had to navigate through the seven gates, each guarded by a different deity. The seven deities that guard each of the seven gates in the underworld. Neti, Gedu, Enugi, Ninkasi, Ninima, and Bilulu, and Dumutsi, who shared the time with his sister, Geshtinana. Once in the underworld, the souls were judged by Ereshkikal and her consort, Nergal. The souls were then assigned to different levels of the underworld based on their deeds in life. The worst offenders were sent to the lowest level where they were subjugated to eternal torment. The Babylonians in their more complex version divided it into several layers, each again with its own ruler. The souls of the dead had to pass through each level, facing different challenges and obstacles along the way. These ideas are reflected in Greek mythology as well as Egyptian. In the Orphic text, souls of the dead pass through Hades and be judged by Persephone and Pluto. One of the most famous stories from Babylonian mythology is the tale of Ishtar's descent into the underworld. Ishtar was the goddess of love and fertility, and she decided to visit the underworld to rescue her lover, Dumuzi. However, she was unable to pass through the gates of the underworld and was forced to remove her clothing and jewelry as a payment to the gatekeepers. Luckily, she was revived and saved by the Gali of Heaven, who came down and brought her back to life. The purpose of each of the seven gates in the underworld is to prevent the dead from escaping and to ensure that they are judged fairly before being allowed to enter the afterlife. Each gate 
is guarded by a different deity, and each deity has a specific role in the judgment process. The first gate guarded by Neti, who checks the name of the deceased against a list of those who are allowed to enter. The second gate guarded by Gedu, who weighs the heart of the deceased against a feather to determine if they have lived a good life. This is reflected in the Egyptian myth of Sobek, who also weighs the heart against a feather. And if the heart is more heavy than the feather, the soul is consumed because they are not fit to go further into the afterlife. The third gate, guarded by the goddess Lahmu, who judges the deceased based on their deeds in life. The fourth gate is guarded by the god Shala, who determines if the deceased has been faithful to their spouse. The fifth gate is guarded by the goddess Ninlil, who judges the deceased based on their knowledge and wisdom. And the sixth gate, guarded by Nergal, who determines if the deceased has been a good ruler or leader. The seventh and final gate is guarded by the goddess Oreshkikal, who judges the deceased based on their overall worthiness to enter after the afterlife. The Babylonian Seven Gates, slightly different than the Sumerian. Ereshkikal, the prominent figure in Sumerian and Babylonian mythology, is the goddess of the underworld. She is the sister of the god of the sky, Anu, and the god of earth, Enlil. She is depicted as fearsome and powerful goddess, ruling over the dead and the spirits of the underworld. Ereshkigal held a senior status among the underworld deities, ruling over the category of the so-called Transtiridian snake gods. In 1903, two Minoan snake goddess figurines were excavated in the Minoan Palace of Knossos in the Greek island of Crete. The combination of elaborate clothes that leave the breasts completely bare and snake wrangling remains a popular icon for Minoan art and religion. Now also generally referred to as a snake goddess. It is quite possible that this goddess could be connected to Ereshkigal Ereshkigal is often compared to other goddesses of death in the underworld, such as the Greek goddess Persephone and the Egyptian Isis. These goddesses are often depicted as powerful and fearsome figures, ruling over the dead and the spirits of the underworld. One of the most interesting aspects of Ereshkigal's mythology is her relationship with the god of fertility and vegetation, Dumuzi. According to some legends, Demuzi was her lover, but he was also a symbol of life and fertility, like her. This relationship between life and death is a common theme in many mythologies and is often used to explore the cyclical nature of existence. Ningashida is a god in Sumerian mythology known as the god of the underworld and fertility. He was often depicted as a serpent or a dragon and was associated with rebirth and regeneration. Ningashida has been compared to other serpent deities, such as the Greek god Asclepius and the Egyptian god Wajit. Ningashida's titles connect him to plants and agriculture, the death of vegetation, was associated with his annual travel to the underworld. He seems to be associated with an ancient form of the Dionysian Pluto that was worshipped by the Minoans, as the tree in his name might be vine, according to some Assyriologists, including Wilfred Lambert. And an association between him and wine is well attested. For example, 
one text mentions him alongside the beer goddess, Ninkasi, while one of his titles, Lord of the Innkeepers. Just as Dionysus and Osiris ruled the underworld after they died resurrect. Like his father, Ninatsu, he was associated with serpents and snakes, including the mythical Mushusu, Ushamgal, and Bashmu, and in one case, Nira. He was also an underworld god, and this role was known as the chair bearer, the chamberlain of the underworld, like Osiris. Franz Wiggerman, on the basis of these similarities, considers him and his father to be members of the group Transtigridian Snake Gods, who, according to him, shared a connection with the underworld, justice, vegetation, and snakes. The cyclical nature of death and rebirth. Ninasina is a goddess in Sumerian mythology, known as the goddess of healing and medicine. She was also associated with fertility and childbirth. She's often compared to the Greek goddess Hygieia, who is also associated with healing and medicine. Both of these goddesses are often depicted holding a serpent, which is a symbol of healing in ancient times. Additionally, Ninasina was often associated with the goddess Ishtar, who was also a prominent figure in Babylonian mythology. While Ishtar associated with love and war, Ninasina was primarily associated with healing and alchemy. Liliki, the Phantom Maiden, making a home in the trunk of the World Tree, may represent usurpation, control of the earth. The word translates to owl or death bird goddess figure, or perhaps she is even a doppelganger of the figure of Inanna, Inanna's dark self, because there is the description of Liliki as a joyful, laughing, smiling maiden or seductress, having functions of sexuality and death. Liliki seemingly usurping control of the earthly realm from Inanna, making her home in the Hulupu tree trunk world tree, a snake living in the roots of the tree likely represents the usurpation of the control of the underworld and immortality. The snake is said to be immune from incantations, so it is powerful against otherworldly weapons. When Inanna finds these monstrous serpents in her world tree, she cries out to Gilgamesh to help get rid of them. The mythic figures, Lilitu and Lilu, are demons associated with wild places and other boundaries. Like Lamashtu, they attack pregnant women and babies. This is directly referenced in the book of Isaiah 34, 14. And desert creatures will meet with hyenas and satyrs will call out to each other. There also Lilith shall repose and find for themselves a resting place. In some Jewish folklore, such as the satirical alphabet of Sirach, Lilith appears as Adam's first wife, who was created at the same time from the same clay as Adam. Lamashtu is a female demon in Mesopotamian mythology, known for her malevolent nature and association with childbirth and infant mortality. She is often depicted with the lion's head donkey teeth, and bird feet. She is often compared to Lilith in Jewish mythology, or Medea, as well as the Greek Gorgons. Lamashtu's unique characteristics and role in Mesopotamian culture make her a distinct figure in mythology. She bore seven names, was described as seven witches' incantations. Her evil deeds included, but not limited to, slaying children, unborns, causing harm to mothers and expectant mothers, eating men and drinking their blood, disturbing sleep, bringing nightmares, and the use of wild plants to make potions, bringing disease and sickness and death. 
In Greek mythology, Medea is often associated with the death of her own children. This is because she killed them in revenge against her husband Jason, who betrayed her. Medea's actions are seen as a symbol of the destructive power of revenge and the consequences of letting anger and hatred consume us. Medea is also the daughter of a god and is a symbol of medicine, witchcraft, and alchemy. Like Lamashtu, she is often depicted as holding serpents and even pulled by a pair of dragons in her chariot. Ancient serpents and dragons are often depicted as demons in various ancient myths and legends. In Mesopotamian mythology, the dragon Tiamat was the symbol of chaos and destruction. While in Greek mythology, the serpent Python was a symbol of evil and darkness and was used by Apollo to create the Oracle of Delphi. In Chinese mythology, the dragon was often associated with the underworld and was considered a powerful and dangerous creature. Dragons and serpents are believed to hold supernatural powers and were often associated with magic and mysticism. In Canaanite mythology, Baal is a god who is said to have conquered the Leviathan, a sea monster or dragon. This story is often seen as a symbol of Baal's power over chaos and the forces of nature. The story of Baal and the Leviathan has parallels in other ancient myths, such as the story of Marduk and Tiamat in Babylonian mythology. The ancient Leviathan is a sea monster mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, defeated by Yahweh in the Book of Psalms. It is often described as a giant serpent or dragon-like creature, multiple heads and immense strength. In Jewish mythology, the Leviathan is seen as a symbol of chaos and destruction. While in Christian tradition, it is sometimes associated with Satan or the Antichrist. The Leviathan has been referenced in other cultures, such as Mesopotamian mythology, where it is seen as a symbol of primordial chaos that existed before the creation of the world. Tiamat is the primordial goddess of the Salt Sea in Babylonian mythology. She is often depicted as a dragon or serpent, associated with chaos and creation. According to the Numa Elish, Tiamat was defeated by the god Marduk, who split her body in two to create the heavens and earth. Tiamat's story has been interpreted in many ways, with some seeing her as a symbol of the natural world, and others as a representation of the dangers of chaos and disorder. In Greek mythology, Ophion is a primordial serpent or dragon who ruled the world with his consort, Euronome, before being overthrown by Zeus and the Olympian gods. He is sometimes associated with the creation of the world and the cosmos. The Orphic egg is a symbol of creation in Orphic text. It is said to have contained the universe and was split open by the god Thanes or in some versions, the serpent Ophion coils around the egg to split it open, who emerges Phanes from the light as the first being or light bringer. The egg is often depicted as being surrounded by a serpent, representing the cycle of life and death. Zeus and Typhon battle in the beginning of the world. Typhon was the monstrous giant who challenged the rule of the gods and Zeus fought him in this great battle. Zeus ultimately defeats Typhon and banishes him to Tartarus, where he is chained down until the end of the world. In ancient Canaanite text, a demon king named Habayu, who is depicted as Lord of Horns in Tal, defeats El after a drinking party that El throws for the gods. El was seated in his drinking party. El drank wine until he was full, new wine until he was drunk. 
El went into his house, he reached his court. Through Kimona and Shunema held him along. Then Hebayu confronted him, lord of horns and tail. He smeared him with piss and crap. El collapsed like a corpse. El went down into the underworld. The next few lines of the tablet are destroyed, but he seems to be revived by Anat and Astarte. And so you have an evil demon king who kills El, the king of the gods, and then gets away with it and is never destroyed by El in any more texts that we know of. This shows us that the image of the goat-like demons goes back as far as human memory serves. Satyrs and goat demons are often depicted in ancient Greek and Roman mythology as creatures with the upper body of a human and the lower body of a goat and horns. They were often associated with fertility, wine, and revelry. And in some myths, they're also known for their mischievous and lustful behavior. Angramanu is a figure in Zoroastrianism, often referred to as the destructive spirit or evil spirit. He is often compared to the devil or Satan. The word devil, which comes from the Greek diablos, which means accuser, becomes associated with goat-like appearance of satyrs, later on ultimately because of Christian mythology. The word demon comes from the Greek daemon, which originally referred to as any divine spiritual being. It later becomes associated with malevolent or mischievous demons, an opposite force of the angels. The devas and asuras are figures in mythology, in Vedic and Zoroastrian theology. In Zoroastrianism, the deva are evil, while in Hinduism, the devas are good, and the asuras, which are a group of powerful beings depicted as the enemies of gods in Hinduism, are actually the good gods in Zoroastrianism. This reflects the political divide between India and Persia. In Greek text, these are represented by the Olympians and Titans. The Olympians are a younger generation of gods led by Zeus, while the Titans were the older generation led by Kronos. The two groups were in conflict for control of the universe, while the Olympians ultimately emerging victorious. The word angel comes from the Greek angelos, which means messenger. In these terms, demons and angels did not have a dichotomy until the time of Christianity in the first century. However, the dichotomy comes straight from the Asuras and Devas, or Olympians and Titans. So there is a direct influence on this dichotomy. In Hinduism, Kali is the goddess associated with destruction and transformation. She is often depicted with multiple arms and a fierce expression, holding serpents, and is considered a powerful force for change and renewal. In some traditions, Kali is associated with death and the underworld. The Bhagavad Purana states that the very day that Krishna left the earth is when Kali promoted all kinds of irreligious activities into the world. All of this stems from the Sumerian dichotomy of gods and monsters. Here is a chart from Mesopotamian Protective Spirits Ritual Text by F. A. M. Wiggerman. As you can see, the monsters are composed while the gods are anthropomorphic. The monsters are supernatural freaks while the gods are representative of normal order. The monsters represents the phenomenon of nature while the gods represent the whole to which the phenomenon belongs. Monsters intervene in human affairs. Gods, on the other hand, afford background and stability. Monsters are unpredictable associates, while gods are the masters. 
Monsters rebel, while gods are the rightful rulers. Monsters are the defeated enemies, gods are the victors. And so forth. According to Wiggerman, the emergence of these ideas was from an attempt by the ancients to describe phenomenon happening in nature that is undescribable, that often cannot be explained unless there was some evil force at work. For example, hurricanes and floods coming from malevolent gods, rather than rain coming from good gods helping to grow crops, or a tsunami coming from the lake from a destructive force. Wiggerman shows the many examples of these so-called monsters, which seem to look very similar to the Greek daemons. Here is a depiction of what would look like kentars and satyrs and other horned deities and serpent legs. Being a monster or a daemon did not necessarily mean they were evil. For example, Pan is the Greek god of nature, wild, shepherds, and flocks. He is often depicted as half man, half goat creature, the horns and a tail. Pan is also associated with music and is said to have invented the pan flute. He is often depicted as mischievous and playful and also has a darker side as the god of fear and panic. Pan later becomes the image of the devil in later Christian times, most likely because the devil represents all that is opposed to Christianity. Since paganism is the ultimate opposition to Christianity, Pan becomes the symbol of the devil as a symbol of paganism. But the duality of good versus evil is much more complex than just Christian versus pagan. In the oldest Pelasgian creation myth, the serpent of chaos, Ophion, attacks Uranome, and she bruises his head with her heel, and then banishes him to the dark underworld where he is chained down. This myth is reflected in the tempting of Eve by the serpent, or Lilith in Genesis. Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Direct reference from the Pelasgian creation myth. Not only is this duad reflected in the Vedic myth of Mitra and Varuna, but also with the Orphic egg in the Serpent of Chaos, from which Phanes burst forth as the Lightbringer, and the Serpent of Chaos is chained to the Underworld. Like Zeus defeating Typhon and chaining him in Hades until the end of the world, the myth of Prometheus, who is the creator of mankind and giver of wisdom, echoes the Sumerian Anki, as he is chained by Zeus as punishment for giving humans knowledge. This mythology is directly dealt with in the text of Revelation as well. Revelation 21 through 3 I saw an angel descending out of heaven. He carried the key to the abyss and a chain, a huge chain. He grabbed the dragon that old snake, that very devil, Satan himself, chained him up for a thousand years, dumped him into the abyss, slammed it shut, sealed it tight, no more trouble out of him, deceiving the nations until the thousand years are up. After that, he is to be let loose briefly. John then proceeds the prophecy of the victory over the serpent of chaos and the underworld titans, and Thassala gave up the dead who were in it. Thanatos and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they have done, which is in verse 13 of the same chapter of the serpent coming out of the underworld. Each of these three titans Thassala, which is the sea, Thanatos, which is death, and Hades, who is the king of the underworld, are the titans who rule certain aspects of the underworld in Orphic theology, along with Persephone, Saturn, and Dionysus. 
It should not be too surprising to see this theological overlap considering some of the earliest depictions of Jesus are as a new Orpheus or the Good Shepherd. Christianity directly takes on this ancient struggle of these two opposing forces, and Christians today are still awaiting the apocalypse and the serpent or Satan to return. But all of this owes its existence to the Pulaskians and Sumerians of the ancient Copper and Bronze Age. It's clear that these ancient civilizations had a fascination with demons and monsters and their mythology has certainly left its mark on modern religions like Christianity and Islam. Whether you believe in the existence of these creatures or not, there's no denying that they continue to capture our imaginations and inspire us to explore the mysteries of the universe. So let's raise a glass to the ancient Sumerians and their enduring legacy of myth and legend. The oldest tablet or inscription mentioning any god is typically considered to be Anu, the sky god, worshipped by the Sumerians in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, around 4000 BCE, 6,000 years ago. Anu was a part of the Sumerian pantheon and later incorporated into the pantheon of other civilizations in the region such as the Akkadians and Babylonians. And this concept of Anu influences religions in the world right now, today. Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, and even Buddhism. Anu was believed to be the father of the gods and ruler of the heavens. There may have been older gods and older deities worshipped by prehistoric cultures, which I've mentioned in previous videos, but these do not show up in written records. Archaeological evidence suggests that the religious beliefs and practices existed long before the invention of writing. However, within the realm of written records, it is Anu and his daughter Ishtar, the Morning Star, who show up in the beginning. The oldest tablet or inscription mentioning any god is Anu, who comes from the Sumerian city of Uruk and dates to around 2500 BCE. This tablet, known as the Uruk King List, is a historical document that lists the kings of Uruk in chronological order. Among the names of its kings, therefore, is a reference to Anu, indicating his prominence as the deity in the beginning of time. Anu is mentioned in several other ancient Sumerian texts, such as the hymns and prayers and myths, which provide further insights into his role and significance of the god of the Sumerian religious beliefs. These texts were written on clay tablets and have been discovered at various archaeological sites in Mesopotamia, including the cities of Nippur, Ur, and Eridu. It's worth noting that these inscriptions and tablets are the oldest known references to Anu specifically, but it is likely that the worship of Anu predates these written records, possibly by several centuries or more. Anu is considered the god of the heavens, and his name translated as sky or firmament, and it comes from the words An, which is represented by a, a cuneiform logogram that is interchangeable with the word digir, which means God. And it is theorized that the word An is actually cognate with the Proto-Indo-European root word for one, which is also An or Ein, showing that Anu is the possible proto-monad 
concept of the one. And what's even more mind-blowing about this is the rarity of common elements between Sumerian languages and Proto-Indo-European languages, mostly separate language families. And when there is a word that is cognate between these two language families, that this is as ancient as we can possibly imagine. Anu is the son of Anshar, or Kishar, who are primordial deities associated with the horizon and earth. Anu is depicted as the mighty and wise god who resides in the highest heaven, ruling over other gods. He is often portrayed as the father or progenitor of other deities, including Enlil and Ea, also known as Anki. Anu's role as the supreme deity is sometimes overshadowed by other gods, such as Enlil or Marduk, who gained more prominence in later periods. Nevertheless, Anu retains his status as the head of the pantheon and ultimate authority of heaven. Anu's role in the divine hierarchy is also reflected in Mesopotamian cosmology, where he occupies the highest level of the universe, separated from the earth and its inhabitants. He is associated with the celestial realm, divine laws, and ordering of the cosmos. In the Akkadian mythology of Babylon, Anu is considered the chief god and the father of all gods. He plays a crucial role in the creation story known as the Enuma Elish, where he gives birth to the god Ea and grants him authority over the earth. The Greek god Aronos seems to have a similar role as the firmament or the heavens god. Both Anu and Aronos are considered to be the personifications of the sky or the firmament and they're both regarded as sky kings. They are associated with the heavens and are seen as the rulers of the celestial realm. Both Anu and Aranos are considered to be the primordial deities existing at the beginning of creation. They are among the earliest divine beings in their respective mythologies. Anu and Aranos are depicted as fathers of major deities in their pantheons. Anu is the father of Enlil and Ea, while Aranos is the father of the Titans, including Kronos and Rhea. Physically, they are separated from the earth and its inhabitants, and Anu resides in the highest heaven, while Aranos is depicted as an entity that covers and separates the earth from the heavens. These parallels suggest a common theme of a sky king figure with a paternal role and authority in these early mythologies of these early civilizations. Anu is associated with the concept of divine kingship. The king of Sumer was believed to derive his authority from Anu, the one who bestows kingship upon earthly rulers. In both cases, the concept of heavenly abode is present. Anu is described as residing in the highest heaven known as the Celestial Abode, or the Heaven of Anu. And the name of Aranos literally means heaven in Greek. The text of the New Testament in the Gospels, the word used by Jesus and Paul for Kingdom of Heaven, is translated from the Greek Kingdom of Aranos. This heavenly realm is depicted as a sacred and divine space separate from Earth. Matthew 16, 19, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of the heavens, and whatever, if you might bind on the earth, will be bound in the heavens, and whatever you might loose on the earth will be loosed in the heavens. The phrase for kingdom of heavens in Greek, Basilius ton aronon, the word aronos is present for heavens three times in this passage bound in the heavens, did the menon and tois aronos, also at the end of this passage, loosed in the heavens, the leumenon and tois aronos. So the word heaven for aronos, which is borrowed from the concept of anu or the one, is directly impacting the Christian religion, for the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of aronos. Anu is credited with playing a role in the creation of the universe 
and the establishment of cosmic order. He is seen as the one who organizes and governs celestial bodies and heavenly cycles. Anu is associated with justice and the establishment of divine laws. He is seen as the ultimate arbiter of justice, ensuring that the order is maintained within the cosmos among the gods. He presides over divine assemblies where decisions and judgments are made. These gatherings of the gods include discussions, counsel, and determination of destinies. These aspects and beliefs about An can be found in various Sumerian texts, which give us insight into the understanding of Anu's role as the supreme god and his significance in the religious and cosmological framework of ancient Mesopotamia. Now, although Aranos is usurped by Saturn, who takes the kingship of heaven from his father and castrates him, the god Anu, over time, is replaced by other deities who came after him and gained prominence and assumed more significant roles within the pantheon. These two primary gods who surpassed Anu in influence are Enlil and Marduk. Enlil, just like Saturn, is the son of Anu and was initially assigned the role of carrying out Anu's decision on Earth. However, as the mythological narratives developed, Enlil's importance grew, and he became associated with the forces of nature, particularly as the god of wind, storms, and agriculture. Enlil's authority expanded to encompass the Earth and its inhabitants, and eventually became the chief deity of the Sumerian pantheon. Despite this, Anu retains his position as the head of the pantheon, and Enlil's rise did not involve a direct usurpation of Anu's authority. Marduk's rise to prominence occurred in Babylonian mythology during the time of the Babylonian Empire. In the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation myth, Marduk defeats the primordial goddess Tiamat and establishes himself as the supreme god. Marduk's ascendancy reflects the rise of Babylon as a major power in the region, while Marduk became the central figure in Babylonian pantheon, Anu retains his position as the father of the gods and the ruler of heaven, just as Aranos attains his status even after Saturn and Jove rule the heavens. Anu, like Aranos, continues to be known as the heaven's abode, but Marduk is identified with the celestial body of Saturn, showing his overlap and genetic connection to the Greek myths of Saturn and Aranos. In Mesopotamian mythology, the pantheon was dynamic, with the roles and prominence of gods evolving over time. This evolution was influenced by various factors, including shifts in the political power and assimilation of different cultures. While Enlil and Marduk may have surpassed Anu in certain aspects. Anu's position as the father of the gods and the ruler of the heavens remains significant throughout all of Mesopotamian mythology. The story of Saturn, also known as Kronos, usurping Aranos, is a part of Greek mythology recounted in Hesiod's Theogony and other ancient Greek texts. According to the myth, Uranos was the primordial god of the sky and ruled over the universe as its first original ruler. Uranos married Gaia, the goddess of the earth, and together they bore many children, including the Titans. However, Uranos was a harsh and oppressive ruler who feared his own children's power. He hid his children deep within Gaia's womb, causing her great pain and suffering. Gaia became resentful and plotted with her children to overthrow Aranos. The Titan Kronos, also known as Saturn, took lead in the rebellion against Uranos. Gaia fashioned a sickle and gave it to Kronos. With the sickle, Kronos castrated Aranos, severing his genitals and casting them into the sea. By castrating Aranos, Kronos symbolically emasculated him and seized his power. Kronos then became the ruler of the universe taking Aranos' place as the new supreme god. Kronos then married his sister Rhea, 
and they became the rulers of the gods, known as the Titans. However, Kronos also became fearful of his children, and he worried that they would overthrow him, just as he had done with Aranos. As a result, Kronos swallowed each of his children, as they were born to prevent them from challenging his authority. This continued until Rhea devised a plan to save their youngest son, Zeus. Instead of giving Zeus to Kronos, Rhea hid the infant on the island of Crete, and instead, she presented Kronos with a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes. Zeus eventually grew up and returned to confront Kronos. With the help of his siblings and other gods, Zeus waged a war against Kronos and the Titans. Known as the Titanomachia, Zeus emerged victorious, overthrowing Kronos and banishing him to Tartarus, a deep abyss in the underworld. The myth of Saturn, usurping Aranos, reflects a common theme in Greek mythology of a younger generation of gods overthrowing and replacing the elder predecessors. This is what we see with Anu and Enlil and Marduk. It symbolizes the cyclical nature of power and a succession of ruling deities. Scholarly connections between the Greek myths and Sumerian mythology, particularly concerning these deities, Anu, Enlil, and Marduk, and the Greek pantheon, can be observed in terms of shared themes, archetypes, and potential cultural influences. Both Anu and Sumerian mythology and Aranos, sky gods, father gods, holding the position of primacy in their respective pantheons, both associated with the celestial realm and regarded as the patriarchs of the gods, both going through successions and power struggles, mythological narratives involving these deities Enlil and Marduk, and the Greek pantheon, feature these themes of succession and power struggles. These narratives depict the younger generation of gods overthrowing the older to establish their own dominion, Enlil surpassing Anu, Zeus dethroning Kronos. Generational dynamics observed in both mythologies where the children rebel against and ultimately surpass their parents. This theme of succession and power transfer is significant in both Sumerian and Greek. Both emphasize the concept of cosmic order and establishment of the divine hierarchy. Anu plays the role of maintaining cosmic order, while Zeus Amon assumes a similar role. The gods are organized in a hierarchical structure, with specific deities assigned roles and responsibilities within their pantheons. The ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia and Greece had periods of contact and cultural exchange. This contact likely influences the mythology and religious beliefs of these civilizations. There is evidence to suggest that cultural and religious exchanges occurred between ancient civilizations. We have direct archaeological proof, without any doubt, that Greek scribes in the court of Alexander the Great and Babylon were still able to read, translate, write, and use cuneiform script, which was out of use by the time of the Roman Empire. Here is two examples of clay tablets written during the rule of Alexander the Great. The first clay tablet, shown here, figure 315, shows an astronomical tablet found in Babylon, which records events from the weeks prior and following the Battle of Gogamela. It contains one entry that fixes the date of the battle at October 1st by the Julian calendar. The entries on the reverse side described Alexander's proclamations to Babylon, an entry into the city, a famous event in world history. The anonymous scribe who recorded these events refers to Darius as king of the world in the entries leading up to the battle, then gives the same title to Alexander in the entries that follow. Lastly is this right here. Figure 728. The text of this Babylonian astronomical tablet supplies our most accurate date for the death of Alexander the Great in a log entry designed to permit correlation of political and astronomical events. An anonymous scribe wrote in cuneiform for the date corresponding to June 11th on the Julian calendar. On this day, the King Alexander has died. 
So not only was the Ptolemies in Egypt able to still use ancient hieroglyphics during this period, but Greek academics in Babylon were using the most ancient cuneiform writing and the great library of Alexandria had access to the most ancient of texts during this short-lived period, which is the same period that historians from the ancient world, such as Josephus and others, claim that the Bible was produced, known as the Septuagint, which means 70, the story being that 70 elders put together this text using the most ancient sources from Heliopolis and Babylon. One can find certain parallels and similarities between specific deities, mythological themes, and Sumerian and Greek mythology. Both Sumerian god Enlil and the Greek god Zeus are associated with the sky and are considered the chief gods in their respective pantheons. Zeus and Marduk are associated with thunder and display qualities of rulership and cosmic order. Scholars continue to explore these connections through comparative mythology linguistic analysis, and the examination of archaeological and historical finds. The Babylonian Zodiac and the Greek Zodiac share a lot of overlap. Both Zodiac systems are based on the division of the celestial sphere into 12 equal parts, each associated with specific constellations. The 12 signs are associated with certain animals, such as the lion, bull, scorpion, and goat. The Babylonians focused more on the constellation's symbolic and astronomical significance rather than assigning them to specific deities. Each sign was connected to celestial omens and played a role in divination and astrology. The concept of procession of the equinox began in ancient Mesopotamia and was present among the Pelasgians and Egyptians and later continued by the Greeks and Romans and even Hindus. This is a record of the period of the Earth's wobble in space, like an out-of-balance top. Each of the wobble takes about 25,765 years, divided up into 12, which is each astrological sign, shows the rising of the sun at dawn, which is roughly a 2,000-year period for each sign. Because of the slow change in our orientation of the stars, the position of the sun on the first day of spring, the vernal equinox, slowly shifts westward around the sky, which also moves it around our calendar. This is why we refer to this effect as the precession of the equinox, because the rate of the shift is one day for every 72 years. The position of the sun on the day of the vernal equinox is presently in the constellation of Pisces, near the border of Aquarius, which is the next age. The age of the ram and the bull predate the age of Pisces and are present in these ancient texts and even referenced by ancient historians such as Pliny the Elder, Barossus the Chaldean, and Diodorus of Sicily. The veneration of the solstice was also adopted by the Greeks from the ancient Mesopotamian and Pelasgians. Various ancient Greek calendars such as the Attic calendar show similar lunar cycles and start the New Year's during the spring rather than the winter, which is what the Babylonians and Sumerians also did. It is not until Julius Caesar adopts the solar calendar from the Egyptians in the first century BCE that this was changed. The Greek zodiac incorporates many elements from the Babylonian zodiac. For example, Aries is associated with the ram and Taurus with the bull, Leo with the lion, and having 12 divisions such as the Babylonians. This allotment of the heavens as a calendar for measuring time plays into the base 60 counting system that was established by the Sumerians and adopted by the Greeks and is still universally used in the world today. Scholars like Jean-Pierre Vernat and Walter Burkett have examined the shared motifs and narrative patterns between ancient Near Eastern mythologies, Sumerian, Babylonian, and Greek. They explore the archetypal themes and symbols that appear across different mythologies and potential cultural connections that could have contributed to these similarities. These scholars argue 
that the ancient civilizations had contact and cultural exchanges, which could have led the dissemination and adaption of mythological ideas. They proposed that certain mythological motifs or figures might have been shared or influenced one another. The Greeks adopted and incorporated many of these Babylonian constellations into their own zodiac system. The constellation Taurus, who represents the bowl, is associated with the divine bowl that plays a significant role in Babylonian mythology, but later including the story of Zeus in Europa. Leo, the constellation of the lion, is also a Babylonian constellation associated with the Nemean lion, a formidable beast in Greek mythology that Heracles defeats in one of his twelve labors. Scorpius represents the scorpion, recognized by the Babylonians. Scorpius is the one that stings Orion, leading to his death. The Babylonians knew this myth as the shepherd of Anu, the heavenly shepherd in the late Bronze Age, associated with the constellation of Anu, the god of the heavenly realms that I've mentioned. Egyptians associated with this constellation Osiris. Orion was identified with Unas, the last pharaoh of the fifth dynasty, who is said to have eaten the flesh of his enemies and devoured the gods to become great and bring inheritance of his power. According to this myth, Unas travels through the sky to become the star Orion. This myth passed down from the Sumerians, from the constellation Ur Anana, Orion, meaning the light of heaven, Ur Anu. The name of the Taurus constellation was Gud Anu, the bowl of heaven. These are brought down from the Hittites in the realm of Anatolia, passed down to the Ionians, and then eventually passed to the Greeks and the Scorpius constellation that stings Orion becomes one of the 12 Greek constellations. Aquarius, the constellation, is the water bearer, also has its roots in Babylonian astronomy. It is associated with the god Ea, or Enki, the Sumerian god of wisdom and water, who pours forth life-giving waters the Greeks later incorporated this constellation into their zodiac as Aquarius, the water bearer. Overall, these Greek adoptions of Babylonian constellations demonstrates the influence and exchange of astronomical knowledge between ancient civilizations. The merging of different celestial traditions helped shape the development of the Greek zodiac and all the other constellations that surround the zodiac. In Persian mythology, Ahura Mazda, the Zoroastrian deity, like Anu, is also considered powerful and significant and the creator of heaven and earth. Ahura Mazda is depicted almost identical like Anu in his rock carvings, both shown with wings in the sky. Ahura Mazda is the supreme god of Zoroastrianism, it represents the forces of good, light, and truth, wisdom, creation, moral cosmic order. These similarities between Sumerian Anu and Persian Ahura Mazda lie in their roles as the supreme deities within their respective pantheons. Both Anu and Ahura Mazda are regarded as the highest ranking gods. They occupy a position of supreme authority and rulership. Ahura Mazda, associated with the celestial realm, is described as the titan of wisdom, maintains the cosmic order, upholding divine laws that govern the universe, just as Anu does and they are depicted as wise and just figures who ensure harmony and stability of the world. Later on, the god Allah, the one and only true god of Islam, takes on this role and is known as the Merciful One, a title given to Ahura Mazda. Enki, the Sumerian god, and Prometheus, a figure of Greek mythology, share certain similarities in their roles and actions. Both Anki and Prometheus are depicted as benefactors of humanity, actively involved in creation and advancement of human civilization, credited with bestowing knowledge and gifts upon humans for their betterment. Both Anki and Prometheus engage in acts of theft or deception to obtain sacred knowledge or resource from the divine realm. Anki in Sumerian mythology steals the divine decrees that govern various aspects of civilization. Prometheus in Greek mythology 
steals fire from the gods and gives it to humanity. Both Enki and Prometheus associated with teaching and empowering humanity against the will of other gods. Enki is known for giving knowledge and skills to humans, including agriculture, craftsmanship, and arts. Prometheus, through the gift of fire, enables human progress, providing them with the means to survive, metallurgy, alchemy, medicine, technology, and the advancement of civilization. Both Enki and Prometheus challenge divine authority and face repercussions for their actions, willing to sacrifice themselves for the betterment of humankind. Enki's actions in bestowing knowledge and power to humans can be seen as defying the established divine order laid down by Anu, while Prometheus acts of stealing fire and sharing it with humanity defies the will of the Olympians and leads to his punishment. Both have the symbolism of sacrifice for the sake of humanity. Anki as willingly sacrifices himself to heal the world and restore order. Prometheus endures eternal punishment for his actions, but does so in defiance of the gods' unjust treatment of humans. Both Anki and Prometheus are associated with saving humanity from a catastrophic flood in their respective myths. In the Sumerian story, known as the Eridu Genesis, which tells how Anki, the god of wisdom and water, warns a man named Zeustra about an impending flood, Anki advises Zeustra to build a large boat similar to the biblical Noah's Ark and gather various living creatures to preserve them. When the flood arrives, Anki helps Zeustra and his family survive by sealing the door of the boat and protecting them from the wrath of the gods. After the flood subsides, Anki grants him eternal life, making him the last survivor of the flood. Prometheus plays that role in the story of Deucalion and Pyrrha, who are Greek equivalents of Noah and his wife. According to the Greek flood myth, Zeus, like Enlil, decides to destroy humanity with a flood due to their wickedness. However, Prometheus, who is known for his cunning and sympathy for humans, warns his son Deucalion about this impending catastrophe. Following Prometheus's guidance, Deucalion and his wife Pyrrha build an ark and survive the flood. After the flood waters recede, Deucalion and Pyrrha repopulate the earth by throwing stones over their shoulders, which magically transform into human beings. This myth is also reflected in the story of Manu, the first man who survives a flood in Hindu mythology, and all three of these myths predate the story of Noah. The goddess Ishtar, a prominent figure in ancient Mesopotamian mythology, was indeed adopted by different cultures under different names and associations. The Greeks identified Ishtar with their own goddess Aphrodite and referred to her as Venus, while the Egyptians associated her with the goddess Isis. Ishtar was a powerful goddess in Mesopotamian mythology, associated with love, beauty, fertility, and war. When the Greeks encountered the worship of Ishtar during their interactions with the Near East, they found similarities between Ishtar and their own goddess of love and beauty, Aphrodite. The attributes and aspects of Ishtar were thus assimilated into the Greek pantheon, and she came to be known as the Morning Star, Venus, derived from the Roman counterpart of Aphrodite. Ishtar's associations with love, desire, and femininity were reflected in the characterization of Venus as the goddess of love and beauty in Roman and Greek mythology. The Egyptians encountered the worship of Ishtar during their interactions with Mesopotamia, and recognize the same parallels between Ishtar and Isis. Both the goddesses are associated with feminine powers, fertility, and the protection of their pantheons. The Egyptians, known for incorporating deities from various cultures into their religious beliefs, assimilated Ishtar's characteristics and worship into their own existing pantheon, identifying her with the goddess Isis. The merging of Ishtar and Isis led to shared attributes and associations 
regarding fertility, motherhood, and magic. These cross-cultural associations and adoptions of deities often occurred through cultural exchanges, trade, conquest, and cultural diffusion. Different ancient civilizations would encounter and incorporate elements of other mythologies into their own religious beliefs, finding commonalities or aligning existing deities, synchronizing with foreign ones to bridge the gap between cultures and create religious continuity. Isis, the goddess of magic, fertility, and motherhood. Her story revolves around her husband Osiris, who was murdered by his brother Set out of jealousy. Isis embarks on a quest to find the scattered body parts of Osiris and reassembles them, using her own magical powers to revive him temporarily. Through her love, devotion, and magical prowess, Isis is able to conceive a child with Osiris named Horus, who goes on to avenge his father's death and become a prominent deity himself. Isis is revered for her role in preserving the life and lineage of Osiris and ensuring his resurrection in the afterlife. In Mesopotamian mythology, the story of Ishtar and her husband Tammuz reflects a cycle of life death and rebirth. Like Osiris, Tammuz dies and descends into the underworld, causing Ishtar to mourn his loss and descend into the realm of the dead to rescue him. During her journey, the earth becomes barren and lifeless. Eventually, Ishtar negotiates with the gods of the underworld and successfully brings Tammuz back to life, restoring fertility and vitality to the world. This myth symbolizes the changing seasons and cyclical nature of life and death. Both Isis and Ishtar are associated with saving their husbands from death. Isis actively seeks to resurrect Osiris and ensures the continuation of his legacy through their son Horus. Ishtar's descent into the underworld saves Tammuz, which represents the restoration of life and fertility in the natural world and springtime. Demeter, the grain goddess central to the Eleusinian mysteries, along with Dionysus, is also associated with fertility, agriculture, and the cycles of nature. Like Ishtar and Demutzi, Demeter is primarily known for her role in ensuring the fertility of the earth, the growth of the crops, and the abundance of the harvest. Ishtar is also associated with the fertility of the land and considered a patroness of agriculture. Both goddesses have associations with motherhood. Demeter is the mother of Persephone, and her grief over Persephone's abduction by Hades is central to the myth of the changing seasons. Ishtar is also associated with motherhood and has been depicted as a nurturing and protective figure. Life, death, and rebirth Demeter and Ishtar are both connected to the cycles of life, death, and rebirth. Demeter's grief over the loss of her daughter Persephone leads to the barrenness of the earth in the winter, symbolizing the dormant period of plant life. Ishtar's descent into the underworld to rescue her husband Tammuz is the story of planting the seeds into the ground that come up as new life. The story of death and rebirth, the old plant that's dying gives up its seeds into the ground. The seeds go into the underworld and rise up again, representing the cyclical nature of life and the changing seasons. These similarities may reflect broader patterns and themes found in ancient mythologies, where different cultures sought to explain and celebrate the natural world for its cycles through the respective deities. The connections between Demeter and Ishtar may arise from these shared mythological motifs rather than from direct cultural or historical influence. A recent discovery shows a direct connection between Ishtar and the goddess Venus. In June of 2014, Isis captured Mosul and ceded its influence across the surrounding area and set out to systematically destroy archaeological site 
of the Temple of Ishtar at Nimrud, demolishing the ruins with sledgehammers, bombs, and diggers. Thankfully, though, archaeologists have recently been able to return to this site at Nimrud. Early this year, archaeologists continued work on the Temple of Ishtar, which burned when Nimrud was sacked by an invading army in 612 BCE. Chief among their finds was a fragment of large stone monument that depicts the goddess Ishtar inside an eight-pointed star symbol. Dr. Michael Dante says, Our greatest find this season was a spectacular fragment from the stone stele that shows the goddess Ishtar inside a star symbol. This is the first unequivocal depiction of the goddess Ishtar Sharat Nithi, a divine aspect of the goddess associated with the rising of the planet Venus, the morning star, to be found in this temple dedicated to her. Dr. Michael Dante, program director of the Iraq Heritage Stabilization Program, an archaeologist at the University of Pennsylvania. The goddess Ishtar and Aphrodite are both represented by this exact eight-pointed star, which is called Lucifer, which shows how influential this goddess is among the ancient world. This is a symbol practically universal across the entire ancient world. Venus is depicted in Greco-Roman myths as being in love with Adonis, the mythological figure of Tammuz, a Mesopotamian god associated with fertility and vegetation, and the cycle of life and death has certain similarities with Adonis. Adonis being an adoption of Tammuz by the Greeks and Phoenicians, for the role of Adonis can be seen as an example of cultural influence and assimilation of mythological concepts, both connected to vegetation and seasons. Tammuz is often depicted as the dying and resurrected god, whose death in the winter leads to the withering of vegetation, while his return in the spring brings renewal and fertility. Adonis, similarly, is associated with the cycle of nature and is known for his beauty. His death and subsequent rebirth are tied to the seasons, his absence during the winter symbolizing barrenness of the earth, and his return in the spring signifying the renewal of life in nature. When Adonis dies in a hunting accident, Venus weeps over him and her tears cause flowers to grow. Mourning and lamentation, both Tammuz and Adonis are mourned by their respective goddesses, Venus and Ishtar. In Mesopotamian mythology, Ishtar mourns the death of Tammuz, descending into the underworld to rescue him, but in Greek mythology, Aphrodite mourns the death of Adonis and is depicted in a state of grief. The mourning of these goddesses is linked to the sadness and loss associated with the absence of their loved ones and the impact it has on the natural world. The book of Ezekiel shows how central and widespread this weeping over the dead God was. Ezekiel 8.14 says, And then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and I saw women sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz and Adonis are often depicted as youthful and beautiful figures. Their beauty is celebrated and contributes to their status as objects of desire. Their association with youthful and vitality and attractiveness connects them to themes of love. The similarities in their attributes and roles may have resonated with the Greeks, leading to the assimilation of Tammuz into their pantheon under the guise of Adonis. Bacchus, who is also known as Dionysus, is a deity from Greek mythology associated with the wine, agriculture, and growing vines, death, fertility, ecstasy, and the arts. He is the prince and son of Zeus, the king of the gods. Tammuz, on the other hand, is a god from Mesopotamia associated with fertility, vegetation, cycle of life and death, also a prince, and the shepherd god. Both Bacchus and Tammuz are associated with fertility and the abundance of nature. Bacchus is depicted with vines and grapes, 
symbolizing the growth and abundance of vineyards. Tammuz is also associated with vegetation and the cycle of fertility, where his death leads to the withering of plants and rebirth, the regrowing of plants. Bacchus and Tammuz both have aspects of dying and returning to life. Bacchus has a myth called the Bacchae, where he is torn apart by titans, but is resurrected and achieves divine immortality. As mentioned earlier, Tammuz also has his own descent in return from the underworld. Both Bacchus and Tammuz are associated with ecstatic and celebratory rituals. Bacchus is known for his association with revelry, wine, an ecstatic state of his followers, known as the Bacchic Frenzy or Dionysian Rites. Tammuz is honored through rituals involving mourning and ecstatic celebrations in the ancient Mesopotamian festivals. These similarities between Bacchus and Tammuz reflect broader patterns found in ancient mythologies. Different cultures sought to explain and celebrate the cycles of nature, fertility, and the human experience itself. To return back to the topic of the Supreme God, as Aranos parallels Anu, they both are succeeded in their kingship by the new gods that come after them. This could signify the ages of time and the inevitable evolution of constant, eternal renewal in nature and progress in society. Eventually, Marduk becomes the chief god of the Babylonian pantheon and Saturn, a prominent figure in Roman mythology, both represented by the star Saturn in the sky, or planet Saturn. In Roman mythology, they share similarities in their mythologies, particularly in their roles as powerful deities and their associations with kingship. Saturn is the king of Elysium, where all the good souls dwell after death. Both Marduk and Saturn are considered supreme deities in their respective myths. Marduk is the head of the Babylonian pantheon, patron god of the city of Babylon. Saturn, also known as Saturnus in Latin, is one of the major gods of the Roman pantheon and had the biggest temple in Rome, where all the riches and money was located as the central bank of Rome. Marduk is credited with creating the world and establishing the order of the universe. He is depicted as a royal, heroic figure, embodying the qualities of the divine king, while Saturn in Roman mythology is associated with the Golden Age, a mythical period of peace and prosperity, ruled by a virtuous king. He is also believed to have introduced agriculture and civilization to humanity. Both Marduk and Saturn are depicted as these particular powerful deities. Marduk's most famous myth is the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation epic in which he defeats the primordial goddess Tiamat, establishes his supremacy over the gods, while Saturn overthrows his father Uranos, the personification of the heaven, to become the ruler of the cosmos. Both Marduk and Saturn have associations with time and chronology. Marduk is associated with the concept of time in the Enuma Elish as he divides the heavens and establishes the calendar, while Saturn in Roman mythology is the god of time, and he is associated with the concept of time as he is depicted with the scythe, symbolizing the passage of time. The parallels may arise from these shared themes and archetypes, as they are both identified with the same central location in the sky, being the planet Saturn. In Hindu mythology, it is Indra who plays this role. Both Jupiter and Indra are associated with thunder and lightning, just as Baal in Canaanite mythology is associated with thunder and lightning and is the rider on the clouds, just like Jupiter and Indra. And all three of these gods succeed a god that came before them. Jupiter, also known as Jove, is considered the king of the gods in Roman mythology and wields thunderbolts as his weapon. Just as Indra and Baal, all these deities are depicted as wielding thunderbolts 
riding on the clouds and having dominion over the forces of nature. Jupiter is revered as the supreme god, leader of the Olympians against the Titans, and brings justice and cosmic order, while Indra in Hinduism is the chief of the Devas against the Asuras and also for justice and cosmic order. Due to all of this, the most ancient god, Anu, and the oldest mentioned by any surviving text, who influences Aranos, which becomes the Greek word for heaven itself, directly impacts religions today. Thank you for joining us in this captivating journey through the rich tapestry of Mesopotamian and Greek mythology, from the grandeur of the mighty gods like Anu and Zeus, to the intriguing tales of heroes like Enki, Prometheus, and the morning star Ishtar, and many others, we have explored the fascinating intersections and parallels between these ancient pantheons. But our exploration has only just begun. The world of ancient myths is vast and ever unfolding, promising further wonders and revelations. In our next episode, we shall embark on a new adventure, delving even deeper into the enchanting realms of ancient mythologies. Brace yourselves as we unravel more captivating stories, draw more connections, and uncover the hidden threads that bind these ancient civilizations together. So, my friends, be prepared to immerse yourself in the mesmerizing world of myths, where gods and mortals intertwine, where legends are born, where timeless wisdom awaits us. Join us in our next installment as we continue our odyssey through the ancient tapestry of human imagination. Until then, may the ancient gods guide your path. May the mysteries of the past illuminate your present, and may the allure of the ancient world keep you yearning for more. In the beginning, there was only chaos, the gaping emptiness of void. Then, with the passage of time, starry Aranos and Gaia, heaven and earth, emerged from chaos. Gaia was the everlasting foundation of the gods of Olympus. She was followed by Tartarus, the great region beneath the earth, Eros, the shining god of love and attraction and desire, and Erebus, the unknowable darkness where death dwells. From there, Gaia married Aranos, the starry sky, her equal, to cover her, the hills and the fruit-swelling oceans. Gaia then bore Orea, the mountains, and Pontus, the sea, without sweet union of love. Then she lay with Aranos and bore deep-swirling Oceanus, Coeus, and Creus, Hyperion, Iapetus, Thea, Rhea, Themis, and gold-crowned Phoebe, and lovely Tethys. After them was born Kronos, the willy, the youngest, and most terrible of her children. Only Kronos, the youngest of the Titans, was brave enough to take his mother's sickle and castrate his father. Kronos then became the king of the gods with his sister Rhea as his queen. Kronos, however, learned of a prophecy that he would be overthrown by one of his children. To prevent this, each time Rhea gave birth, Kronos swallowed the child. Rhea tricked Kronos when her sixth child Zeus was born. She wrapped in a stone swaddling clothes, which Kronos swallowed, thinking it was a baby. Zeus was then taken to Crete to be raised in secret. When Zeus grew up, he returned and forced Kronos to disgorge his siblings. He led them in war against Kronos and the Titans, and eventually they won, and Zeus became the king of the gods. And thus, the reign of the Olympians began, marking a new era in the history of the cosmos. Welcome back, fellow myth seekers and lovers of ancient wisdom. Today we embark on a captivating journey through the realms of God's creation and the epic clash 
of cosmic pantheons. Get ready to unlock the divine secrets as we delve into this mesmerizing world of Hesiod's Theogony and its enchanting connections to ancient Near Eastern theogonies and even the Old Testament book of Genesis. Hesiod's Theogony might be your go-to source for Greek mythology, but what if I told you that the deities of ancient Greece didn't work in isolation, but what if I told you that Genesis borrows its story from previous Genesis stories? Ever wondered how Greek gods like Zeus and Poseidon might rub elbows with the likes of Marduk and Tiamat? We'll be exploring the intriguing parallels between Babylonian and Hittite creation myths. Genesis and Hesiod's Theogony will also uncover the lingering influence of these ancient tales on later mythologies and religious beliefs. Hesiod's account of the Greek creation story, as detailed in his work Theogony, begins with the emergence of chaos, void, or chasm, and from chaos, Gaia, Tartarus, and Eros came into existence, that is, Earth, Underworld, and Desire. Depending on which version we're looking at, either Gaia emerges with Aranos, or she gives birth to Aranos, who either way becomes her husband and the father of her children, the Titans. Kronos, the youngest of all, overthrows Aranos, castrates him, and then in turn is overthrown by his son, Zeus. And this is how we get the succession of the gods, which is called Theogony. Theogony, from the Greek Theogonia, meaning generations of the gods, is an epic poem of 1,022 hexameter lines which describe the birth of the gods in the Greek pantheon. It is thought to have been composed 700 BCE, or somewhere around the 8th century BCE. Little is known of Hesiod's life. His father emigrated from Kaimi in Asia Minor and settled in Boeotia, a small state in central Greece. It is assumed that the poet was a farmer, a fact garnered from the earlier verses of the Theogony. He may have also been a rhapsodist, a reciter of poetry, where he learned the technique and vocabulary of heroic songs. Although there are some who question whether or not Hesiod actually wrote the Theogony, most classicists believe he did. However, parts of the work may have been added by a later poet and there is a definite similarity in some aspects to some Mesopotamian literature. The Enuma Elish, also known as the Seven Tablets of Creation, is the Babylonian creation myth, whose title is derived from the opening lines of the piece, When on High. Enuma Elish. The myth tells the story of the great god Marduk's victory over the forces of chaos and his establishment of order at the creation of the world. All of the tablets containing the myth found at Ashur, Kish, Ashurbanipal's library at Nineveh, and other excavated sites date to 1200 BCE. Their colophons, however, indicate that these are all copies of a much older version of the myth dating from long before the reign of Hammurabi of Babylon, 18th century BCE, the king who elevated the god Marduk to patron deity of Babylon. The poem in its present form, with Marduk as champion, is thought to be a revision of an even older Sumerian work, and the Sumerian Ea or Enki or Enlil is thought to have played the major role in the original version of the story dated to 3500 BCE. Theogony of Dunu, composition that dates to the second millennium BCE, when Dunu was a town of importance. The text is useful for showing that each city may have had its own local traditions about creation, which differed even in essentials from those of other cities. Unlike the Epic of Creation or Enuma Elish, in which the primeval forces were seawater and freshwater, we have plow and earth as the originators of creation 
and the parents of the sea, Anu the sky, who creates the sky, which creates the earth. Thus, we cannot speak of Mesopotamian view of creation as a single specific tradition. This in turn shows the futility of claiming a direct connection between Genesis, as described in the Old Testament, and any one of the Mesopotamian account of creations. In fact, it mostly draws upon all of these theogonies that come before it. Hesiod's Theogony and the Enuma Elish are both ancient epic poems that explore the creation of the universe and the origins of the gods in different mythological traditions. While they come from different cultures and time periods, there are several similarities between the two works. Both Theogony and the Enuma Elish describe the process of creation and the establishment of order in the cosmos. They present elaborate cosmogenies that explain how the world came into existence and how the gods emerged. Both poems feature primordial deities who precede the main pantheon of gods. These primordial beings represent abstract concepts and forces of nature. In Theogony, chaos or void is the initial entity from which everything else originates. While in the Enuma Elish, Tiamat, or the deep primeval sea, beginning of all. Both of these works provide genealogies of the gods, tracing their lineage and relationships. They present a hierarchy of gods and goddesses with different generations of deities and their interactions shaping the world in its divine order. Both poems depict conflicts among the gods that lead to the establishment of order in Theogony, the Titans rebel against Aranos, and then later Olympian gods overthrow the Titans. In the Enuma Elish, the younger gods, led by Marduk, battle against the primordial goddess Tiamat and her forces. Both poems address the succession of power among the gods. They portray a shift in leadership and authority from older generations to younger ones. In Theogony, Zeus emerges as the supreme ruler of the gods, while in Enuma Elish, it's Marduk. Both works employ common mythological motifs found in various cultures, such as the slaying of a monstrous deity for the creation of the world. These motifs reflect archetypal themes and symbolize the triumph of order over chaos. During the Bronze Age, this story was passed to the Hittites, who rendered the succession of the gods myth, or theogony, in several different stories that span from 1600 to 1200 BCE. The Kingship of Heaven and the Song of Kumarbi share some similarities with Hesiod's theogony in their portrayal of divine origins and establishment of order. Both Theogony and the Hittite creation myths present genealogies of the gods, tracing their lineage and relationships. They describe a hierarchy of deities and their interactions, the succession of power, and the emergence of a supreme god. Both traditions feature primordial deities who exist before the creation of the world. Just like Chaos and Gaia are among the initial entities, the Hittites have Alalu and Anu and Kumarbi who represent these primordial beings. While in Theogony, the Titans rebel, in the Hittite mythology, Kumarbi struggle against Anu, which eventually leads to the rise of the storm god Teshub. Both traditions address the theme of succession and power. Zeus emerges as the supreme ruler of the gods, while in Hittite mythology, Teshub becomes the chief deity after overcoming Kumarbi, who parallels Kronos. Teshub assumes the kingship in heaven. Both traditions describe how the gods shape the universe, assign roles and domains to different deities, and bring order from chaos. Hesiod's Theogony also has many parallels to the Egyptian 
creation myths etched on the walls of the city of Heliopolis, dated to around 2000 BCE, is a similar creation account that looks similar to Hesiod. And this Egyptian creation myth, the process of cosmic creation, they explain how the world came into existence and how order was established from chaos. This is the common thread through all of these creation stories that existed in this time period. While Chaos and Gaia are among these initial deities in Theogony, it's Atum or Amon and Nun who represent the primeval beings in the Egyptian creation account that's etched in the walls of Heliopolis. In Theogony, Hesiod describes how the gods, through their words, bring about the birth and organization of the cosmos. Similarly, in the Egyptian creation myths, the universe is believed to have been spoken into existence by the gods through their words or thoughts. Both narratives highlight the active involvement of gods in the creation of the world. They portray gods as creators, shapers, and organizers of the cosmos. Both Theogony and the Egyptian Genesis depict the transformation of chaos into order. They present the gods' efforts to establish stability and harmony in the universe or mat, as the Egyptians call it, organizing elements and assigning roles to different deities. Another theogony from the ancient world known as the Phoenician history, attributed to a Bronze Age priest named Sanko Niathan from Beirut. And like Hesiod's theogony, it describes a hierarchy of deities and their interactions highlighting the succession of power and the emergence of the supreme god. Both traditions feature primordial deities who exist before the creation of the world. Like Chaos, Gaia, and Aranos, the Phoenician creation myth includes El, the Semitic word for God, which is also the same word used in the Hebrew Bible for the one true God, along with other titles like the yod he vav -He, and Adonai. Both narratives depict the conflicts and struggles among the gods that shape the world and establish order. In Theogony, the Titans rebel against Aranos, and the later Olympians battle against the Titans. In the Phoenician myth, El and his offspring battle against the primordial gods that came before him. El sacrifices his firstborn, only begotten son, Yahud as an offering to Aranos, his father in heaven, and then circumcises himself and makes this a custom among the Phoenicians from that day forward. It is believed that this story is retold in the Old Testament book of Genesis, with Abraham offering his son Isaac as an offering to El, the same name, but is stopped by an angel. And like the Phoenician myth, Abraham also circumcises himself and makes this a custom among the Hebrews. Both Hesiod and Sanko Niathan tradition address the theme of succession and divine power. They portray a transfer of authority from the older generations to the younger ones. In Theogony, Zeus emerges as the supreme ruler of the gods. In the Phoenician myth, El is succeeded by his other son, Dagon, who then becomes the chief ruler of the Phoenicians. And like the other myths that came afterwards, the Phoenician cosmology in Theogony describes how the gods shape the universe and bring order from chaos. Phoricides of Syros, pre-Socratic Ionian philosopher, in the 6th century BCE was said to have received a cosmological creation story from the Phoenicians who he studied under. This particular rendering of the Phoenician creation seems to be slightly different from what Sanko Niathan laid down and was attributed to the legendary Pelasgians who inhabited the Aegean long before the Greeks and Mycenaeans. Like Hesiod's Theogony, it presents genealogical accounts of the gods and tracing their lineage and relationships. It describes a succession of deities, often in a hierarchical structure. Both traditions feature primordial deities who exist before the creation of the world. In Theogony, it's Chaos in Aranos and Gaia. 
among the three initial entities, while in the fragments of Phericides, it's Kronos, Zas, and Cthoni. Both narratives touch upon conflicts among the gods that shape the world and establish order. In Theogony, the Titans rebel against Aranos, and later the Olympians against the Titans. In Phericides' Theogony, there are references to struggles among the gods, Zas overthrowing Kronos, and Kronos overthrowing Ophion. Both traditions address the theme of succession in power. They portray a transfer of authority from the older generations to the younger ones. Zeus emerges as the supreme ruler of the gods. The Derveni Papyrus is an ancient Greek manuscript that was discovered in 1962 during excavations in Derveni, a suburb of Thessaloniki in Greece. It is considered one of the most important archaeological finds relating to ancient Greek religious and philosophical beliefs, believed to date back to the 4th century BCE and is the oldest surviving text in physical copy in Europe in world history. The papyrus contains a philosophical treatise written in Greek addressing various cosmological and religious topics. It discusses the nature of the gods, the origins of the universe, the role of sacrifices and rituals, and the interpretation of religious texts and myths. One of the notable aspects of the Dervani Papyrus is its commentary on an earlier poem attributed to Orpheus, a legendary figure in ancient Greek mythology, a son of Apollo and the high priest of Dionysus said to be the teacher of a man named Musaeus, who later historians say is possibly Moses. He was called Orpheus the Theologian, the revealer of the heavens. Commentary provides an allegorical interpretation of this poem, discussing its cosmogenic and theogenic themes. The Derveni Papyrus is significant because it provides valuable insights into the religious and philosophical beliefs of ancient Greeks during the late classical period. It offers a glimpse into the ways in which ancient Greeks interpreted their myths and religious practices, and it sheds light on the development of philosophical and cosmological thought. Both texts delve into cosmological concepts, seeking to explain the origins of the universe and the nature of the gods. They explore the relationship between the divine, the natural world, and human existence. Both texts contain theogonic narratives describing the genealogies and relationships of the gods. They present accounts of the succession of divine powers and the establishment of cosmic order. Both texts engage in the interpretation of the myths, seeking deeper meaning and symbolism. Hesiod's Theogony provided a foundation for later philosophical and cosmological inquiries. The Dravani Papyrus, with its philosophical treaties and allegorical interpretation, reflects the philosophical interests of the time. Everything that's mentioned in this video so far has references older than the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. There is no reference to the book of Genesis by anyone in any primary sources before the 4th century BCE. And this leads us to the final installment of creation stories that are similar to Hesiod's Theogony, which is the book of Genesis in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Both Theogony and Genesis address the process of creation and the establishment of the world. They present accounts of how the universe came into existence and how order was established. They both begin with an eternal being, either chaos or Elohim, and then heaven and earth are immediately created. The Greek Septuagint, which was produced in Alexandria, Egypt around 270 BCE, uses Gaia and Aranos for heaven and earth. And in the Greek text, the similarities are staring you in the face. They both begin with darkness or Nyx before light, or in the case of Hesiod, Erebus gave birth to ether and day. In both accounts, they move from heaven and earth to darkness and light, and then to the separating two waters, which in the case of the Theogony is the Raging Sea and Oceanus. They both seem to have double accounts of how this happens. They both end up with the creation of humankind, 
But in the case of Hesiod's Theogony, the birth of Aphrodite seems to parallel Eve. Instead of Adam's rib being used to create Eve, the genitalia of the castrated Aranos falls into the sea and white foam formed which Aphrodite was sprang from. Pandora and Eve show obvious parallels too. Pandora's box being opened has parallels to Eve biting the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In both cases, the woman is the reason for the problems of the world. What's even apparent is that Hesiod even mentions good and evil in this very passage. Whoever marries as fated and gets a good wife, compatible, has a life that is balanced between good and evil. A constant struggle, but if he marries the abusive kind, he lives with pain in his heart all down the line. Prometheus, who creates mortal humans, seems to parallel Adam and Cain in one character, as he is the primordial god who humans descend from, but also like Cain, gives offerings to Zeus that are rejected. The son of Prometheus, Deucalion, has to build an ark and survive a flood that is levied by Zeus. Both texts present a hierarchy, structure of divine beings. They describe a succession of gods and their relationships. In the case of the Old Testament, the succession of the patriarchs from Adam to Noah to Abraham to Moses and down highlighting the order and organization within the divine realm and the earthly realm. The gods are assigned specific roles and dominions over different aspects of the universe and theogony, just like the patriarchs are in Genesis. Both traditions feature primordial beings who exist before the creation of the world. Chaos is existing before anything in theogony, while God is depicted as pre-existing before the creation of the world. In Theogony, the gods bring about the birth and organization of the cosmos through their words. Similarly, in Genesis, God creates the world by speaking it into existence with his divine command. Divine creation from the order from chaos. Both traditions present the idea of the world being brought out of chaos into order. They describe the transformation of formless and void conditions into a structured and organized universe. The process of creation involves the establishment of boundaries and the separation of the elements. They present accounts of how humans were created by divine entities and their relationship with the divine. The Epic of Creation, a Mesopotamian text cited by Barosus the Chaldean in the 3rd century of the BCE. The text itself dates to the 2nd millennium BCE, and this text has seven tablets, just like the seven days of creation. In the first tablet, heaven and earth emerge, the second tablet, and the atmosphere and firmament are created, just like the second day of creation in Genesis. It is the fourth tablet where the constellations, the sun, moon, and stars are created, just like day four in Genesis. The fifth tablet, birds and sea creatures are created, just like day five of Genesis. Lastly, day six in Genesis is when humans are created, and in the same way, tablet six, we have humans created. And the most striking parallel of all, on the seventh tablet, the gods rest. Just as in day seven, the one true god rests. Theogony of Dunu, which dates to the early second millennium BCE. And this text reads, at the very beginning, Plow married Earth, and they decided to establish a family and dominion. We shall break up the virgin soil of the land into clods. In the clods of their virgin soil, they created the sea. Plow is a constellation in the sky that represents the heavens. So once again, we have heaven and Earth getting married, creating the world and separating the seas.
King Kinneris, like King David, is portrayed always with a lyre or harp in his hand. In fact, Kenor, the Hebrew word used for harp that David plays in 1 Samuel 16.23, which says, And whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would pick up his Kenor harp and play, and Saul would become well, and the spirit of distress would depart from him. Both King David and King Kinneris have etymological and artistic connections through this depiction of kings playing the Kenor. While David is the father of King Solomon, who introduces the worship of Aphrodite into the house of God, King Kinneris is the father of Adonis, who also introduces the worship of Aphrodite into the kingdom of Cyprus. And Solomon, like Adonis, is loved by hundreds of women. Solomon has hundreds of concubines, and Adonis has hundreds of lovers. Also, Adonis, like Jesus Christ, is mourned for by women, like Mary. And like Jesus, the blood of Adonis is thought to hold the power of eternal life. Every year during the spring equinox, the annual death and resurrection of Adonis was celebrated by the Cyprians and Phoenicians, similar to the Easter celebration of Christianity. Welcome back, Gnosis Seekers. Today, we are about to uncover the fascinating layers of history, culture, and mythology from across the world. We are diving into the sparkling Mediterranean, to an island that's seen the rise and fall of empires, the blend of civilizations, and the birthplace of gods and goddesses. Cyprus, the home of Aphrodite, also known as Venus. In this video, we will navigate through time, unearthing the origins of the religions that have thrived on this sun-soaked island and the journey into an age where gods and goddesses held sway over the hearts and minds of the people. Yes, we're talking about two figures who have not only shaped Cypriot culture, but have left a lasting impact on Western civilization at large the alluring Aphrodite, and the handsome Adonis. From Neolithic hunter-gatherers to the Bronze Age worship of the Lady of Cyprus, and from the cults of Aphrodite and Adonis in the classical era to the lingering legends in the present-day folklore, this video will guide you through a journey of faith, myth, and the intertwining of both in a tale as old as time. Buckle up. Sophia lovers, we're about to embark on an epic exploration of love, beauty, tragedy, and rebirth on the island of love itself. If you're as excited as we are to plunge into these ancient narratives, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more exciting historical adventures. Now, let's set sail and dive deep into the captivating religions of Cyprus and the enthralling stories of Aphrodite and Adonis. Cyprus has a long history with evidence of human habitation dating back as far as the 10th millennium, 10,000 BCE. These earliest inhabitants are believed to have been hunter-gatherers who cross over to the island from the nearby regions of modern-day Lebanon. The first major wave of civilization in Cyprus was during the Neolithic period, around 7,000 to 6,000 BCE, when farming communities began to develop. The Bronze Age, which started around 2,500 BCE, brought significant advancements to metallurgy and commerce. Cyprus has since been occupied by a series of different civilizations, including the Mycenaean Greeks, Phoenicians, Romans, Byzantines, Arab Caliphate, French, Venetians, Ottoman Turks, and British. The Neolithic period on Cyprus, also known as the New Stone Age, is characterized by significant advancements. 
human technology and culture. It's believed to have started around 8000 BCE and lasted to around 3900 BCE, the a ceramic and ceramic Neolithic periods, with and without pottery. In the Aceramic Neolithic period, Cyprus saw its first permanent human settlements, dating around 8000 BCE. These inhabitants lived in round houses and survived mainly by hunting, gathering, and fishing. The Kirokitia culture is a well-known example of this period, with well-preserved archaeological site that has provided a great deal of information about the early settlers' way of life. These Kirokitia people are known for their innovative architecture, including stone round houses, which were often partially buried in the ground for insulation. The ceramic Neolithic period, from 4500 to 3900 BC, marked the introduction of more sophisticated tools and the beginning of agriculture and trade. The Sotira culture is a significant group from this period. During this time, Cyprus had significant interactions with surrounding regions, especially the Levantine coast and evidenced by commonality in certain types of pottery and other artifacts. Despite being an island, Cyprus had a rich Neolithic culture that closely mirrored the major developments happening on the mainland at the same time. The evidence of these ancient cultures provides invaluable insights into human journey from hunter-gatherers to settled farming communities. The Copper Age, also known as the Chacolithic Age, in Cyprus is believed to have begun around 3900 BCE and continued until the advent of the Bronze Age around 2500 BCE. This period is characterized by a development of copper use, in addition to stone for tools and other items. While farming continued to be the primary source of sustenance during the Copper Age, the inhabitants of Cyprus began to master the smelting and working of copper, which was abundant on the island. This allowed for the production of more durable tools, weapons, and other objects facilitating a significant advancement in technology. Idols for worship were designed during this period. The Cypriot Chocolithic period is also noted for the production of distinctively decorated pottery for the beginning of trade relations with the surrounding regions. Artifacts from this period, such as the cruciform figurines, plank-shaped figurines, and pottery with complex incised decoration show a sophistication in their craftsmanship. These artifacts indicate that society was becoming more complex with the development of new rituals and social norms. In terms of settlement, people during this period tended to live in small villages, usually built on hills, which allowed them to easily defend themselves. Burial practices also became more elaborate during this Copper Age, with the dead often buried under the floors of homes or in designated cemeteries. Grave goods became more common, suggesting a belief in the afterlife. This was an important period in Cyprus's history as the technological advancements and cultural developments set the stage for the Bronze Age, during which the island became a significant player in the Eastern Mediterranean region. The Bronze Age of Cyprus, also known as the Cypriot Bronze Age, extended from 2300 to 1000 BCE. This period saw the development of more complex political economic systems and the emergence of new religious practices. Based on the archaeological evidence, it appears that a fertility goddess was widely worshipped on Cyprus during the Bronze Age. This is suggested by numerous terracotta figurines of women, often pregnant or with emphasized sexual characteristics, which have been found in tombs and sanctuaries. The bowl also appears to have been an important religious symbol, possibly associated with fertility, strength, and power. Horn bowl figurines and images of bowls are common in Bronze Age Cypriot art. Numerous Bronze Age sanctuaries have been discovered on Cyprus. 
These often include open-air altars and a variety of religious artifacts, including figurines and ceremonial vessels. Some sanctuaries also contain large stone structures, possibly used for communal religious ceremonies. During the Bronze Age, the dead were often buried with a variety of grave goods, suggesting a belief in an afterlife. These grave goods often included religious objects and figurines. Cyprus became increasingly integrated into the wider Mediterranean world during this late Bronze Age. This was a period of extensive trade and international diplomacy. Cypriot pottery and other goods were widely distributed across the region. Cyprus was a major supplier of copper to the Mycenaean Greeks and was part of a cultural exchange network that included the Hittites, Egyptians, and Babylonians. These interactions likely influenced religious practices and beliefs, and during this time, the Greek goddess Aphrodite became prominent in Cypriot religion. Through the Iron Age and into the year 570 BCE, Cyprus was conquered by Egypt under Pharaoh Amasis II. This brief period of Egyptian domination left its influence mainly in the arts, especially sculptures, where the rigid and the dress of the Egyptian style can be observed. Cypriot artists later discarded this Egyptian style in favor of Greek prototypes. Statues in stone often show a mixture of Egyptian and Greek influence. In particular, ceramics recovered on Cyprus show influence from the ancient Minoans of Crete. Men often wore Egyptian wigs and Assyrian-style beards. Armor and dress showed Western Asiatic elements as well. During the Classical period, Cyprus came under the influence of the Persian Empire and later the Greeks and Romans. Cypriot kings adopted Persian customs and religions while maintaining their Greek identity, and the island became a place where Western and Eastern cultures mixed. Cyprus was known as the birthplace of Aphrodite, and the sanctuary of Aphrodite at Paphos became an important pilgrimage site, influencing religious practices across the entire world. Cyprus was part of the Byzantine Empire for many centuries and played a crucial role in the spread of Christianity in the Eastern Mediterranean. The island was a center of monasticism and produced significant religious figures and texts. Later, under the Venetian rule, Cyprus was a key player in the Crusades and a link between the Western Europe and Holy Land. Cyprus remained a place where different cultures and religions coexisted under Ottoman and British rule. Today, Cyprus is still divided between the Greek Cypriot South and Turkish Cypriot North, reflecting the island's complex history and its continued role as a meeting place of different cultures. They are now divided by the Greek Orthodox Christians and Sunni Islam. But long before these religions took root, Cyprus had its own religion, which influenced the broader Mediterranean world. Even Christianity and Islam borrow elements from the native religions of Cyprus. King David, Mary, and Jesus may have been influenced by the stories of King Kinneris, Mira, and Adonis. But before we explore these, first we need to examine what led up to the foundational myths of Cyprus. And this takes us back once again to the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, we begin to see an emergence of goddess figurines, often referred to as the Great Goddess or Mother Goddess, associated with fertility, agriculture, and nature. She is often depicted as a robust woman, sometimes pregnant with their hands on her hips. These terracotta figurines, known as plank figures, have been found in various sites across Cyprus. In the late Bronze Age, we start to see a goddess who would become a central figure in Cypriot religion 
the Lady of Cyprus. She would later become identified with Aphrodite by the Greeks, but also as Estarte by the Phoenicians due to her association with fertility, nature, and love. Similarly, male deities associated with war, death, and the underworld, the precursors to figures like Adonis, also appear to have been worshipped. Archaeological evidence from this time suggests that bulls, doves, and snakes were considered sacred and featured in religious practices, likely as symbols or avatars of particular deities. Bulls, for instance, are often associated with the virility and power, while snakes can symbolize rebirth and renewal due to their shedding skin. By the time of the Iron Age and the arrival of Greek colonists, these indigenous gods had largely been syncretized with the Greek pantheon. The Lady of Cyprus was fully identified with Aphrodite, while other local deities were recognized as Zeus, Hera, Dionysus, and so on. The Greek influence would shape the religious landscape of Cyprus for many centuries to come. Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of fertility, was widely worshipped throughout ancient Greece and Cyprus. Cyprus is traditionally considered one of the main centers of her worship and is also claimed to be the place of her birth. Pinpointing the exact date for when the worship of Aphrodite first began on Cyprus is challenging. It's likely that the goddess was introduced to the island by the Mycenaeans during the 12th and 11th centuries BCE. Aphrodite, as we know her from Greek mythology, is thought to have evolved from earlier goddesses of fertility, Eastern Mediterranean region. This earlier goddess is linked to the Phoenician goddess Astarte and the Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar. When the Greeks settled on Cyprus, they may have identified this indigenous goddess with Aphrodite and adopted some of the local religious practices. The earliest inscriptions explicitly mentioning Aphrodite on Cyprus date to the first millennium BCE, after the island had come under significant Greek influence. Although the mother of Cyprus, the predecessor to this goddess, began much earlier. Cyprus, often referred to as the island of Aphrodite due to its long association with this goddess. Aphrodite is said to have been born here from the sea foam near Cyprus after Kronos castrated his father Aranos and threw his genitals into the sea. Aphrodite was then born from the sea foam that arose from this event. Sanctuaries and temples dedicated to Aphrodite have been found across the island. These often featured statues and images of the goddess where devotees could leave offerings. Rituals associated with Aphrodite included the use of substances, potions, and communal orgies and feasts, sacrifices and prayers, and hymns to the goddess. The getting up at dawn and singing hymns to Aphrodite was a commonplace throughout Cyprus. Fertility rites, given Aphrodite's role as the fertility goddess, sacred prostitution, and other revelry rites were likely a part of her worship. One of the most significant sites of Aphrodite on Cyprus is the Sanctuary of Aphrodite at Pele Paphos, Old Paphos. This was one of the most important religious centers in the entire ancient Greek world, and it remained an important pilgrimage site until it was shut down by Theodosius. It's notable that the cult image of Aphrodite at this site was not a human form, but an aniconic symbol, often described as a conical stone, suggesting a continuation of pre-Greek religious practices. Another significant site is Petra II Romeo, also known as Aphrodite's Rock, a sea stack located off the southern coast of Cyprus. This is traditionally considered to be her birthplace. The goddess's influence can be seen in numerous aspects of Cypriot history and culture, and she remains a symbol of the island to this day.
Adonis was a figure in Greek mythology known for his extraordinary beauty. He was believed to be the beloved by Aphrodite, which often associates him with sites and practices related to Aphrodite's worship. It is said that Adonis is the one to introduce the rites of Aphrodite to the kingdom of Cyprus. While Adonis himself was not a god, his story has religious undertones and he was the focus of festivals and rituals, especially those related to the fertility and regenerative powers of nature. And he later becomes a god after his death and resurrection by becoming deified through the power of Aphrodite. At Paphos, the religious custom of religious prostitution is said to have been instituted by King Kinneris and to have been practiced by his daughters, the sisters of Adonis, who, having incurred the wrath of Aphrodite, mated with strangers and ended their days in Egypt. King Kinneris is mentioned by Pindar as beloved of Apollo and the priest of Aphrodite. Pindar mentions Kinneris as being fabulously rich in the Nemead Ode 8, line 18, which says, For prosperity that is planted with the God's blessing is more abiding for men. Such prosperity as once loaded Kinneris with wealth in sea-washed Cyprus, similar to the rich kingdom that David and Solomon have. Later in Greek and Roman literature, and in the Christian fathers such as Clement of Alexandria, the story of Kinneris is elaborated. They say that on Cyprus, Kinneris was revered as the creator of art and musical instruments such as the harp and the flute. King Kinneris, like King David, is portrayed always with a lyre or harp in his hand. In fact, Kinnor, the Hebrew word used for harp that David plays in 1 Samuel 16.23, which says, And whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would pick up his Kinnor harp and play, and Saul would become well and the spirit of distress would depart from him. Both King David and King Kinneris have etymological and artistic connections through this depiction of kings playing the Kinnor. While David is the father of King Solomon, who introduces the worship of Aphrodite into the house of God, King Kinneris is the father of Adonis, who also introduces the worship of Aphrodite into the kingdom of Cyprus. Both Adonis and Solomon are born through adulterous lust. David, who sinfully ravages Uriah the Hittite, and Kinneris, whose daughter Mira sinfully tricks Kinneris into ancestral relations. Both kings repent for their sins, and Solomon, like Adonis, is loved by hundreds of women. Solomon has hundreds of concubines, and Adonis has hundreds of lovers. Also, Adonis, like Jesus Christ, is mourned for by women, like Mary. And like Jesus, the blood of Adonis is thought to hold the power of eternal life. Every year during the spring equinox, the annual death and resurrection of Adonis was celebrated by the Cyprians and Phoenicians, similar to the Easter celebration of Christianity. The earliest known Greek reference to Adonis comes from a fragment of a poem by the poet Sappho of Lesbos, in which a chorus of young girls ask Aphrodite what they can do to mourn Adonis' death. Aphrodite replies that they must beat their breasts and tear their tunics. The cult of Adonis, also described as corresponding to the cult of the Phoenician god Baal, as Walter Burkett explains, Women sit by the gate, weeping for Tammuz, or they offer incense to Baal on rooftops and plant pleasant plants. These are the very features of the Adonis legend, which is celebrated on the flat rooftops on which sherds sown with quickly germinating green salad are placed as the gardens of Adonis. The climax is loud lamentation for the dead god. Ezekiel 
shows knowledge of this right in Book 814. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Among the stories which were told of King Kinneris, the ancestor of the priestly kings of Paphos, and the father of Adonis, there are some that deserve our attention. In the first place, he is said to have begotten his son Adonis in this incestuous intercourse with Mira, his daughter, at a festival of the corn goddess Demeter, at which women robed in white were to offer corn wreaths as first fruits of the harvest and to observe strict chastity for nine days. Similar cases of incest with the daughter are reported by many ancient kings. One that comes to mind, the story of Judah and Tamar in Genesis, is almost verbatim to the story of how Mira dresses up as a prostitute to trick Kinneris. Tamar also dresses up as a prostitute and tricks Judah into having intercourse with her. Mira, who does the same with Kinneris, gives birth to Adonis, and it's from this line of Judah where Jesus is born. Adonis was also said to have been loved by other gods, such as Apollo, Heracles, and Dionysus. He was described as androgynous, for he acted like a man in his affections for Aphrodite, but as a woman for Apollo. Androgynous here means that Adonis took on passive feminine role with his love for Apollo. Heracles' love of Adonis is mentioned in passing by Ptolemy Hephaestion. The text states that due to his love for Adonis, Aphrodite taught Nessos, the Kentar, how to trap and ensnare him. Another tradition stated that Dionysus, the Greek god of wine and madness, carried Adonis off after seeing his beauty. In Cyprus, as in many parts of the ancient Greek world, there were annual festivals known as the Adonia. These festivals were primarily led by women and took place during the hottest part of the summer. They revolved around the myth of Adonis, death and resurrection, symbolizing the seasonal cycle of vegetation, the death of plants in the heat of summer and their rebirth in the cooler months. During the Adonia, women would plant gardens of Adonis, usually small pots or baskets filled with fast-growing plants. These plants would sprout quickly, but then wilt and die, representing Adonis's premature death. Women would mourn and wail for Adonis in ritual lamentations, carrying the wilted plants and images of Adonis in funeral-like processions. According to Lucian D. Dea Seria, each year during the festival of Adonis, the Adonis River in Lebanon, now known as the Abraham River, ran red with blood. Despite these mournful rituals, the festivals of Adonis also had elements of celebration. They were often marked by feasting, singing hymns, dancing, revelry, drinking wine, and kaikion a psychedelic substance, as well as orgies, involving erotic elements, giving Adonis' role as a symbol of physical beauty and desire. Adonis and Aphrodite are closely linked, and their stories are often intertwined, which would have naturally led to some synchronicity in their worship. According to the myth, Aphrodite was smitten by the extraordinary beauty of Adonis, a mortal, and took him as her lover. However, Adonis was tragically killed in his prime after going hunting for a boar and was killed by a boar, causing Aphrodite's immense grief. The death and resurrection of Adonis, symbolizing the annual cycle of vegetation, were central themes in his worship. Aphrodite, as the goddess of fertility and the generative powers of nature brings Adonis to life as a new god, where he 
to take on half the year in the underworld for Persephone to rise for half the year. Persephone would then return to the underworld for half the year. This thematic overlap could have encouraged the synchronization of all these religious cults, including the Eleusinian Mysteries. The festivals of Adonis or Adonia were characterized by the mourning for the dead and celebrating resurrection. The Greeks were adept at syncretism. When they encountered new deities in the places they colonized or traded with, they often identified these new gods with their own. This led to a blending of myths, rituals, and iconography. Aphrodite herself was commonly linked with Ishtar and Adonis commonly linked with Demutsi or Tammuz. There's also the Phoenician myth of Eshmun and Astarte, in which Eshmun bleeds out and dies, and is raised up and turned into a god by Astarte, just like Adonis. The blending of these worships would have been part of a broader process of cultural exchange and syncretism. Adonis is a significant figure in Greek mythology. He represents the natural cycle of life and death in an agricultural context as his story embodies the death of vegetation and the rebirth of springtime. In the myth, Adonis is an incredibly beautiful mortal who is loved by not only Aphrodite, but also Persephone, the goddess of the underworld. This is why he is to spend half the year in the underworld. Aphrodite, reflecting the seasonal cycle. However, Adonis is not destined to remain in the underworld forever. In some versions, Zeus intervenes to mediate between Aphrodite and Persephone, decreeing that Adonis would spend half the year, thus marking his annual resurrection. The agricultural societies of ancient Greece, this myth would have been the most powerful resonance. The departure of Adonis to the underworld can be seen to correspond with the period when seeds are sown and fields lay fallow while his return marks the time of growth and harvest. The mourning of Aphrodite corresponds to the barren period, while her joy at his return is a time of abundance, which also links fertility to the matter. Due to the abundance of wealth in agriculture, fertility is the next thing that follows in any society. Aphrodite's mourning and subsequent joy echo the human experience as these cycles are seen in everyday aspects of life. The myth of Venus, the Roman counterpart to the Greek goddess Aphrodite and Adonis, is one of the most famous tales in classical mythology, told by the poet Ovid, showcasing love, beauty, and tragedy. Here's the basic story. Adonis, the son of Mira and her father Kinyris, was an incredibly handsome young man. Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, was so smitten by his beauty that she decided to hide him in a chest and entrusted the chest to Persephone, the queen of the underworld, for safekeeping. Persephone was also taken by Adonis's beauty when she opened the chest and refused to give him back to Venus. The dispute between the two goddesses was eventually settled by Zeus the decision was that Adonis would spend one-third of the year with Venus, one-third of the year with Persephone, and one-third of the year with whoever he chooses. Adonis, in love with Venus, chose to spend his final third of the year with her. Despite Venus's warning to avoid dangerous wild beasts, Adonis was killed by a wild boar during a hunting expedition. Some versions of the story say that the boar was Ares, the god of war, and jealous lover of Venus in disguise. Other versions suggest that the boar was sent by Apollo or Artemis as punishment for Venus's affairs. Devastated by Adonis's death, Venus mourned him deeply. Wherever Adonis's blood fell, roses grew, representing his loss. Some versions of the myth also state that Venus pricked her foot on a thorn of the rose while rushing to Adonis's side. Venus appeals to Zeus, and he allows Adonis to return from the dead for a part of the year, symbolizing seasonal cycle of vegetation and death and resurrection.
According to Diodorus' Bibliotheca, King Kinneris was a descendant of Eos and Cephalus, which would make Adonis a direct descendant of the line of Lucifer, or Eosphoros. Kinneris' father, Sandicus, was an immigrant from Syria who settled in Silica and founded a city, Selenderus. Kinneris, upon his arrival in Cyprus, with some of his people, founded the town of Paphos and married Metharme, daughter of King Pygmalion of Cyprus. Pausanias mentions a daughter of Kinneris as the consort of Teucer, who was the son of King Telamon of Salamis, and his second wife, Hesione, daughter of King Laomedine of Troy. He fought alongside his half-brother Ajax in the Trojan War and is the legendary founder of the city of Salamis on Cyprus. Through his mother, Teucer was the nephew of King Priam of Troy and the cousin of Hector in Paris, all of whom he fought against in the Trojan War. He is known to have received the kingdom of Cyprus from Belus of Tyre for having assisted him in the invasion of the island. Teucer married Euenae, who Pausanias says is the daughter of Cyprus. Venus's temples were erected in Rome during the 200s BCE to solicit her assistance in battles, and individual leaders later allied themselves with the deity, claiming to be descent from her bloodline. Julius Caesar and his heir Augustus, along with everyone in the Julio-Claudian dynasty, forged particular explicit ties to Venus, claiming descent through her son, the Trojan hero Aeneas, when he founded the city of Rome after the Trojan War. The goddess was repeatedly represented in civic architecture and on coins, the star of Venus was present, and her attractive figure became symbolic of Roman power throughout the empire. The statue, the Venus of Capua, from the second century of the Common Era, was discovered in the amphitheater in southern Italy. It is the largest example of a sculptural type that derives from a now lost cult statue of Aphrodite in Corinth and in Athens. When Julius Caesar was killed, it is said that Venus was there at his funeral, and the people said, according to Suetonius, that they saw Venus take Julius Caesar's ghost and bring it up into the heavens. The poet Ovid writes about this at the end of Metamorphosis. It says, while Asclepius came to Rome from abroad, Julius Caesar was born in Rome. Caesar was a genius in matters of war and peace and did many heroic things, but his greatest achievement was fathering his son, Caesar Augustus. Before Augustus was born, Julius Caesar became a god. This is how it happened. Venus foresees that Julius Caesar is about to be murdered by traitors from his government and flies into a rage. She feels she has suffered an unfair amount of treachery. She had to fight against Juno's rage to protect Aeneas, and now Aeneas's only living descendant, Julius Caesar, is under threat. The gods are moved by Venus's despair, although they can't alter fate. They try to warn Rome of the imminent tragedy by filling the streets with omens. Blood rains from the clouds, owls hoot, dogs howl, priests botch sacrifices, and the streets are haunted with ghosts. Despite these warnings, the two traitors enter the Senate Hall holding swords. At this moment, Venus attempts to hide Julius Caesar in clouds. Jupiter asks Venus why she is fighting fate. He has read the tablets written with the destiny of the world and knows that Julius Caesar has come to the end of his time. Venus will make him a god and Caesar Augustus will avenge his death. In the ensuing battles between the Roman and barbarian lands, Augustus will be the hero. When he has brought peace to the world, Augustus will return to Rome and rule it justly. When he dies, he too will be made a god. Jupiter tells Venus to rescue Julius Caesar's soul from his dead body and make him into a comet. Venus goes to the Senate Hall in Rome and retrieves Caesar's soul 
As she carries it up to heaven, she feels it blaze. It escapes from her arms and flies higher than the moon when it becomes a star. The people in Rome say that Caesar Augustus is an even greater emperor than his father, although Augustus won't admit it. Throughout history, fathers yield their glory to their sons. Ovid calls on all the gods who fathered great men, praying that it will be a long time before the great Augustus leaves the world. He prays that when Augustus does become a god, he will continue to listen to the prayers of the people. This here shows how important and central Venus is to the people of Rome. These myths were especially popular in classical and Renaissance art, and themes from the story have become common motifs in Western culture. The name Adonis is often used today to refer to an exceptionally handsome young man. The representation of Venus or Aphrodite in art has undergone significant transformations from the classical Greek period to the Renaissance. Aphrodite was typically depicted as a beautiful and modestly standing or seated woman, often partially robed or nude. The most famous statue from the classical era is the Aphrodite at Nidos by Praxiteles, which was revolutionary for being one of the first full-scale depictions of the nude female form in Greek history. Praxiteles' statue became immensely popular and influenced numerous later representations of Aphrodite seen as a divinely inspired statue. During the Hellenistic period, depictions of Aphrodite became more diverse and the goddess was often shown in more informal and sensual poses. The Venus de Melo, now in Louvre, France, is an example from this period. It depicts Aphrodite in the middle of undressing, a theme known as Venus Pudica, modest Venus. During the Roman period from 1st century BCE to the 5th century of the Common Era, the Romans adopted Aphrodite as Venus. Venus was a popular subject in Roman art and was often depicted in a variety of contexts, including domestic settings and public sculpture. The Capitoline Venus, a type of Venus Pudica, is a notable example from this period. During the Roman Republic days, Venus Aracena was imported from Cyprus and was said to give Rome power over their enemies. During the Middle Ages, pagan subjects, including Venus, were less common in art due to the dominance of Christianity and Islam. However, Aphrodite did not completely disappear. She was sometimes included in illuminated manuscripts or moralized as a symbol of earthly love or carnal desire. By the Renaissance in the 14th to 17th centuries, a revival of interest in classical mythology and art had become present. Venus was again a popular subject, often depicted as a nude or semi-nude figure in a variety of contexts. Artists like Botticelli in his Birth of Venus and Titian in Venus of Urbino and Venus and Adonis created some of the most iconic images of Venus during this period. Renaissance depictions of Venus often emphasized her roles as a goddess of love and beauty, but they also sometimes included moral or allegorical dimensions. This progression reflects larger changes in cultural and artistic norms over these periods. The classical Greek emphasis on idealized beauty and physical perfection evolved into the Hellenistic focus on individualism and naturalism, while the Renaissance reimagined classical subjects in the light of its own intellectual and artistic interests. Throughout all these changes, Venus Aphrodite remained a powerful symbol of love, beauty, and desire.
Sadly, his father Priam mourned for him, not knowing that young Asicus had assumed wings on his shoulders and was yet alive. Then also Hector, with his brothers, made complete but unavailing sacrifice upon a tomb which bore his carved name. Paris was absent, but soon afterwards, he brought into that land a ravished wife, Helen of Troy, the cause of a disastrous war, together with a thousand ships and all the great Pelasgian nation. Here, when a sacrifice had been prepared to Jove, according to the custom of their land, and when the ancient altar glowed with fire, the Greeks observed an azure color snake crawling up in a plain tree near the place where they had just begun their sacrifice. Among the highest branches was a nest with twice four birds and those the serpent seized together with the mother bird as she was fluttering round her loss and every bird the serpent buried in his greedy maw. All stood amazed but Calchas who perceived the truth exclaimed, Rejoice, Pelasgian men, for we shall conquer. Troy will fall, although the toil of war must long continue. So the nine birds equaled nine long years of war. And while he prophesied, the serpent coiled about the tree was transformed into a stone, curled crooked as a snake. Rejoice, Pelasgian nation, Ovid's Metamorphosis. Welcome back, history enthusiasts, to another captivating journey through the annals of time. Today we delve into the mysteries of the ancient world, where powerful civilizations thrived, empires rose and fell, and forgotten cultures left indelible imprints on the tapestry of human history. In this episode, we lock the secrets of the enigmatic Pelasgians and embark on an exploration of the captivating Bronze Age world, where the Hittites, Minoans, and Mycenaeans held sway. The Pelasgians, a name echoing across millennia, remain shrouded in the mist of time. Who were these enigmatic people? What stories lie hidden within their ancient ruins? Join us as we unravel the tangled threads of their civilization and uncover the traces that they left behind. Venturing into the Bronze Age, we encounter the mighty Hittites, a civilization that dominated Anatolia and beyond. The Hittites forged an empire that stood as a formidable rival to the great powers of the ancient world. Together, we will unearth their monumental achievements, uncover their strategic brilliance, and witness the remarkable legacies they left for future generations. Next, we will also sail to the sun-soaked island of Crete, where the Minoans thrived in an era of opulence and artistic splendor. From the majestic palace of Knossos to the mysterious rituals captured in vibrant frescoes, we will step into the footsteps of a civilization that celebrated nature, embraced innovation, and shaped the destiny of the Aegean culture. Finally, our journey brings us to the towering walls of Mycenae, the seat of a warrior society that ignited the imagination of poets, historians alike. Join us as we uncover the dramatic tales of the Mycenaeans, whose heroes and heroines blazed a trail of legend and left an enduring mark on the stage of ancient Greece. Prepare to be mesmerized by the tales of lost civilizations, their triumphs and their tragedies. Come with us on this extraordinary voyage through time as we explore the realms of the Pelasgians 
Hittites, Minoans, and Mycenaeans, and the later coming of the Dorian invasion, which moved the Greek world to the east and the west, a journey that will forever change the way you perceive the past. The Pelasgians were an ancient people who inhabited various regions of the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly in the Aegean area, during the Bronze Age and Copper Age. Much of what we know about them is shrouded in mystery and subject to debate among historians and archaeologists. Some ancient sources believe that they are indigenous people of modern-day Greece, while others suggest that they might have migrated from different regions, including the Black Sea region, Anatolia, or the Balkans. Their precise ethnicity and language remain unresolved, though a combination of Proto-Indo-European and Native Mediterranean is most likely. The earliest references to the Pelasgians can be found in the ancient Greek literature of Homer, Herodotus, and Thucydides. In the Iliad, the Pelasgians are on both sides of the Trojan War. When Homer explains who the ancient Trojans are, the Pelasgians are mentioned between Hellespontine cities and Thrace. Homer calls their own town or district Larissa and characterizes it as fertile and its inhabitants as celebrated for their spearsmanship. He records their chiefs as Hippothous and Pileus, sons of Lethus and Tutamides. The Iliad also refers to the camp at Greece, specifically at Argos Pelasgion, which is most likely to be the plain of Thessaly, and to the Pelasgic Zeus, living and ruling over Dodona, one of the ancient wonders of the world. According to Homer, Pelasgians were camping out on the shore together with the following tribes. Towards the sea lies the Carians and the Paeonians with curved bows and leliges and coconuts and the goodly Pelasgi. In the Odyssey, they appear among the inhabitants of Crete, which would possibly equate them with the Minoans themselves, who invented purple dye and migrated east towards the coastal Levant and conquered Egypt. More on the Minoans later. Odysseus, affecting to be a Cretan himself, instances the Pelasgians among the tribes in the 90 cities of Crete, language mixing with language side by side. Last on his list, Homer distinguishes them from other ethnicities on the island. Cretans proper, Achaeans, Sidonians, Dorians, and the noble Pelasgians. A fragment from Hesiod calls Dodona, identified by a reference to the oak, the seat of the Pelasgians, thus explaining why Homer, in referring to Zeus as he ruled over Dodona, did not style him Dodonic, but Pelasgic Zeus. He mentions also that Pelasgus was the father of King Lycaon of Arcadia. Aseus of Samos claimed that Pelasgus was the first man born of the earth. This account features centrally in the construction of an enduring Autochthonous Arcadian identity into the classical period. In a fragment by Pausanias, he cites Aseus, who described the foundational hero of the Greek ethnic groups as godlike Pelasgus whom the Black Earth gave up. Sophocles, in one of his famous plays, presents Inachus as an elder in the lands of Argos, the Heron Hills, and among the Tirsinoi Pelasgoi. An unusual hyphenated noun construction, Tirsinians Pelasgians, interpretation is open even though translators typically make a decision, but the Tyrsinians may well be the 
Ethanim, Tyrannoi, a possible connection to the city of Tyre, which is a possible location where the Minoan migrants moved to. All of this comes into context when we examine the writings of Pharisides of Syros, the famous pre-Socratic, who claims to have in his possession the Pelasgian creation myth, who he says was given to him by the Phoenicians. The sequence of Pharisides' creation myth is as follows. First, there are eternal gods, Zas, or Zeus, Cthoni, or Gaia, and Kronos. Then Kronos creates elements and niches in the earth with his seed, from which other gods arise. This is followed by three-day wedding of Zas and Cthoni. On the third day, Zas makes the robe of the world, which he hangs from a winged oak, and then presents it as a wedding gift to Cthoni and wraps around her. Before the world is ordered, a cosmic battle takes place with Kronos as the head of one side and Ophion the serpent, dragon, as the leader of the other. Ophion attacks Kronos, who defeats him and throws him in the underworld. Sometime after this battle with Ophion, Kronos is succeeded by Zas. Kronos is then given control of the underworld as the king of Elysium, the great province of Hades where the gods dwell. These three primordial gods are eternal, equal, and wholly responsible for the world order. Plato seems to borrow from this cosmology in his Timaeus and echoes of a trinity sprinkled down into later Christian theology. Phericides and Thales, who are both of the seven sages of Greece, are both known to have influenced monotheism, as they both believe the gods to be servants and messengers, daemons and angelos, angels, under the one, or monad, the source of all light, creation, and wisdom. When Robert Graves reconstructed the Pulaskian creation story, Many similarities between the story and the book of Genesis are present. Aeschylus is another source for the Pelasgians. In Aeschylus' play, the suppliants, the Danids, fleeing from Egypt, seek asylum from King Pelasgus of Argos, which he says is on the Strymon including Parabia in the north, the Thessalian Dodona, and the slopes of Pindus Mountains on the west, and the shores of the sea on the east. That is a territory including, but somewhat larger, than classical Pelasgioitis. Apis, a seer of Apollo, claimed to rule the Pelasgians and to be the child of Pelecathon, or the ancient earth from which the earth brought forth. The Danads call the country Apian Hills after him. They claim to descend from the ancestors in ancient Argos and that they are of a dark race. Pelascus admits that the land was once called Apia and compares them to the women of Libya and Egypt. The Pelasgians are often associated with the construction of cyclopean or megalithic structures characterized by the use of massive limestone blocks fitted together without mortar. The most famous example is the ancient citadel of Mycenae in Greece, attributed to the great Mycenaean civilization. But wait, if the Pelasgians are truly the indigenous people of Thessaly and Thrace, then why did Homer and Hesiod link them to the Cretans? Which brings us to the next region of prehistoric Greece, the Minoans. Ancient Crete has evidence of being inhabited by Stone Age people and even small settlements that date to 7000 BCE and down through the Copper Age and Bronze Age. 
The Bronze Age Minoan civilization of Crete had a distinctive and influential religious system. Minoan religion flourished from 3000 to 1000 BCE, featuring a complex pantheon of gods and goddesses, intricate rituals, and a strong emphasis on nature worship. Its impact on later Greek civilization, particularly the Mycenaeans and subsequent Greek cultures, can be observed in several aspects. Some of the prominent figures included the mother goddess, often associated with fertility and nature, depicted with serpents wrapped around her, and the bull god, symbolizing strength and virility. These deities played significant roles in the Minoan religious beliefs and rituals. The Minoans revered the natural world, with a particular emphasis on the sacredness of mountains, caves, trees, and bodies of water. This emphasis on nature worship influenced the later Greeks, such as the veneration of sacred groves for Pan and Dionysus, and natural landmarks. The Minoans engaged in elaborate rituals and ceremonies and had the use of many plants and substances mixing with grain and vine, making alcoholic potions for ceremonies and religious practices. These practices included the processions of the gods, dances, offerings, bowl leaping rituals, and these ceremonies fostered community cohesion and reinforce the religious beliefs and cultural identity. The rituals were often depicted in their art and murals. Iconography, such as the double axes, bull horns, and snakes were prevalent, representing religious symbols and mythological motifs. These artistic representations influenced the visual language of later Greek art, as seen in frescoes and sculptures. The Minoans had significant cultural and commercial exchanges with the Mycenaeans, another Bronze Age civilization on mainland Greece. The Mycenaeans adopted and adapted elements of Minoan religious practices, including certain deities like Dionysus and ritualistic aspects. These influences, in turn, played a role in shaping subsequent Greek religious traditions. The Mycenaean civilization, which thrived during the Late Bronze Age from 1600 to 1000 BCE in mainland Greece, had a distinct religious system that reflected their beliefs and practices. Delphi, located in central Greece, was one of the main centers of religious worship in the Western world. It was home to the famous Oracle of Delphi, where priestesses known as the Pythia delivered prophetic messages from the god Apollo. Dionysus was also considered to be buried here, and on the bottom of the mountain was a grove for Dionysus and a tomb for mourning. Delphi was a major religious sanctuary and attracted pilgrims from all over the world. The Mycenaean religion involved the worship of multiple gods and goddesses. The pantheon included deities associated with various aspects of nature, fertility, and societal functions. Some gods, like Zeus and Hera, would later become central figures in Greco-Roman mythology. The Mycenaean gods were generally depicted as anthropomorphic, human-like attributes and personalities. They possessed distinct roles and domains, such as ruling the heavens, controlling natural phenomena, and governing specific aspects of human life. Ancestor worship and the veneration of the deceased heroes played a significant role in the Mycenaean religion. Ancestors were believed to have continued presence and influence in the lives of the living, and their worship 
aim to maintain their favor and support. Mycenaean religion involved rituals and sacrifices conducted at sanctuaries, temples, and sacred sites. These rituals included animal sacrifices, libations, processions, and frenzies, including the use of many drugs and orgies. The rituals were performed by priests and priestesses who acted as intermediaries between the human and divine. The central religious structure in Mycenaean palaces was the Megaron, which served as a place of worship and royal residence. It contained an altar, or hearth, for offerings and ceremonies, and the fire that was lit was to stay lit and never go out. Eternal fires. Mycenae, a fortified citadel in the northeastern Peloponnese of Greece, played a central role in the civilization. The Lion's Gate, a monumental entrance to the citadel, is thought to have held a religious and symbolic significance. Mycenae was associated with the legendary hero Agamemnon, who was considered the seat of his power. The Mycenaean Tholos tombs, characterized by their circular shape and corbelled roofs, also held religious significance. These tombs, dedicated to elites and heroes, were likely places of ancestral veneration and religious rituals. The decipherment of Linear B script, used by the Mycenaeans, has provided some insights into religious practices. The worship of Dionysus was brought to mainland Greece from the Minoans, and his name shows up in the earliest Linear B inscriptions that exist. Dewanusos, the Bronze Age inscriptions from 1500 to 1200 BCE, show his name as the Mycenaean Greek form of Zeus, Dewo, the second element, Nusos. It is perhaps associated with Mount Nisa the birthplace of the god in Greek mythology, where he was nursed by nymphs, the Nisiads. Phericides of Syros, who I have already mentioned of having access to the most ancient books that he said he got from the Phoenicians, had postulated Nusa as an archaic word that means tree, which is a pun on Bacchus as the vine, possibly connecting him with the ancient Sumerian god Ningashida, whose name means Lord of the Good Tree, and like Dionysus, is connected to intoxication, serpents, and the underworld. It is possible that both descended from a common source. On a vase in Sophilos, the Nicaeids are named Nuse. Nuse is a Thracian word that has the same meaning as Nymphe or Nymph, a word similar with Nuos, which means daughter, bride, or law, connected through the Proto-Indo-European word Nusos, which we even see in Sanskrit as Snusa. The male form of Nusos would make Dionysus the son of Zeus. Dionysus and Shiva are connected to the most ancient gods that predate writing itself. These connections across the ancient world suggest that Dionysus is prehistoric. Which brings us to the next chapter, which is the eastern realms of the Greek-speaking world, Anatolia, which Homer and Hesiod relay, was occupied by the ancient Hittites. First off, to show how culturally connected the Hittites are to the Mycenaeans, they both have their own version of the fall of Troy. Hurrian Hittite bilingual poem known as the Song of Release, dated to 1400 BCE. According to classical philologist and expert in Hittites, Mary Bakvarova, this basic storyline to the Iliad is told in the Hurrian language 
the story where two humans argue before a human assembly over releasing a captive, a beautiful darling princess, while the destruction of the city threatens. As we see in the plot of the Iliad, Troy is destroyed because its assembly refused to surrender Helen to the Greeks, the same character that we mentioned in the intro, where Ovid calls the Pelasgians. And the subplot at the beginning of the Iliad is equally reminiscent of the plot of the Song of Release. It is about a quarrel in the assembly when Agamemnon refuses to surrender his slave girl, Chryseis, a refusal which brings about the plague as a punishment from Apollo. The Kuthian legend in which the Sargonic king Naram Sin from the 23rd century BCE reports how the gods sent monstrous enemy hordes to attack his kingdom. He consulted the gods by omens but disregarded their message and his god forsook him. According to Bakvarova, the Kuthian legend provided another plot element crucial to the Iliad. Hector, for all his might, was doomed because he, like Narim Sin, misinterpreted the will of the gods, thinking that Zeus supported him, although he was forsaken by his god. The Hittites were an ancient Anatolian civilization that flourished during the Late Bronze Age, primarily in what is now modern-day Turkey. They formed one of the great empires of the ancient world and had a significant influence on the region. Hattusa was the capital of the Hittite Empire, located in present-day Turkey. The Great Temple of Hattusa was a prominent religious structure within the city and likely served as a focal point of Hittite religious rituals. The city was dedicated to a Hittite pantheon, and Hittusa was regarded as a sacred place. The Hittites had a significant impact on the Greeks, particularly during the Late Bronze Age. Though trade and cultural interactions, the Greeks were exposed to Hittite influences, including artistic styles, religious practices, and administrative techniques. These exchanges contributed to, to the cultural development of the Greeks and influenced their own artistic and architectural traditions. The Hittite language, or Nessite, is part of an Anatolian branch of Indo-European language family. It provides valuable linguistic insights into the ancient world and has contributed to our understanding of Indo-European languages, including ancient Greek. The Hittite Empire eventually declined in the 12th century BCE due to a combination of internal unrest, external pressures, and the impact of the Sea People's migrations. The empire fragmented and Hattusa was abandoned and eventually forgotten until its rediscovery by archaeologists in the 20th century. The region of Anatolia becomes heavily mixed with Mycenaean Greek migrants who fled the famous Dorian invasion. These groups become the Lydians, Cappadocians, Ionians, Ephesians, and Phrygians. But why did so many Mycenaeans migrate to Anatolia? They fled the wrath of the Dorian invasion of Thessaly and Macedonia, and the Mycenaeans were forced into modern-day Athens, Sparta, and the rest fled east to Anatolia. The Dorians, who in Greek means gifted people, are the famous Proto-Indo-European people who invaded the Mycenaean lands of Proto-Greece. This Dorian invasion is a major turning point event in ancient Greek history. According to Homer and some of the ancient Greek writers like Herodotus, around the 12th century BCE, a group of people known as the Dorians migrated into mainland Greece, overthrowing or displacing the existing Mycenaean civilization. 
The invasion is believed to have occurred during the Late Bronze Age or Early Iron Age, a period marked by significant societal and cultural changes in the Aegean region. The traditional narrative suggests that the Dorians, a group of Greek-speaking people, invaded from the north or northwest regions like Thrace, Epirus, Macedonia, and Thessaly. They were said to have brought with them a new dialect of the Greek language and introduced a different cultural and social order. These Dorians claim to be the descendants of the Pelasgians themselves. According to traditional accounts, the Dorian invasion resulted in the collapse of the Mycenaean civilization and the end of the Late Bronze Age in Greece. The Mycenaean palaces were destroyed or abandoned, and the society entered a period of decline known as the Greek Dark Ages, characterized by a loss of writing, decreased urbanization, and general decrease in material culture. But not for long. As a result, the Mycenaeans migrated into Anatolia. They caused one location in particular to become a beacon for ancient pre-Socratic thought. And that place is Ionia. The Ionians were an ancient Greek ethnic group and one of the major tribes that inhabited ancient Anatolia. They were one of the four main tribes that make up the Greeks, along with the Dorians, Aeolians, and Achaeans. The Ionians were primarily concentrated in central and western coastal regions of Asia Minor, present-day western Turkey, and the adjacent Aegean islands. According to Homer, the Ionians traced their ancestry back to Ion, a mythical figure and the son of the legendary Greek hero, Kuthis, and his wife, Creusa. Ion was believed to be the founder of the Ionian tribe. The Ionians primarily inhabited western Anatolia, including regions such as Aeolus and Doris. Prominent Ionian cities included Miletus, Ephesus, Colophon, and Priene. They also settled in several Aegean islands, including Samos and Chios. They created two of the world's ancient wonders, the famous Temple of Artemis in Ephesus and the Mausoleum at Helicarnassus. These famous Ionian columns were influenced by the Doric columns and then in turn influences the later Corinthian columns that would become world-class architecture that even passed down to the Romans. The Ionian cities played a crucial role in the development of Greek culture, philosophy, and science. They were centers of trade and maritime activity, fostering contact with various cultures from the Eastern Mediterranean. Ionian thinkers such as Thales, Anaximander, and Heraclitus made significant contributions to the fields of philosophy, mathematics, and natural science. In the 6th century BCE, the Ionian cities of Asia Minor, under the Persian rule, revolted against Persian domination in what is known as the Ionian Revolt. The revolt was eventually suppressed by the Persian Empire, but it marked an important event in the prelude to the Greco-Persian Wars. The Ionians were involved in several significant events in Greek history. They participated in the founding of the Pan-Hellenic Ionian cities, such as the Ionian colonies in Asia Minor and the establishment of the Ionian League. They also played a part in the conflicts between the Greek city-states and the Persian Empire. The Ionian dialect, which was one of the ancient Greek dialects, had distinctive linguistic features and differed from other dialects, such as Doric or Attic, spoken by other Greek tribes. Homer and Hesiod are both heavily influenced by the Ionians, Hesiod being from Ionian-era Turkey, and Homer resided in the island of Chios, an Ionian League-occupied island off the coast of Turkey. 
The Ionian school of philosophers also gives us Thales, Anaximander, Heraclitus, and others. Just north of these Ionians is the Greco-Hittite offspring, known as the Lydians. The kingdom of Lydia emerged around the 9th century BCE and thrived until it was conquered by the Achaemenid Persians in the 6th century BCE. The Lydians were renowned for their expertise in minting coins and their control over lucrative trade routes. The most famous Lydian king, Croesus, who reigned over Lydia from around 560 to 546 BCE, is the last of the famous dynasty known as the Heraclidae, which the Macedonian Argia dynasty, which would produce Philip and Alexander the Great, also claimed descent from. This is why they viewed the Greeks as liberators and the Persians as oppressors through this cultural connection. Neighboring these Lydians are the ancient Phrygians, whose famous kings include King Midas, who was given the golden touch by Dionysus, and his father, King Gordius, who tied the famous Gordian knot, which was cut by the sword of Alexander the Great in 333 BCE when he freed the Phrygians from the bonds of the Persians. It is here where the famous mysteries of the great mother Kybele were carried out, as well as the worship of Attis, her dying and rising consort. These ancient Anatolian traditions have much overlap with the ancient Minoans and would influence the Greeks and Romans greatly. Even Christian theology would be heavily influenced by these Phrygians, and this part of the world is where Christianity would later thrive. The Ionians of Miletus would find colonies all the way in the north, off the coast of the Black Sea, and Greek ideals would spread far and wide. To the east of the Black Sea is the Kingdom of Colchis, According to Diodorus of Sicily, the Bronze Age pharaoh Sesostris from the 12th century BCE led a successful campaign in the north and occupied the lands of all the sea coast from Libya to modern day Russia, defeating the Hittites and the Mitanni Empire as well as the Assyrians. Diodorus even claims that he conquered everything east all the way to India. Here's what Diodorus says, after subduing the Ethiopians and Libyans, Sesostris then set forth a navy of 400 across the Red Sea and was the first Egyptian that built long ships. By the help of this fleet, he gained all the islands in the sea and subdued the bordering nations as far as India, but he himself marched forward with his army and conquered all of Asia, for he not only invaded those nations which Alexander the Macedonian afterwards subdued, but likewise those which he never set foot upon. For he both passed over the river Ganges and likewise pierced through all India to the main ocean. Then he subdued the Scythians as far as the river Tanais, which divides Europe from Asia, where they saw he left some of his Egyptians at the Lake Meotis and gave origin to the nation of the Colchis. And to prove that they were originally Egyptians, they bring this argument. They circumcise after the manner of the Egyptians, which they continued in this colony to this day as it is amongst the Jews. In the same manner, he brought into his subjection all the rest of Asia and the most of the island of the Cyclades. Thence, passing over into Europe, he was in danger of losing his whole army through the difficulty of passages and want of provisions, and therefore 
putting a stop to his expedition in Thrace. Up and down in all his conquests, he erected pillars ascribed Egyptian hieroglyphics. These words, Sesosterus, king of kings and lord of lords, subdued this country by his arms. As a result, the kingdom of Colchis was planted in modern-day Georgia. It is also said that the Medes are descended from Sesostris as well. Sesostris was considered to be the son of Amun-Ra, equated by the Romans as Jupiter Heliopolis, and had a major temple in Baalbek and Heliopolis. According to both Herodotus and Diodorus, Sesostris had a brother who was also considered to be the son of Helios, and his name was Aetes, and he was the father of Queen Medea, the famous Georgian Libyan witch, who was a priestess of the goddess Hecate. She ruled the kingdom that Sesostris laid down, and her influence on the Greeks is unmatched. The myth of Jason and Medea is given by the backdrop of these events, and Medea would become the focus on many ancient Athenian playwrights. Herodotus even says, The Medes were formerly called by everyone Arians, but when the Colchian woman Medea came from Athens to the Arians, they changed their name like the Persians. This is the Medes' own account of themselves. The Greeks would eventually begin to expand west into Italy and Sicily and plant famous kingdoms in these realms known as Magna Graecia or Greater Greece, which was ruled by such kings like Dionysus I, Dionysus II, King Hero, and King Hero II. Athens would become a beacon of democracy and a melting pot for the descendants of the Mycenaeans the Ionians, the Dorians, and they would produce Attic Greek and the world of philosophy, rhetoric, music, art, and poetry would shape the entire Western world and would become the culture that the Etruscans and Romans would later adopt from. Thinkers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle would create an environment of learning and progress. All of these events form the setting for Alexander the Great to spread Hellenism as far east as Afghanistan and India and west as far as the coast of modern day France and Spain. His empire would go on to be divided smaller Greek empires, such as the Seleucids, Ptolemies, Antigonids, and Pergamum. These empires would squabble over power for the next 300 years, and as a result, Hellenism reigned supreme through the known world. Roman civilization would owe its entire culture to the Greeks, and the Byzantine Romans would continue to use the Greek language until the dawn of the Renaissance era, all the way in the 15th century. And the same Greek ideals of democracy, justice, constitutions and the thirst for knowledge would return in the modern age thanks to the republics of France and America. As we conclude our exploration of the origins of the Greek religion and its connection to the Bronze Age, we are reminded of the intricate tapestry that shaped ancient Greek culture. The foundations of Greek religious beliefs and practices were deeply rooted in this rich tapestry of the preceding Bronze Age civilizations. From the Minoans and Mycenaeans to the Hittites and Egyptians, the Greeks inherited the synthesized elements from diverse cultures, forging a religious and cultural identity that would leave an indelible mark on human history. Through the lens of mythology, we have traced the threads that connect ancient gods and goddesses 
mythological narratives and ritual practices. The Greek pantheon, with its tales of divine intervention, heroism, and human experience, is entwined with the myths and legends that came before. From the majestic ruins of Minoan palaces to the enigmatic Tholos tombs, we have glimpsed the sacred spaces and symbols that shape religious landscape of ancient Greece. Welcome back, seekers of Gnosis and fellow lovers of Sophia. Today we are taking a fascinating journey into the annals of the past, stepping back even further in time, journeying to the ancient heartland of Italy long before the rise of the Roman Empire. Join us as we delve into the mystical world of the Etruscans, a civilization that predates Rome and greatly influenced later Roman culture. Vibrant religion, filled with a pantheon of gods and goddesses, intricate rituals, and stunning art that offers a captivating glimpse into their beliefs and lifestyle. Also, the various Italic tribes that shared the Italian peninsula with the Etruscans, their unique cultures, and their often overlooked contributions to the history of Italy. But hold on to your togas, because that's not all. As we weave through the rich tapestry of pre-Roman Italy, we'll also set the stage for the epic story of Rome's legendary foundation, from the tale of Romulus and Remus, to the religious practices that shaped the Roman Empire. We'll tease apart the threads of history that link these ancient cultures to Rome's powerful legacy. Whether you're a history aficionado or just a fan of epic tales from the past, I'm going to guarantee you a journey full of intriguing discoveries. Grab a comfy seat, hit the like button, and make sure you're subscribed for our grand expedition. Let's unravel the mysteries of ancient Italy. Human presence in Italy dates back to the Paleolithic period more than 20,000 years ago. Yes, you heard that right. Humans were in Italy hunter-gatherers 20,000 years ago. This era's inhabitants are mainly known from archaeological evidence, including artifacts and cave paintings they left behind. In the Bronze Age, the Urnfield and Villanovan cultures were prevalent in the north and central parts of Italy. These cultures were known for their distinctive pottery and burial practices. The Etruscans, who lived primarily in the region now known as Tuscany, emerged around the 8th and 9th century BCE. They had a significant impact on the early Roman civilization and were eventually absorbed by the Romans. There were also various Italic tribes including the Latins, Sabines, and Samnites, who lived in the Italian peninsula from around the second millennium BCE. The Latins were the tribe from which the Romans emerged. Starting from the 8th century BCE, the Greeks established colonies in southern Italy and Sicily, an area that was often referred to as Magna Graecia, or Greater Greece. The city of Rome was founded in the 8th century BCE, and over the next few centuries, the Romans gradually expanded to control the entire peninsula and eventually much of the known world. In Italy, this period is typically dated from around 6000 BCE, but let's go back to the beginning. The Neolithic Revolution of Italy began around 6000 BCE. This is the time 
when people living in Italy introduced farming into the region. This included the cultivation of wheat and barley, as well as the domestication of animals like sheep, goat, pigs, and cattle. With the development of farming, people began to live in permanent settlements rather than leading a nomadic lifestyle. These settlements became progressively larger over time, evolving into villages and towns. The Neolithic age saw the invention of pottery in Italy with various distinct regional styles. Pottery vessels were used for cooking and storage and a variety of other purposes. In some parts of Italy, particularly Sardinia and Sicily, large stone structures known as megaliths were constructed during the late Neolithic period. These include the Nergai of Sardinia, which are tower-like structures made of stacked stones. Trade networks began to emerge during this period. For example, obsidian from the islands of Sardinia and Lipari was traded across the Mediterranean for its use in making tools. This period in Italy saw the development of complex religious practices, often associated with the worship of a great mother goddess. This is reflected in numerous figurines and other artifacts from this period. There were also elaborate burial practices with the dead often buried in collective tombs. Along with the pottery and religion, the Neolithic era in Italy saw the development of other technologies, such as weaving and the production of sophisticated technology. Copper Age societies showed a strong focus on ancestor veneration, likely believing in some form of afterlife. This is evidenced by the elaborate burial practices and funerary structures of the period. For example, the Remedello culture in northern Italy built distinctive collective burial sites. Many archaeologists propose that this Copper Age had societies that worshipped deities associated with nature, fertility, and agriculture, reflecting the importance of these elements in the daily lives of the Italians. This is often inferred from the figurines and other artifacts found by archaeologists, many of which depict what seemed to be a goddess, possibly associated with fertility and the earth. Some Copper Age societies built large stone structures or megaliths that appeared to have religious significance. In some cases, these structures show alignments with astronomical phenomena, suggesting a possible focus on the sky or sky worship or a form of proto-astrology. It's also suggested that the Copper Age societies of ancient Italy practiced a form of shamanism and might have venerated certain animals. This is often inferred from artifacts like animal figurines or rock paintings, as well as from the remains of animals found in archeological sites. Like their predecessors, the Bronze Age often displayed complex burial rituals, which reflects belief in an afterlife, along with veneration of ancestors. The northern parts of Italy, for instance, the Terra Mare cultures, built characteristic mounds for the dead. The presence of grave goods such as weapons, jewelry, and pottery may suggest beliefs in the deceased needing these items in the afterlife, similar to what we see in the ancient Egyptians. In Sardinia, the Nuragic civilization from 1800 to 200 BCE constructed Nuragi stone towers, as I mentioned, that may have had religious or ceremonial functions. The construction of dolmens and menhirs, large single standing stones, continued in parts of Italy 
suggesting a tradition of building large megalithic structures for religious or ceremonial purposes, similar to Stonehenge. Sacred objects, such as figurines, amulets, ceremonial axes, have been discovered in several archaeological sites. These objects are oftentimes representative of deities or spirits. As in earlier periods, nature and fertility likely remained central themes in the Bronze Age religious practices of ancient Italy. The discovery of figurines, often interpreted as a fertility goddess like the so-called Dia Madre, Mother Goddess, suggests the existence of fertility cults in Bronze Age Italy. The Sabines were an ancient Italic tribe who lived in the central Apennines of Italy, in a region that is now part of modern Italian regions of Lazio, Abruzzo, and Umbria. They were one of the early tribes that settled in the region and were noted for their peaceful coexistence with the Romans. The Sabines are perhaps most famous for their connection to the founding of Rome. According to a legend, Romulus, the founder of Rome, invited the Sabines to a festival during which the Romans abducted the Sabine women to secure wives for the Roman men. This event, known as the Rape of the Sabine Women, is one of the most famous stories of Roman mythology. As for their religion, the Sabines, like many ancient Italic tribes, practiced a form of animistic polytheism, which involved the worship of numerous gods, spirits, and natural forces. Some of the deities worshipped by the Sabines were later incorporated into the Roman pantheon. For instance, Quirinus, a Sabine god of war, became identified with Romulus and was considered one of the three main deities of Rome, along with Jupiter and Mars. Feronia, the goddess of wildlife, fertility, and abundance. Simo Sancus Dius Phidias, who was the mediator god of trust, faith, oath, and honesty. Initially a Sabine goddess, Vicuna may have been a goddess of victory or of agriculture and the harvest. The Sabines also practiced a number of rituals and festivals, some of which were adopted by the Romans. For example, Lupercalia, a festival held in February to avert evil spirits and purify the city, is thought to have Sabine origins. The Sabines were eventually assimilated into the Roman Republic around the first century BCE, and their distinctive culture and language gradually disappeared. However, their influence on early Roman civilization was substantial, particularly in the areas of religion, law, and military. The Samnites were also an ancient Italic people, living in Samnium in South Central Italy. They were known for their wars with the Roman Republic in the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE, known as the Samnite Wars, which resulted in their eventual subjugation by Rome. The religion of the Samnites, similar to the other ancient Italic cultures, was also a form of animistic polytheism. We can infer some aspects of their religion from archaeological evidence. The Samnites would have worshipped a range of gods and goddesses. For example, the Sky Father, Jupiter, the god of war, Mars, and the Mother Goddess, which was a common trio of gods worshipped among the Italic tribes. The Samnites probably venerated natural elements and places such as rivers, mountains, trees, and springs. Silvanus, a god of nature and the woods, also known as Lord of the Wood, who is depicted almost exactly like Pan from the Greeks, venerated by the Samnites, became important even during Roman times, where he was equated and synchronized with Pan. He was also a fertility god, and his festivals people would gather around drink wine, and have orgies. The 
the Sand Knights practice a range of religious rituals, such as animal sacrifice and offerings, processions and festivals. They also had a tradition of ritual vow making, which played a major role in their military activities. Divination, the practice of seeking knowledge of the future or the unknown by supernatural means, was common among the Samnites, who practiced augury, the observation of the flight of birds, and heraspicy, the examining of the entrails of sacrificed animals. Both of these traditions would be absorbed by the Romans. The Villanovan culture was the earliest a transition culture from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, which existed in central and northern Italy. This Villanovan culture is believed to be the precursor to the Etruscan civilization. The term Villanova comes from the village of Villanova near Bologna, where the first artifacts associated with this culture were discovered in the 19th century. The Villanovans are known for their characteristic burial practices. They cremated their dead and placed the ashes in urns, often shaped like small huts, which were then buried in cemeteries. The style of these urns, along with other artifacts like the fibulae and pottery, are among the distinguishing characteristics of the Villanovan culture. Given the close relationship between the Villanovan culture and later Etruscan civilization, it is likely that their religious beliefs and practices were similar to those of the early Etruscans. The elaborate nature of the Villanovan burial practices suggests that they place significant importance on rituals associated with death and the afterlife. The urns were often placed in a burial mound, and grave goods such as personal belongings and food were included. Like many other ancient cultures, the Villanovans may have practiced animism, the belief that all things, including animals, plants, and rivers, even mountains, have a spirit. Like the Etruscans, the Villanovans before them practice divination, interpreting natural phenomena as signs or messages or oracles or omens from the gods, religious rituals involving offerings and sacrifices. The Etruscans, who came after them, were a civilization that inhabited the region known as Etruria, or modern-day Tuscany. The Etruscan civilization flourished around the 8th century BCE and was fully assimilated into the Roman Republic by the 4th century BCE. These Etruscans were highly influential, particularly in shaping Roman civilization they were known for their art, architecture, and urban planning. And they were one of the few ancient societies that offered high status to women. The Etruscan religion was complex and heavily influenced by Greek and Near Eastern religions. They had an elaborate pantheon of gods, including Tenea, which was later equivalent with Zeus and Jupiter. Uni, later equated with Hera or Juno. Then there's Minerva, also later synced with Athena. They also believed in various other gods, Sylvanus, who I've mentioned earlier, who was also worshipped by the Samnites. Divination was an integral part of Etruscan religious practice. Etruscans believed that they could discern the will of the gods through signs and omens, particularly by studying the phenomena such as lightning or checking the entrails of a sacrifice bowl, a practice known as Haraspice. The Etruscans placed a great emphasis on the afterlife. They created elaborate tombs that mimicked houses and rooms, a reflection of the belief that life carried on after death. 
They decorated these tombs with frescoes depicting daily life, banquets, and other scenes. Funerary goods and offerings were also common. The Etruscans had various sacred texts used for things like divination and ritual practice. They also built temples to honor the gods where rituals and sacrifices took place. These temples even housed statues of the gods and were places where people could go to worship and seek favor from the divine. While the Etruscan civilization was eventually assimilated into the Roman Republic, the influence of their culture, especially their religion, was significant. Many elements of the Etruscan religion were adopted by the Romans and became a central part of Roman religion. Priests known to the Romans as harrow spices and sacerdotes carried out divination practices according to their specific disciplines. Notably, the Tarquini boasted a dedicated college of 60 pontiffs or priests. Inscriptions reveal that the Etruscans utilized several terms for these religious practitioners. Capon, akin to Sabine Cupensis, the Maru, like the Umbrian Marin, and Isniv for a priestess. The practice of Harris Bison was known to them as Zix Nethrak. The Etruscans assigned a specific magistrate to oversee elements considered sacred. However, every individual held personal religious obligations manifested through participation in holy confraternity. Public events were always attended by these priests, and their role was to interpret the nuances of sheep's liver, which would be examined post-sacrifice. A particular bronze model of a liver, a religious importance which remains contentious topic among scholars today, features distinct sections that may have served as a guide for understanding the implications of irregularities found in specific areas of the organs. Etruscan artwork from the 5th century onwards often portrays the deceased journeying to the underworld. In several instances, such as the Francois tomb in Vulci, spirits of the deceased are denoted by the term Hinthia translating to one who is underneath. The spirits of ancestors referred to as manes, which were believed to dwell in tombs. Deities in Etruscan culture were known as the Iser. The Liber Lentius seems to differentiate between gods of light, Acer C, and gods of darkness, Acer Su. It instructs to make offerings for both types of gods during the Chi and SV rituals. A deity's dwelling, such as a grave or temple, was referred to as a Fanu, or Luth. Within these sacred spaces, one was expected to make offerings. Etruscan art depicts a trinity of deity layers. The first layer includes indigenous divinities, such as Voltumna, the primordial god, Usil, Kavatha, the sun deity, Tivir, the moon deity, Turan, a love goddess, Laran, a war god, and Maris, a birth goddess. There's also a death goddess named Lynth, Selvans, the woodland god, Thalna, a trade god, Torms, a messenger of the gods like Hermes. Fufflins, the wine god. Epulu, a god of light. And then Hercule, the heroic figure. And underneath this layer is a variety of underworld deities, such as Katha, Lur, Suri, Thaner, and Kalis. Supervising these entities were the highest level of deities reflective of the Indo-European system. Tinia, the sky god, Uni, his wife, and Nethuns, the water god. 
There's also Kalis, the god of time, and the earth goddess, Terra. During the Etruscan Oriental period, from 700 to 600 BCE, the Etruscans adopted Greek gods and heroes as a third layer of their religious system. Examples include Artemis, Athena, Heracles, and Bacchus. Over time, the primary trinity became Tinea, Uni, and Minerva, and they worshipped in the tripartite temples, similar to the later Roman temple of Jupiter Capitolinus. Lastly, a fourth group known as the Dia Involuti, or the Veiled Gods, were occasionally mentioned as superior to all other deities. However, these entities were never directly worshipped, named, or depicted, and had to be accessed only through mediator gods or aesirs. Medea, the princess of Colchis from the Bronze Age, is a central character in Etruscan mythology. She shows up in the Etruscan version of the myth of Jason and the Argonauts, and she's known for her powerful magic, the tragic and violent events that marked her life, particularly when she was betrayed by Jason. She is a potent symbol of love, revenge, and terrible consequences. The Etruscans had considerable contact with Greek culture, including its mythology, which is reflected in much of their surviving art and inscriptions. They adopted many Greek myths and gods into their own religious beliefs and practices. And it's possible that they knew the story of Medea and may have incorporated it into their own narratives in some of these ways. She is depicted on artifacts dating to the Etruscan period in the Etruscan language. Among the Italic tribes, it was the Etruscans who were the first to become familiar with the character of Medea, suggesting a vast influence of Medea on the entire known world of the Late Bronze Age. Also, Greeks from Euboa established a colony in Kumai, Italy, and brought much of their culture with them. The oldest depiction of Medea that exists in archaeology is from the Etruscan ceramics. Etruscans hold older Medea images than people of native Colchis do. In a departure from the Greek tradition, the Etruscans elevated Medea to a level of cult veneration, associating her with the sun deity, Kavatha. And she was even worshipped as a goddess or demigoddess. Distinct accounts of the mythological golden age presided over by Saturn, paralleling the golden age of Kronos within the Greek mythology. Saturn's reign and the nature of his rule deviate considerably from that of Kronos. Kronos, following his defeat by Zeus, was exiled and incarcerated in Tartarus by the Olympian gods, while Saturn, in Roman mythology, sought refuge in Latium, which is Italy, after his own son's victory over him. Saturn is often portrayed as significantly less brutal and more jovial than Kronos, maintaining his popularity amongst the Roman people despite his fall. But like Kronos, he's associated with the dominion of time. This association may stem from the profound intertwining of agriculture, in which Saturn is the husbandman who holds the sickle, ruling over with the cyclical nature of time and seasons. The name Kronos itself translates to time, while Saturn has a different etymology. His amalgamation with Kronos may have linked them to the concept of time, possibly influencing the name of the planet Saturn in his honor. Saturn, the offspring of Terra, the primordial Earth Mother, and Kalis, the potent sky heavens god, can be compared to their Greek counterparts Gaia and Uranus. The genesis of this mythology and Roman tradition 
Saturn's veneration in Rome dates back to the 6th century BCE, with Romans attributing the golden age of agriculture and farming under his rule, an age where everybody had wealth and equality. This view portrays a nurturing and benevolent facet of Saturn's persona. The origins and connotations of the name Saturn remain ambiguous. Some propose that the name stems from Satis, meaning to sow, aligning with his agrarian identity. Others suggest a connection with the Etruscan god Sater and the town of Satria in Latium, reflecting a potential underworld and funeral rites, association predating his Greek influence. The alternative name for Saturn, Stercolius, emanates from Stercus, signifying fertilizer, highlighting his connection to field fertilization and the agricultural cycle of death that brings new life. Saturn's iconography often includes scythe, symbolizing agricultural harvest and death, mirroring the dual nature of his consorts, Ops and Lua. His age depiction, possibly alluding to the swift passage of time, aligns with his festivals, symbolizing the year's conclusion and the advent of a new year. Disentangling the original concept of Saturn from the later Hellenizing influences proves challenging particularly following the incorporation of Cronia, the Greek festival aspects, into the Roman Saturnalia. Intriguingly, Saturn worship followed the Greek rite with uncovered heads, differing from the traditional Roman veiled worship, indicative of the veiled Greek deities themselves. The Templum Saturni, Temple of Saturn, situated at the Roman Forum's outset, houses the Roman treasury, senate records and decrees, and acted as an ancient bank, if you will, and only certain priests were allowed in. Despite the uncertainty surrounding its founder, the temple believed to be constructed between 497 and 501 BCE, and stands as one of the most ancient monuments in the Roman Forum. The Roman festival of Saturnalia was held during the winter solstice and marked Saturn's agricultural contributions, characterized by role reversals between masters and slaves, street games, the selection of a mock king, and gift exchanges. The festival echoes modern Christmas celebrations, potentially due to the appropriation of Saturnalia following the Roman Empire's Christianization. After Saturn was defeated by Jupiter, he settled in Latium, imparted farming principles on the people, promoted a civil and moral lifestyle, and taught technologies and medicine, and founded the city of Saturnia. His influence extended to the point of being considered the first king of Latium, or Italy, the immigrant god from Greece, or in some cases, the father of the Latin nation, through his son, Picus. Dis Pater, also known as Rex Infernus or Pluto, embodies a central figure in Roman mythology as a deity of the underworld. His initial association revolved around fertile agricultural lands and mineral wealth, aligning him with the subterranean domain from which these valuable minerals emerged. This connection fostered his identification with Chthonic gods, Pluto or Hades and Orcus. Over time, Dis Potter's association brought in to encompass death in the underworld, 
as the subterranean extraction of precious minerals and gems led to an association with the domain of the dead, overseen by Pluto. In the process of merging identities with Pluto, this potter absorbed certain mythological characteristics of the latter, integrating him into a pantheon of Saturn's and Ops offspring, alongside Jupiter and Neptune, who is a lot like Poseidon, the ruler over the seas. As a result, he came to preside over the underworld and the dead, like Hades, in tandem with his consort, Proserpina, or Greek Persephone. In literary context, the name Dis Potter served as a symbolic poetic mechanism for referencing the concept of death itself. In some cases, Dionysus, or Father Liber, would be identified with Dis Potter as a prince of the underworld. At times, Dis Potter was equated with the Sabine deity, Serenus. Julius Caesar, in his commentaries on the Gallic Wars, suggests that the Gauls traced their lineage back to Dis Potter, a manifestation of Roman interpretation. In this context, Caesar insinuates that the Gauls believed their ancestry to descend from a Gaulish god whom Caesar thought was Dis Potter. A scolium on the Pharsalia posits Dis Potter as equivalent to Terranus, the Gaulish god of thunder, who is also connected to the Germanic god Thor. Additionally, regions such as southern Germany was often considered Dis Potter's children, which connects him with the god Odin, the god of madness and frenzy. Aeneas, a legendary figure of both Trojan and Roman mythology, is renowned as the son of the divine Aphrodite, a part of Troy's royal lineage and a kin of Hector. Aeneas was a distinguished defender of his city during the Trojan War, as Homer relates in the Iliad, demonstrating martial prowess, second only to Hector himself. Homer's work subtly hints at Aeneas' discontent with his secondary role, thereby giving rise to a later narrative that posits Aeneas as a conspirator in Troy's betrayal to the Greeks. A more prevalent version of his story portrays Aeneas as the helm of the Trojan survivors following the Greek conquest of Troy. Regardless of these divergent accounts, the common thread in all the narratives is the survival of Aeneas, enabling him to be woven into the fabric of Roman mythology. The connection of Homeric heroes to Italy and Sicily can be traced back to the 8th century BCE, coinciding with the era when Homer's epics were believed to have been transitioned into written form. Greek colonies established in Italy and Sicily during this period and the ensuing century often claimed lineage from figures central to the Trojan War. Aeneas, in particular, was associated with various locals and dynasties notably within the region of Latium. He was considered to be a son of Venus, thereby the Roman people were descendants of Venus. As the Roman Empire expanded throughout Italy and across the Mediterranean, Roman authors imbued the sense of patriotism, sought to craft a mythological tradition that would simultaneously infuse their land with historical grandeur and subdue an underlying resentment towards the Greeks' cultural hegemony. Aeneas, in his role as a Trojan adversary of the Greeks, and with a post war narrative open to interpretation, was uniquely suited to embody the mythical precursor to the inception of Roman supremacy. During the first century BCE, it was the esteemed poet Virgil who amalgamated the diverse threads of Aeneas-related legends into the enduring form known today as the Aeneid, the lineage of Julius Caesar, and subsequently Virgil's benefactor Augustus, 
professed descent from Aeneas and extended to Venus, whose son Ascanius was alternately identified as Ilius, drawing from these assorted traditions. Virgil composed his magnum opus, the Aeneid. This grand Latin epic featured a protagonist who not only epitomizes the trajectory and objectives of Roman history, but also mirrors the personal journey and political strategies of Augustus in chronicling the Western Odyssey of Aeneas from Troy through Sicily and Carthage to the mouth of the Tiber in Italy. Virgil underscored the virtues of tenacity, self-sacrifice, and divine obedience, attributes he believed instrumental in the foundation of Rome itself, composed between 29 and 19 BCE. Virgil's Aeneid narrates across 12 books the mythic establishment of Latium, the precursor of Alba Longa in Rome, by the Trojan hero Aeneas. As Virgil recounts in the Greek seas Troy, the resilient Aeneas was instructed by the apparition of Hector to escape and initiate a significant city abroad. Mustering his family and followers, Aeneas secured the penates, household deities of Troy, amidst the chaos of evacuation from the burning city. His wife vanished. Her spirit later appeared to him, revealing his destiny to venture to a land in the west where the Tiber River coursed. Thus began Aeneas' epic journey with stops in Thrace, Crete, Sicily, culminating in shipwreck near Carthage on the African coast. Here, he was hospitably received by Dido, a Punic queen. As he narrated his tale, he fell in love and he delayed his journey until a stern reminder from the god Mercury refocused him on his ultimate objective, Rome. Racked with guilt, he immediately deserted Dido, who subsequently ended her own life. Resuming his voyage, Aeneas eventually reached the mouth of the Tiber. Upon his arrival, he was warmly greeted by Latinus, the regional king. Nevertheless, several Italians, particularly Latinus' wife, Turnus, contested the Trojan settlers and prospective marriage alliance between Aeneas and Latinus' daughter, Lavinia. War ensued, with the Trojans emerging victorious and Turnus meeting his end. Aeneas wed Lavinia and established Lavinium. The legendary founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, are depicted in Virgil's Aeneid as the direct descendants of Aeneas, the Trojan hero whose destiny in discovering Italy from the crux of the epic. The lineage connecting Romulus and Remus to Aeneas is through their maternal grandfather, Numitor, a former king of Alba Longa, an ancient city in Latium, central Italy. He was the father of Rhea Silvia, the mother of Romulus and Remus. Prior to the twins' conception, Numitor's sovereignty was overthrown by his younger brother, Emilius who exploited the wealth of Alba Longa's treasury to seize power. To preclude potential conflicts of succession, Amulius murdered Numitor's male offspring and forced Rhea Silvia into the Vestal Order, thus obliging her to maintain the sacred flame of Vesta, the hearth's patron goddess, and uphold vows of chastity. The paternity of Romulus and Remus is a subject of contention. Some narratives assert that Mars, the god of war, consorted with Rhea Silvia. The historian Livy contends that Rhea Silvia was violated by an unidentified man, but attributed her resulted pregnancy to divine conception. Regardless of the different accounts, the fact remains that Rhea Silvia bore twin sons in violation of her Vestal Oath, which usually warranted a death sentence, often by live burial. King Amelius featured divine retribution for the potential father, either Mars or Hercules. He chose to incarcerate Rhea Silvia and commanded that the twins be sentenced to death, either through live burial or by being cast into the river Tiber. 
Amelius reasoned that by having the twins perish from natural causes rather than direct violence, he could evade divine punishment. The appointed servant, tasked with carrying out the sentence, is moved by compassion for the twins and opts to spare them, setting them adrift in a basket in the river Tiber, where they are carried off to safety. The divine intervention of Tiburnus, the river deity, ensured the safe passage of Romulus and Remus as their baskets was caught in the fig tree situated at the foot of the Palatine Hill. The first encounter was with a she-wolf or a lupa who provided them with nourishment. Eventually, the shepherd Faustulus and his spouse, Aka, discovered them and nurtured them, and the boys adopted their foster father's profession, becoming shepherds. During a confrontation with King Emilius' shepherds, Remus was apprehended and brought before the king. Romulus ascended a group of local shepherds to assist in rescuing the sibling. Ignorant of true identity of the twins, King Emilius was slain during Remus' liberation. The brothers respectfully declined the citizens' proposal to ascend the throne of Alba Longa and instead restored their grandfather Numitor to the throne. Desiring to establish their own city, the brothers each embarked on a quest to identify an ideal location. Their differing choices, Romulus preferred that the Palatine Hill and Remus opted for the Aventine Hill, and this led to a dispute. They agreed to resolve their conflict through augury, the prophecy of observing birds. Each brother created a sacred space on their chosen hill and watched for bird signs. Remus claimed to have spotted six birds, while Romulus professed to have seen twelve. The disagreement persisted as Romulus asserted his victory by virtue of the higher bird count. While Remus argued he had won, the birds appeared faster. Romulus began to fortify the Palatine Hill, prompting Remus to scoff at his brother's endeavors. Remus's audacious leap over Romulus's wall led to his death. Remus's death is symbolically associated with Rome's impending power and destiny. The mourning Romulus accorded full funeral honors to his brother. According to Livy, the foundational event of Rome and Remus's death occurred on April 21st, 753 BCE. Romulus named the city Roma in his honor, setting up a governance system comprising senators and patricians. While its growing popularity, Rome attracted a myriad of inhabitants, including fugitives, exiles, runaway slaves, criminals, and outcasts. This gender imbalance led to the Sabine and Latin women's abduction during a Saturnalia festival at the Circus Maximus, precipitating a war between Rome and the tribes of Italy. Romulus emerged victorious, marking Rome's inaugural triumph. Despite their defeat, a Sabine king, Titus Tatius, attempted an assault on the Capitoline citadel, which was unsuccessful. A truce was eventually reached, leading to a dual kingship, an amalgamation of customs ranging from calendars and gods to military tactics. This period of peace ended with the assassination of Tatius during a visit to Lavinium. Romulus then ruled for the next 20 years, gradually incorporating lands into Rome's domain. And this would become the birth of the Kingdom of Rome. Romulus vanishes into an enigmatic manner amidst a tempest or vortex. Several purported witnesses posit that Romulus ascended to the divine realm at the right hand of Jupiter, thereby metamorphosing into a god. Livy provides a detailed account of these occurrences, while Cassius Dio narrates a more sinister scenario where Romulus is brutally dismembered by a circle of malevolent senators within the Senate House. This gruesome episode is succeeded by an eclipse and abrupt storm, which Dio conjectures to be reminiscent of the supernatural phenomena that heralded Romulus's birth. The year of Romulus' appearance is stated as 717 BCE by Plutarch, occurring when Romulus would be 53 years old. 
Rome would have a total of six kings before it would convert into a republic and the Senate was in control the next 500 years until Julius Caesar. The dissemination of the cult of Bacchus in Rome unfolded around the 2nd century BCE. Analogous to the cult of Dionysus in Greece, from which it originated, it was a mystery cult, restricted solely to initiates for mystical objectives. The Bacchanalia, the Roman celebration devoted to Bacchus, the god of wine, freedom, intoxication, and ecstasy similar to the Greek Dionysia or the Dionysus Mysteries. The Bacchanalia likely migrated to Rome around 200 BC via the southern Hellenistic colonies of Italy. As with all mystery cults, the Bacchanalia took place in stringent privacy with initiates pledged to secrecy. According to Livy, primary Roman literary source on the inaugural Bacchus, Pecula Anya, a priestess of Bacchus established the first private and unofficial Bacchic cult in Rome. Livy contends that the initial cult was exclusively for women and took place during daylight over three days annually in nearby Etruria, north of Rome. A Greek soothsayer of modest origins had set up a nocturnal counterpart incorporating wine and banquets and attracting a zealous following of both women and men. Paculia Ania, according to Livy, adulterated the unofficial yet morally acceptable Bacchic cult in Rome, including the Etruscan version, featuring five monthly nocturnal worship meetings open to all society, age, group, gender. The revamped ceremonies and initiations were marked by wine-fueled violence and rampant sexual liberty, where the cries of victims were drowned out by clamor of drums and cymbals. Those who revolted or betrayed the secret faced elimination, cloaked in the guise of religion, the priests and acolytes violated every civic, moral, and religious edict. Livy further suggests that even though the cult had a specific allure for individuals possessing a flighty and unrefined mindset, such as the young, plebeians, and women, it permeated the majority of the populace and spread like wildfire. Even the elite strata of Roman society were not invulnerable to its influence. Bacchus cult followers soon clashed with Rome's official religion, stemming from the refusal to uphold its cultural values. This culminated in the Senate, led by Cato, issuing a senatorial decree known as Senatus Consultum de, Bac de Bacchanelbus in 186 BCE. To dismantle the cult, the steps taken included demolishing temples, seizing assets, detaining their leaders, and persecuting the followers. Subsequently, the Bacchanalia persisted as festivals but the elements of mystery were permanently discarded. The Romans also adopted Greek religious customs and imported other gods and goddesses, like Vena Ercina in 215 BCE and Kybele Magna Mater in 204 BCE from Phrygia. The Roman authors of the time consulted the Sibylline books, Phetic texts guarded by a priesthood of women who live in various cities in the Mediterranean and Mesopotamia. This priesthood, Quindecimir Sacris Faciundus, consisted of two patrician pontiffs who consulted these women for oracles. According to Roman tradition, the oldest collection of Sibylline books appears to have been made about the time of Solon and Cyrus on Mount Ida in the Trode. It was attributed to the Hellespontine Sibyl and was preserved in the Temple of Apollo at Gurgis. The collection passed to Erythrae, where it became famous 
as the oracles of the Erythrian Sibyl. It would appear to have been this very collection that found its way to Kumai, and from Kumai to Rome. The Sibylline oracles quoted by the Roman Jewish historian Josephus in the first century, as well as other numerous Christian writers of the second century, including Thenagoras of Athens, who, in a letter addressed to Marcus Aurelius in 176, quoted verbatim a section of the extant oracles in the midst of a lengthy series of other classical and pagan references such as Homer and Hesiod, stating several times that these works should already be familiar to the Roman Emperor. Copies of the actual Sibylline books from 76 BCE were still in the Roman temple at this time. The oracles are nevertheless thought by modern scholars to be an anonymous compilation that assumed their final form in the 5th century. They are a miscellaneous collection of pagan, Jewish, and Christian texts, which portents of future disasters that may illustrate the confusion about the Sibyls that were accumulated among Christians of late antiquity. The Sibylline tradition would continue through even the days when Rome moved to Constantinople and became a Christian empire, and would continue until the fall of Constantinople all the way in the 16th century. The Sibylline books would be the one thread that connects modern Rome to ancient Rome. major priest of the Roman religion, the Rex Sacrorum, and his wife, Regina Sacrorum, known in English as the King and Queen of Sacred Things, were the highest official status in the religion of Rome, and they were selected by the Pontifex Maximus, the high priest, who was voted democratically in the Senate. The last democratically elected Pontifex Maximus was Julius Caesar in 63 BCE. The title Pontifus Maximus is now used for the Pope. They had three major priesthoods, led by three high priests. The Flamen Martialis, the priest of Mars. The Flamen Coronilus, the priest of Curinus, and later Romulus. And the Flamen Dialis, the priest of Jupiter, the Salai or Salian priests, were leaping priests of Mars in ancient Roman religion, supposed to have been introduced by King Numa Pompilus. According to legend, Numa established the Salii, which honored the god Mars, while Tullius Hostilius established the Salii Colonii, which honored the god Quirinus. An origin among the Etruscans is attributed to a founding by Morius, the king of the Vii. The Salii are also given an origin in connection with Dardanus and the Samothracian mysteries, and the Salius, who came to Italy with Evander, and in the Aeneid competed in the funeral games of Anchises. Indeed, in Book 8 of the Aeneid, on the land of King Evander, Aeneas is entertained by the Salii during a feast, who are commemorating the fame of Hercules. They would select 12 young boys to serve four-year terms as Salai, and when one of them left, they would replace him with another one. The Vestal Virgins were priestesses of Vesta, virgin goddess of Rome's sacred hearth and its flame. They were chosen before puberty from a number of suitable candidates, freed from any legal ties and obligations to their family birth, and enrolled in Vesta's priestly college of six priestesses. They were supervised by a senior Vestal, but chosen and governed by Rome's leading male priest, the Pontifus Maximus. During the time of Augustus, they would finish their terms as priestesses, and would then be given a pension, land, and oftentimes strategically married to some Greek Gaelic or Egyptian royals 
which would strengthen the government in occupied lands outside of Italy. Political, military, and civil actions were sanctioned by the priests known as the augurs and the Herospices. Historically, augury, divination through the monitoring of the flight of birds and lightning in the sky, performed by a priest of the College of Augurs on behalf of senior magistrates. The practice itself likely comes from the neighboring region of Etruria, where Etruscan augurs were highly respected as officials. Magistrates were empowered to conduct augury as required for the performance of their official duties. Magistracies included senior military and civil ranks, which were therefore religious offices in their own right, and magistrates were directly responsible for peace and the prosperity of Rome. A herospex was a person trained in the practice of a form of divination that checks the entrails of a sacrificed animal for omens related to politics and war. Over time, the Greeks slowly began to inhabit the southern region of Italy and Sicily. Thinkers like Parmenides and Pythagoras would bring Orphism and Ionian philosophy to the Italian peninsula. The Etruscans dominated culture in the north and the Greeks dominated culture in the south. And the combination of both would make up Roman society as we know it. And that wraps up our deep dive into the captivating history of Italy from the intriguing tale of the legendary founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, to the mystical and fascinating cult of Bacchus. We've journeyed through these remarkable narratives that have shaped this extraordinary nation. Remember, history isn't just about facts and dates, but about understanding how the past has influenced our present and the diverse cultures and beliefs that have come together to form the world we live in today. If you enjoyed today's expedition into Italy's rich past and you want to see more videos like this, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. We'd love to hear your thoughts about what we've covered today. So please share your comments below. And if there's another topic or region you'd like to explore, let us know. Stay curious. Stay informed, and you have ascertained true gnosis.